Part four, chapter fourteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part four, chapter fourteen. While Pete and Philip were driving over the road from Douglas, Kate was sitting with the child on her lap before the fire in Elm Cottage. Her eyes were restless, her manner agitated. She looked out at the window from time to time. The setting sun behind the house still held the day with horizontal shafts of light in the spring green of the transparent leaves. "'Wouldn't you like to see the procession tonight, Nancy?' she said. "'Oh, mortal,' said Nancy. "'But I won't get lave, though. "'Take care of my two girls,' says he. "'You may go, Nancy. I'll see to baby,' said Kate. "'But the man himself, woman, he'll be coming home as hungry as a hunter.' "'I'll see to his supper, too,' said Kate. "'Carry the key with you that you may let yourself in, "'and be back at half-past seven. "'Then Nancy began to fly about the kitchen "'like sputterings out of the frying-pan, "'filling the kettle, lighting the lamp, "'and getting together the baby's night-clothes. "'Kate watched her and glanced at the clock. "'Was the town quiet when you were out for the bacon, Nancy?' she said. "'Quiet enough,' said Nancy. "'Everybody flying off Les Airway already.' "'except what we're making for the quay. "'Is the steamer sailing tonight, then?' "'Yes, the Peveril, but not water enough to float her "'till half-past seven, they were saying. "'Here's the little one's nightdress, "'and here's her binder, bless her, "'just big enough for a bandage for a person's wrist "'if she sprained it churning. "'Lay them on the fender to air, Nancy. "'I'll not undress baby yet a while. "'And see, it's nearly seven. "'I'll be pinning my shawl on and away like the wind,' said Nancy.' "'The boch, she said, with the pin between her teeth. "'She's off again. "'Do you really think now the angels in heaven are as sweet and innocent, Kiri? "'I don't. "'They can't if they're grown up. "'And having to climb Jacob's ladder, poor things, they must be. "'Then if they're men, but that's ridiculous anyway. "'The clock is striking, Nancy. "'No use going when everything's over,' said Kate, "'and the foot with which she rocked the child went faster now that the little one was asleep.' "'Sakes alive! Let me tie the strings of my bonnet, woman. "'Pity you can't come yourself, Kiri. "'But if they're worth their salt, they'll be whipping round this way "'and giving you a little tune anyway. "'Have you got the key, Nancy?' "'Yes, and I'll be back in an hour. "'And mind you put baby to bed soon. "'And mind you, and mind you.' "'With as many warnings as if she had been mistress and Kate the servant, "'Nancy backed herself out of the house. "'It was now dark outside.' Kate rose immediately, put the child in the cradle, and began to lay the table for Pete's supper. The cruet, the plates, the teapot on the hob to warm, and then, by force of habit, two cups and saucers. But sight of the cups awakened her to painful consciousness. She put one of them back in the cupboard, broke the coal on the fire, settled the kettle up to the blaze, fixed the Dutch oven with three rashers of bacon before the bars, then lit the candle, and with a nervous look around, turned to go upstairs. In the bedroom she drew on her cloak, pinned her hat and veil with trembling fingers, then took her purse from her pocket and emptied its contents onto the dressing-table. Not mine, she thought, and standing before the mirror at that moment she caught sight of her earrings. I must take nothing of his, she told herself, and she raised her hands to her ears. Then her heart smote her. As if Pete would ever think of such things, she thought. No, not if I took everything he has in the world. And must I be thinking of them? Yet I cannot. I will not take them with me. She opened a drawer and hurried everything into it. The money, the earrings, the keeper off her finger. And then she paused at the touch of the wedding ring. A superstitious instinct restrained her. Yet the ring was the badge of her broken covenant. With this ring I thee wed. She tore off the wedding ring also and cast it with the rest. He will find them, she thought. There will be nothing else to tell him what has happened. He will come, and I shall be gone. He will call, and there will be no answer. He will look for me, and I shall be lost to him forever. Not a word left behind, not a line to say, Thank you and good-bye, and God bless you, dear Pete, for all your love and goodness to me. It was cruel, very cruel, yet what could she write? What could she say that had not better be left unsaid? The least syllable, no, the uncertainty would be kinder. Perhaps Pete would think she was dead, 
perhaps that she had destroyed herself. Even that would not be so bitter as the truth. He would get over it. He would become reconciled. No, she thought. I can write nothing. I can leave no message. She shut the drawer quickly and picked up the candle. As she did so, the shadow of herself moved about her. It mounted from the floor to the wall, from the wall to the ceiling. When she walked, it seemed to be on top of her, hanging over her, pressing down on her, crushing her. She grew cold and sick and hastened to the door. The room was full of other shadows, the memories of sleepless nights and of painful awakenings. These stared at her from every familiar thing, the watch ticking in its stand on the mantelpiece, the handle of the wardrobe, the pink curtains of the bed, the white pillow beneath them. She felt like a frightened child. With a terrified glance over her shoulder, she crept out of the room. Being downstairs again, she breathed more freely. There was light all about her, and the hall parlour was bright and warm. The kettle was now singing in the cheerful blaze. The cat was purring on the rug, and there was a smell of bacon slowly frying. She looked at the clock. It was a quarter after seven. Time to waken baby, she thought. She took from a chest the child's outdoor clothes, a robe, a pelisse, and a white hood. Her fingers had touched a scarlet hood in a cardboard box, but not that, she thought, and left it. She spread the clothes about her chair, and then lifted the little one from the cradle to her pillowing arm. The child awoke as she raised it, and made a fretful cry, which she smothered in a gurgling kiss. "'I can love the darling without shame now,' she thought. "'Its sweet face will reproach me no more.' With soft cooings at the baby's cheek, she was stooping to take the robe that lay at her feet, when her eyes fell on the round place in the cradle where the child had been. That made her think again of Pete. He would come home and find the little nest cold and empty. It would kill him. It would be a second bereavement. Was it not enough that she should go away herself? Must she rob him of the child as well? He loved it. He doted on it. It was the light of his eyes, the joy of his life. To lose it would be a blow like the blow of death. It could a mother leave her child behind her? Impossible. The full tide of motherhood came over her, and its tender selfishness swept down everything. I cannot, she thought. Come what may, I cannot and I will not leave her. And then she reached her hand for the child's pelisse. It would be a kind of atonement, though, she thought. To leave the little one to Pete would be making amends in some sort for the wrong that she was doing him. To deny herself the sight of the child's sweet face, day by day and hour by hour, that would be a punishment also, and she deserved to be punished. Can I leave her, she thought? Can I? Oh, what mother could bear it? No, no, never, never. And yet I ought. I must. Oh, this is terrible. In the midst of this agony of uncertainty, thinking of Pete and of the wrong she had done him, yet pressing the child to her breast with trembling arms, as if someone were tearing it away, the babe itself settled everything. Making some inarticulate whimper of communication, it nuzzled up to her, its eyes closed, but its head working against her bosom with the instinct of suckling, though it had never sucked. I'm only half a mother after all, she thought. The highest joy, the deepest rights of motherhood had been denied to her, the child taking from the mother, the mother giving to the child, the child and the mother one, this had not been hers. My little baby can live without me, she thought. If I leave her, she will never miss me. She nearly broke down at that thought, and almost let her purpose slip. It was like God's punishment in advance, God's hand directing her, thus to withdraw the child from dependence on herself. Yes, I must leave her with Pete, she thought. She put the child back into the cradle, half-dressed as it was, and rocked it until it slept again. Then she hung over the tiny bed as a mother hangs over the little coffin that is soon to be shut up from her eyes forever. Her tears rained down on the small counterpane. My sweet baby, my little Catherine, I may never kiss you again, never see you any more. You may grow up to be a woman and know nothing of your mother. The clock ticked loud in the quiet room. It was twenty-five minutes past seven. One kiss more, my little darling. If they ever tell you... They'll say because your mother left you. Oh, will she think I did not love her? Hush. 
Through the walls of the house there came the sound of a band playing at a distance. She looked at the clock again. It was nearly half-past seven. Almost at the same moment there was the rumble of carriage wheels on the road. They stopped in the lane that ran between the chapel and the end of the garden. Kate rose from her knees and opened the door softly. The house had been as a dungeon to her, and she was flying from it like a prisoner escaping. A shrill whistle pierced the air. The peveril was leaving the quay. Through the streets there was a sound as of water running over stones. It was the scuttling of the feet of the townspeople as they ran to meet the procession. She stepped out. The garden was dark and quiet as a prison yard. Hardly a leaf stirred, but the moon was breaking through the old fir tree as she lifted her troubled face to the untroubled sky. She stood and listened. The band was coming nearer. She could hear the thud of the big drum. Boom, boom, boom. Pete was there. He was helping at Philip's triumph. That was the beat of his great heart made audible. At this her own heart stopped for a moment. She grew chill at the thought of the brave man who asked no better lot than to love and cherish her, and at the memory of the other upon whose mercy she had cast herself. The band stopped. There was a noise like the breaking of a mighty rocket in the sky. The people were cheering and clapping hands. Then a clearer sound struck her ear. It was the clock inside the house, chiming the half-hour. Nancy will be back soon. Kate listened intently, inclining her head inwards. If the child had awakened at that instant, if it had stirred and cried, she must have gone back for good. She returned for one moment and flung herself over the cradle again. One spasm more of lingering tenderness. Good-bye, my little one. I am leaving you with him, darling, because he loves you dearly. You will grow up and be a good, good girl to him always. Good-bye, my pet, my precious, my precious. You will reward him for all he has done for me. You are half of myself, dearest, the innocent half. Yes, you will wipe out your mother's sin. You will be all he thinks I am, but never have been. Farewell, my sweet Catherine, my little darling baby. Good-bye, farewell, good-bye. She leapt up and fled out of the house at last, on tiptoe, like a thief, pulling the door after her. When she heard the click of the lock, she felt both wretchedness and exultation, immense agony and immense relief. If little Catherine were to cry now, she could not return to her. The door was closed, the house was shut, the prison was left behind, and behind her too were the treachery, the duplicity, the deceit of ten stifling months. She hurried through the garden to a side door in the wall leading to the lane. The path was like a wave of the sea to her stumbling feet. Her breathing was short, her sight was weak, her temples were beating audibly. Half across the garden something touched her dress, and she made a faint scream. It was Pete's dog, Dempster. He was looking up at her out of the darkness of the bushes. By the light through the blind of the house she could see his bat's ears and watchful eyes. Boom, boom, boom. The band had begun again. It was coming nearer. Philip, Philip. He was her only refuge now. All else was a blank. The side door had been little used. Its hinges and bolt were rusty and stiff. She broke her nails in opening it. From the other side came the light jingle of a curb chain, and over the wall hovered a white sheet of smoking light. The carriage was in the lane, and the driver, Philip's servant, Gemma Lord, stood with the door open. Kate stumbled on the step and fell into the seat. The door was closed. Then a new thought smote her. It was about the child, about Philip, about Pete. In leaving the little one behind her, though she had meant it so unselfishly, she had done the one thing that must be big with consequences. It would bring its penalty, its punishment, its retribution. Stop! She would go back even yet. Her face was against the glass. She was struggling with the strap. But the carriage was moving. She heard the rumble of the wheels. It was like a deafening reverberation from the day of doom. Then her senses dwelled away, and the carriage drove on. End of Part 4 Chapter 14
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part 4, Chapter 15 Outside below a house, there was a crowd which covered the garden, the fence, the high road, and the top of the stone wall opposite. The band had ceased to play, and the people were shouting, clapping hands, and cheering. At the door which was open, Philip stood bareheaded, and a shaft of the light in the house behind him lit up a hundred of the eager faces gathered in the darkness. He raised his hand for silence, but it was long before he was allowed to speak. Salutations, rugged, rough, almost rude, but hearty to the point of homeliness, and affectionate to the length of familiarity, flew at his head from every side. "'Good luck to you, boy. Bravo for Ramsay. The Christians for your life. A chip off the old block. Dempster Christian the Sixth. "'Hush, man. He's spaking. Go it, Phil. Give it fits, boy. Hush, hush.' "'Fellow townsmen,' said Philip. His voice swung like a quivering bell over a sea. You can never know how much your welcome has moved me. I cannot say whether in my heart of hearts I am more proud of it or more ashamed. To be ashamed of it altogether would dishonour you, and to be too proud of it would dishonour me. I am not worthy of your faith and good fellowship. Ah, he raised his hand to check a murmur of dissent. The crowd was now hushed from end to end. Let me utter the thought of all. In honouring me you are thinking of others also. No, yes. You are thinking of my people, above all, of one who was laid under the willows yonder, a wrecked, a broken, a disappointed man, my father. God rest him. I will not conceal it from you. His memory has been my guide. His failures have been my lightship. His hopes my beacon. His love my star. For good or for evil, my anchor has been in the depths of his grave. God forbid that I should have lived too long under the grasp of a dead hand. It was my aim to regain what he had lost, and this day has witnessed its partial reclamation. God grant I may not have paid too dear for such success. There were cries of, No, sir, no. He smiled faintly and shook his head. Fellow countrymen, you believe I am worthy of the name I bear. There is one among you, an old comrade, a tried and trusted friend, whose faith would be a spur if it were not a reproach. His voice was breaking, but still it peeled over the sea of heads. Well, I will try to do my duty. From this hour onwards you shall see me try. Fellow Manxman, you will help me for the honour of the place I fill, for the sake of our little island, and yes, and for my own sake also, I know you will, to be a good man and an upright judge. But, he faltered, his voice could barely support itself, but if it should ever appear that your confidence has been misplaced, if in the time to come I should seem to be unworthy of this honour, untrue to the oath I took to-day to do God's justice between man and man, a wrongdoer, not a writer of the wronged, a whited sepulchre where you looked for a tower of refuge, remember, I pray of you, my countrymen, remember, much as you may be suffering then, there will be one who will be suffering more, that one will be myself. The general impression that night was that the Deemster's speech had not been a proper one. Breaking up with some damp efforts at the earliest enthusiasm, the people complained that they were like men who had come for a jig and were sent home in a wet blanket. There should have been a joke or two, a hearty word of congratulation, a little natural glorification of Ramsay, and a quiet slap at Douglas and Peel and Castletown, a few fireworks, a rip-rap of two, and some general illumination. But sakes alive, the solemn the young Dempster was, and the melancholy, and the mysterious. Shoot, said Pete, there's such a dale of comic in you boys. Wonder in the world to me you're not kidnapped for pantaloonses. Go home for all and wipe your eyes and remember the words he's been speaking. I'm not going to forget them myself, anyway. Handing over the big drum to little John Ake, Pete turned to go into the house. Auntie Nan was in the hall, hopping like a canary about Philip, in a brown silk dress that rustled like withered ferns, hugging him, drawing him down to the level of her face, and kissing him on the forehead. The tears were raining over the autumn sunshine of her wrinkled cheeks, and her voice was cracking between a laugh and a cry. 
My boy, my dear boy, my boy's boy, my own boy's own boy. Philip freed himself at length and went upstairs without turning his head, and then Auntie Nan saw Pete standing in the doorway. Is it you, Pete? she said with an effort. Won't you come in for a moment? No? A minute only, then, just to wish you joy, Miss Christian, ma'am, said Pete. And you too, Peter. Ah, she said with a bird-like turn of the head. You must be a proud man to-night, Pete. Proud isn't the word for it, ma'am. I'm clean beside myself. He took a fancy to you when you were only a little barefooted boy, Pete. So he did, ma'am. And now that he's deemster itself, he owns you still. Oh, leave him alone for that, ma'am. Did you hear what he said about you in his speech? It isn't everybody in his place would have done that before all, Pete. Deed no, ma'am. He's true to his friends, whatever they are. True as steel. The maid was carrying the dishes into the dining room, and Auntie Nan said in a strained way, You won't stay to dinner, Pete, will you? Perhaps you want to get home to the mistress. Well, home is best for all of us, isn't it? Martha, I'll tell the deemster myself that dinner is on the table. Well, good night, Peter. I'm always so glad to see you. She was whisking about to go upstairs, but Pete had taken one step into the dining room and was gazing round with looks of awe. Lord alive, Miss Christian, ma'am. What feelings now, barefooted boy, you say? You're right there, and cold and hungry too, sleeping in the gable house with the cow, and not getting much but the milk I was staling from her, and a leathering at the old man for that. Philip fetched me in here one evening. That was the start, ma'am. See that pepper and salt egg on the string there? It's a Tommy Noddy's. Philip got it nesting up Gob Nagavane. Nearly cost him his life, though. You see, ma'am, Tommy Noddy has only one, and she fights like mad for it. We were up forty fathom and better, atop of a cave, and had two straight rocks below us in the sea, same as an elephant's hoofs, you know, walking out on the blue floor and Philip was having his little hand on the ledge where the egg was keeping, when swoop came the big white wings atop of his bare head. If I hadn't had a stick that day, ma'am, it would have been heaven help the pair of us. The next minute Tommy Noddy was going splash down the cliffs, all feathers and blood together, or Philip wouldn't have lived to be Dempster. Or oh, frightened you, have I, ma'am, for all it's so long ago? The heart's a queer thing now, isn't it? Got no yesterday nor tomorrow neither. Well, good night, ma'am. Pete was making for the door, when he looked down and said, What's this at all? Down, Dempster, down. The dog had come trotting into the hall as Pete was going out. He was perking up his big ears and wagging his stump of a tail in front of him. My dog, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, and like its master in some ways. Not much of itself at all, but it has the blood in it, though, and maybe it'll come out better in the next generation. Looking for me, are you, Dempster? Let's be taking the road, then. Perhaps you're wanted at home, Pete. Wouldn't trust. Good night, ma'am. Auntie Nan hopped upstairs in her rustling dress, relieved and glad in the sweet selfishness of her love to get rid of Pete and have Philip to herself. End of Part 4, Chapter 15《Part Four, Chapter Sixteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part Four, Chapter Sixteen. Pete went off whistling in the darkness, with the dog driving ahead of him. I'm to blame, though he thought. Should have gone home directly. The town was now quiet, the streets were deserted, and Pete began to run. She'd be alone, too. That must have been Nancy in the crowd yonder by Mistress Beatty's. Loud her out to see the do, it's like. Ought to be back now, though. As Pete came near the elm cottage, the moon over the treetops lit up the panes of the upper windows, as with a score of bright lamps. One step more, and the house was dark. She'll be waiting for me. Listening, too, I'll go bail. He was at the gate by this time, and the dog was panting at his feet with its nose close to the lattice. Be quiet, dog, be quiet. Then he raised the latch without a sound, stepped in on tiptoe, and closed the gate as silently behind him. I'll have a game with her. I'll take her by surprise. 
His eyes began to dance with mischief, like a child's, and he crept along the path with big cat strides, half doubled up and holding his breath, lest he should laugh aloud. The sweet creatures! A man shouldn't frighten them, though, he thought. When he reached the porch, he went down on all fours and began mewing like a mournful tomcat near to the bottom of the door. Then he listened with his ear to the jam. He expected a faint cry of alarm, the raucous voice of Nancy Joe, and the clatter of feet towards the porch. There was not a sound. She's upstairs, he thought, and stepped back to look up at the front of the house. There was no light in the rooms above. I know what it is. Nancy is not home yet, and Kiri's fallen asleep at the rocking. He stole up to the window and tried to look into the hall, but the blind was down and he could not see much through the narrow openings at the sides of it. She's sleeping, that's it. The house was quiet and she dropped off, rocking the little one, that's all. He scraped a handful of the light gravel and flung a little of it at the window. That'll remind her of something, he thought, and he laughed under his breath. Then he listened again with his ear at the sill. There was no noise within. He flung more gravel and waited, thinking he might catch her breathing, but he could hear nothing. Then rising hurriedly and throwing off his playfulness, he strode to the door and tried to open it. The door was locked. He returned to the window. Kate, he called softly. Kate, are you there? Do you hear me? It's Pete. Don't be frightened, Kate. Boch. There was no response. He could hear the beat of the sea on the shore. The dog had perched himself on one end of the window sill and was beginning to whine. What's this at all? She can't be out. Couldn't take the child anyway. Where's that Nancy? What right had the woman to lave her? She has fainted, being left alone. That's what's going doing. He tried to open the window, but the latch was shot. Then he tried the other windows, and the back door, and the window above the hall, which he reached from the roof of the porch. But they would not stir. When he returned to the hall window, the white blind was darker. The lamp inside the room was going out. The moonlight was dripping down on him through the leaves of the trees. He found some matches beside his pipe, in his side pocket, struck one, and looked at the sash, then took out his clasp-knife to remove the pane under the latch. His hand trembled and shook and burst through the glass with a jerk. It cut his wrist, but he felt the wound no more than if it had been the glass instead of his arm that bled. He thrust his hand through, shot back the latch, then pushed up the sash, and clambered into the room past the blind. The cat, sitting on the ledge inside, rubbed against his hand and purred. "'Kiri! Kate!' he whispered. The lamp had given up its last gleam with the puff of wind from the window, and save for the slumbering fire, all was dark within the house. He hardly dared to drop to his feet for fear of treading on something. When he was at last in the middle of the floor, he stood with legs apart, struck another match, held the light above his head, and looked down and around like a man in a cave. There was nothing. The child, awakened by the draught of the night air, began to cry from the cradle. He took it up and hushed it with baby words of tenderness in a breaking voice. Hush, Boch, hush. Mammy will come to it then. Mammy will come for all. He lit a candle and crept through the house, carrying the light about with him. There was no sign anywhere until he came to the bedroom, when he saw that the hat and cloak of Kate's daily wear had gone. Then he knew that he was a broken-hearted man. With a cry of desolation, he stopped in his search and came heavily downstairs. He had been warding off the moment of despair, but he could do so no longer now. The empty house and the child, the child and the empty house, these allowed of only one interpretation. She's gone, Boch. She's left us. She wasn't willing to stay with us. God forgive her. Sitting on a stool with the little one on his knees, he sobbed while the child cried, two children crying together. Suddenly he leapt up. I'm not for believing it, he thought. What woman alive could do the like of it? There isn't a mother breathing that hasn't more bowels. And she used to love the little one, and me too, and does, and does. He saw how it was. She was ill, distraught, perhaps even, God help her, perhaps even mad. Such things happen to women after childbirth. The doctor himself had said as much. In the toils of her bodily trouble, beset by mental terrors, 
She had fled away from her baby, her husband, and her home, pursued by God knows what phantoms of disease. But she would get better. She would come back. Hush, Boch, hush then, he whimpered tenderly. Mammy will come home again. Still and for all she'll come back. There was the click of a key in the lock, and he crept back to the school. Nancy came in, panting and perspiring. "'Dear heart alive, what a race I've had to get home,' she said, puffing the air of the night. She was throwing off her bonnet and shawl, and talking before looking round. "'Such pushing and scrooging, you never seen the like, Kirry. Oh, my best Sunday bonnet, only wore at me once. Look at the crunched it is. But what do you think now? Poor Christian Killip's baby is dead for all. Died in the middle of the rejoicings.' Oh, dear, yes, and the band going by playing the conquering hero the very minute. Poor thing. She was distracted, and no wonder. I ran round to put a sight on the poor soul. And why, what's going wrong with the lamp at all? Is that yourself on the stool, Kerry? Pete, is it? Then where's the mistress? She plucked up the poker and dug the fire into a blaze. What's doing on you, man? You've skinned your knuckles like potato peel. Man, man! "'What for are you crying at all?' "'Then Pete said in a thick croak, "'Hold your bull of a tongue, Nancy, "'and take the child out of my arms.' "'She took the baby from him, "'and he rose to his feet as feeble as an old man. "'Lord, save us!' she cried. "'The window broke, too. "'What's happened?' "'Nothing,' growled Pete. "'Then what's coming of Kiri? "'I left her at home when I went out at seven. "'I'm choking with thirst, woman.' "'Can't you be giving a man a drink of something?' He found a dish of milk on the table, where the supper had been laid, and he gulped it down at a mouthful. "'She's gone. That's what it is. I see it in your face.' Then going to the foot of the stairs, she called, "'Kiri! Kate! Catherine Cregeen!' "'Stop that!' shouted Pete, and he drew her back from the stairs. "'Why aren't you spaking, then?' she cried. If you're man enough to bear the truth, I'm woman enough to hear it. Listen to me, Nancy, said Pete with uplifted fist. I'm going out for an hour. Until I'm back, stay you here with the child, and say nothing to nobody. I knew it, cried Nancy. That's what she hurried me out for. Oh, dear, oh, dear, what for did you lave her with that man this morning? Do you hear me, woman, said Pete? Say nothing to nobody. My heart's lying heavy enough already. Open your lips and you'll kill me straight. Then he went out of the house, staggering, stumbling, bent almost double. His hat lay on the floor. He had gone bareheaded. He turned towards Sulby. She's there, he thought. Where else should she be? The poor wandering lamb wants home. End of part four, chapter sixteen. Part four, chapter seventeen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part four, chapter seventeen. The bar room of the Manx Fairy was full of gossips that night, and the puffing of many pipes was suspended at a story that Mr. Jelly was telling. Strange enough, I'm thinking. Deed, but it's mortal strange. Talk about tale books. There's nothing in the Pilgrim's progress itself to equal it. The son of one son coming home Dempster, with processions and bands of music, at the very minute the son of the other son is getting kicked out of the house, same as a dog. Strange uncommon, said John the widow, and other voices echoed him. Janet looked round the room, expecting someone to question him. As nobody did so except with looks of inquiry, he said, My old man heard it all. He's been tailor at the big house since the time of Iron Christian himself. Truth enough, said Caesar. And he was sewing a suit for the big man in the kitchen when the bad work was going doing upstairs. You don't say. You've robbed me, says the Ballawane. Dear heart alive, cried Granny. To his own son, was it? You've cheated me, says he. You deceived me. You've embezzled my money and broke my heart, says he. I've spent a fortune on you, and what have you brought me back, says he. This, says he, and this, and this, barefaced forgeries, all of them, says he. 
The Lord help us, muttered Caesar. They're calling me a miser, aren't they, says he. I grind my people to the dust, do I? What for, then? Whom for? I've been a good father to you anyway, and a fool, too, if nobody knows it, says he. Nobody. Did he say nobody, Mr. Jelly, says Caesar, screwing up his mouth? If you'd had my father to deal with, says he, he'd have turned you out long ago for a liar and a thief. My God, father, says Ross, struck silly for the minute. A thief, do you hear me, says the Ballawain, a thief that's taken every penny I have in the world and left me a ruined man. Did he say that, said Caesar? He did, though, said John Ake. The old man was listening from the kitchen stairs, and young Ross snaked out of the house, same as a cur. And where's he gone to, said Caesar? Gone to the devil, I'm thinking, said Janake. Well, he'd be good enough for him with a broken back. Pity the old man didn't break it, said Caesar. But where is the wastrel now? Gone to England over with tonight's packet, they're saying. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow, said Caesar. A grunt came out of the corner from behind a cloud of smoke. You've your own raisins for saying so, Caesar, said the husky voice of Black Tom. People were talking and talking one while there that he'd be bezzling somebody's daughter, as well as the old miser's money. Answer a fool according to his folly, muttered Caesar. And then the door jerked open, and Pete came staggering into the room. Every pipe shank was lowered in an instant, and Granny's needles ceased to click. Pete was still bareheaded. His face was ghastly white, and his eyes wandered. But he tried to bear himself as if nothing had happened. Smiling horribly and nodding all round, as a man does sometimes in battle, the moment the bullet strikes him, he turned to Granny and moved his lips a little as if he thought he was saying something, though he uttered no sound. After that he took out his pipe and rammed it with his forefinger, then picked a spill from the table and stooped to the fire for a light. "'Anybody belonging me here?' he said in a voice like a crow's, coughing as he spoke, the flame dancing over the pipe-mouth. "'No, Pete, no,' said Granny. "'Who were you looking for at all?' "'Nobody,' he answered. "'Nobody particular. "'Or oh, no,' he said, and he puffed until his lips quacked, "'though the pipe gave out no smoke. "'Just come in to get fire to my pipe. "'Must be going now. "'So long, boys. "'So long. "'Bye-bye, Granny.' "'No one answered him. "'He nodded round the room again and smiled fearfully, "'crossed to the door with a jaunty roll, and thus launched out of the house with a pretense of unconcern, the dead pipe hanging upside down in his mouth, and his head aside, as if his hat had been tilted rakishly on his uncovered hair. When he had gone, the company looked into each other's faces in surprise and fear, as if a ghost in broad daylight had passed among them. Then Black Tom broke the silence. Men, said he, that was a damn lie. Silence began Caesar, but the protest foundered in his dry throat. Something going doing in Ramsey, Black Tom continued. I believe in my heart I'll follow him. I'll be going along with you, Mr. Quilliam, said John Egg. And I, said John the Clerk. And I, and I, said the others, and in half a minute the room was empty. Father, whispered Granny through the glass partition, hadn't you better saddle the mare and see if anything's going wrong with Kiri? I was thinking the same myself, mother. Come then, away with you. The Lord have mercy on all of us. End of part four, chapter seventeen. Part four, chapter eighteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain, Part 4, Chapter 18 As soon as he was out of earshot, Pete began to run. Within half an hour he was back at Elm Cottage. She'll be home by this time, he told himself, but he dared not learn the truth too suddenly. Creeping up to the hall window, he listened at the broken pane. The child was crying, and Nancy Joe was talking to herself and sobbing as she bathed the little one. Bless its precious heart, it's as beautiful as the angels in heaven. I've bathed her mother on the same knee a hundred times. Deed I have, and a thousand times, too. Mother, indeed, 
What sort of mothers are in now at all? She must have a heart as hard as stone to lay the like of it. Can't be a drop of nature in her. Goodness, Nancy, what are you saying for all? Kate, is it? Your own little Kiri, and you blackening her. Oh, dear, oh, dear, the boch, the boch. Pete could not go in. He crept back to the cabin in the garden and leaned against it to draw his breath and think. Then he noticed that the dog was on the path with its long tongue hanging over its jaw. It stopped its panting to whine woefully, and then it turned towards the darker part of the garden. He's telling me something, thought Pete. A car rattled down the side road at that moment, and the light of its lamp shot through the bushes to his feet. The old gate must be open, he thought. He looked and saw that it was, and then a new light dawned on him. She's gone up to Phillips, he told himself. She's gone by Clochbane to Ballour to find me. Five minutes afterwards he was knocking at Ballour House. His breath was coming in gusts, perspiration was standing in beads on his face, and his head was still bare, but he was carrying himself bravely as if nothing were amiss. His knock was answered by the maid, a tall girl of cheerful expression, in a black frock, a white apron, and a snow-white cap. Pete nodded and smiled at her. "'Anybody been here for me? No?' he asked. "'No, sir, no. I think not,' the girl answered, and as she looked at Pete her face straightened. There was a rustling within as of autumn leaves, and then a twittering voice cried, "'Is it Captain Quilliam, Martha?' "'Yes, ma'am.' Some whispered conference took place at the dining-room door, and Auntie Nan came hopping through the hall, but Pete was already moving away in the darkness. "'Shall I call the Deemster, Peter?' "'Oh, no, ma'am, no, not worth bothering him. "'Good everin', Miss Christian, ma'am. "'Good everin' to you.' "'Auntie Nan and Martha were standing in the light at the open door "'when the iron gate of the garden swung to with a click "'and Pete swung across the road. "'He was making for the lane which goes down to the shore "'at the foot of Ballure Glen. "'No denying it,' he thought. "'It must be true for all. "'The trouble in her head has driven her to it. "'Poor girl, poor darling.' He had been fighting against an awful idea, and the quagmire of despair had risen to his throat at last. The moon was behind the cliffs, and he groped his way through the shadows at the foot of the rocks like one who looks for something which he dreads to find. He found nothing, and his catchy breath lengthened to sighs. "'Thank God, not here anyway,' he muttered. Then he walked down the shore towards the harbour. The tide was still high, the wash of the waves touched his feet. On the one hand the dark sea, unbroken by a light, on the other the dull town blinking out and dropping asleep. He reached the end of the stone pier at the mouth of the harbour, and with his back to the seaward side of the lighthouse he stared down into the grey water that surged and moaned under the rounded wall. A black cloud like a scape was floating across the moon, and a startled gannet scuttled from under the pier steps into the moon's misty waterway. There was nothing else to be seen. He turned back towards the town, following the line of the quay, and glancing down into the harbour when he came to the steps. Still he saw nothing of the thing he looked for. But it was high water then, and now it's the ebby tide, he told himself. He had met with nobody on the shore or on the pier, but as he passed the sheds in front of the berth for the steamers, he was joined by the harbour-master, who was swinging home for the night, with his coat across his arm. Then he tried to ask the question that was slipping off his tongue, but dared not, and only stammered awkwardly. "'Any news tonight, Mr. Quayle?' "'Is it yourself, Captain? If you've none, I've none. It's independent young rovers like you for newses, not poor old chaps tied to the harbour post same as a ship's cable. I was hearing you, though. You'd a power of music in the ever and yonder. Fine doings up at Ballure, seemingly.' "'Nothing fresh with yourself, then, Daniel, no?' "'Except that I am middling sick of these late sailings, "'and the sooner they're building us a breakwater, the better. "'If the young deemster will get that for us, he'll do.' "'They were nearing a lamp at the corner of the marketplace. "'It's like you know the young Ballawain crossed with the boat tonight. "'Something wrong with the old man, they're telling me. "'But, boy, Veen, what's come of your hat at all?' "'My hat,' said Pete, groping about his head. "'Oh, my hat! Blown off on the pier, of course.' "'Deed, man. Not much wind, either. 
You'll be for home and the young wife, eh, Cap'n? Must be, said Pete, with an empty laugh. And the harbour master, who was a bachelor, laughed more heartily and added, You married men are like Adam. You've lost the rib of your liberty, but you've got a warm little woman to your side instead. Ah, ha, ha, good night. Pete's laugh echoed through the empty marketplace. The harbour master had seen nothing. Pete drew a long breath, followed the line of the harbour as far as to the bridge at the end of it, and then turned back through the town. He had forgotten again that he was bareheaded, and he walked down Parliament Street with a tremendous step and the air of a man to whom nothing unusual had occurred. People were standing in groups at the corner of every side street, talking eagerly, with the low hissing sound that women make when they are discussing secrets. So absorbed were they that Pete passed some of them unobserved. He caught snatches of their conversation. "'The rascal,' said one. "'Clain ruined the old man anyway,' said another. "'Ross Christian again,' thought Pete. "'But a greater secret swamped everything. "'Still he heard the people as he passed. "'Sarve her right, though. "'Whatever she gets, she knew what he was. "'Laving the child, too, the unfeeling creature.' "'Then the sharp voices of the women "'fell on the dull consciousness of Pete "'like forks of lightning.' "'Wished woman the husband himself,' said somebody. "'There was a noise of feet like the plash of retiring waves, "'and Pete noticed that one of the groups had broken into a half-circle, "'facing him as he strode along the street. "'He nodded cheerfully over both sides, "'threw back his bare head and plodded on. "'But his teeth were set hard, "'and his breathing was quick and audible. "'I see what they mean, he muttered. "'Outside his own house he found a crowd.' A saddle-horse, with a cloud of steam rising from her, was standing with the reins over its head, linked to the gate-post. It was Caesar's mare, Molly. Every eye was on the house, and no one saw Pete as he came up behind. "'Black Tom's saying there's not a doubt of it,' said a woman. "'Gone with the young Ballowain, eh?' said a man. "'Shame on her, the hussy,' said another woman. Pete ploughed his way through with both arms, smiling and nodding furiously. "'If you plays, ma'am, if you plays.' As he pushed on, he heard voices behind him. "'Poor man, he doesn't know yet. "'I'm taking pity to look at him.' The house door was open. On the threshold stood a young man with long hair and a long notebook. He was putting questions. "'Last seen at seven o'clock. Left alone with child. Husband out with procession. Any other information?' Nancy Joe, with the child on her lap, was answering querulously from the stool before the fire, and Caesar, face down, was leaning on the mantelpiece. Pete took in the situation at a glance. Then he laid his big hand on the young man's shoulder and swung him aside as if he had been turning a swivel. "'What going doing?' he asked. The young man faltered something. "'Sorry to intrude. Captain Quilliam's trouble.' "'What trouble?' said Pete. "'Need I say?' the lamented, I mean distressing, in fact the mysterious disappearance. What disappearance, said Pete, with an air of amazement. Can it be, sir, that you've not yet heard? Heard what? Your tongue's like a turnip watch in a fob pocket. Out with it, man. Your wife, Captain. What? My wife dis... What? So this is the jeal. My wife mysteriously disappear. Oh, my gosh. Pete burst into a peal of laughter. He shouted, roared, held his sides, doubled, rocked up and down, and at length flung himself into a chair, threw back his head, heaved out his legs, and shook till the house itself seemed to quake. "'Well, that's good. That's rich. That baits all,' he cried. The child awoke on Nancy's knee and sent its thin pipe through Pete's terrific bass. Caesar opened his mouth and gaped, and the young man, now white and afraid, scraped and backed himself to the door, saying— then perhaps it's not true after all, Captain. Of course it's not true, said Pete. Maybe you know where she's gone. Of course I know where she's gone. I sent her there myself. You did, though, said Caesar? Yes, did I, to England by the night sailing. Deed, man, said Caesar. The doctor ordered it. You heard him yourself, Grandfather. Well, that's true, too, said Caesar. The young man closed his long notebook and backed into a throng of women who had come up to the porch. "'Of course, if you say so, Captain Quilliam.' "'I do say so,' shouted Pete, and the reporter disappeared. 
The voices of two women came from the gulf of white faces wherein the reporter had been swallowed up. "'I'm right glad it's lies they've been telling of her, Captain,' said the first. "'Of course you are, Mistress Kinnish,' shouted Pete. "'I could never have believed the like of the same woman, and I always knew the child was brought up by hand,' said another. "'Of course you wouldn't, Mistress Cooley,' Pete replied. But he swung up and kicked the door to in their faces. "'The stranger's being shut out,' Caesar said cautiously. "'Do you mean that, Peter?' "'Molly's smoking at the gate like a brewer's vat, father,' said Pete. "'The half hasn't been told you, Peter. Listen to me. It's only proper you should hear it. When you were away at Kimberley, this Ross Christian was bothering the girl terrible. She'll be getting cold so long out of the stable,' said Pete. "'I rebuked him myself, sir, and he smote me on the brow. Look, here's the mark of his hand over my temple, and I'll be carrying it to my grave.' "'Ross Christian!' "'Ross Christian!' muttered Pete impatiently. "'By the Lord's restraining grace, sir, I refrained myself, "'but if Mr. Philip hadn't been there that night, "'I'm not holding with violence, no, resist not evil, "'but Mr. Philip fought the loose liver with his fist for me. "'He chastised him, sir. He—' "'Damn the man!' cried Pete, leaping to his feet. "'What's he to me or my wife, either?' "'Caesar went home huffed, angry and unsatisfied.' And then, all being gone and the long strain over, Pete snatched the puling child out of Nancy's arms and kissed it and wept over it. "'Give her to me, the boch!' he cried, hoarse as a raven, and then sat on the stool before the fire and rocked the little one and himself together. "'If I hadn't something innocent to lay hold of, I should be going mad, that I should. "'Oh, Catherine Boch, Catherine Boch, my little boch, my ill boch millish!' In the deep hours of the night, after Nancy had grumbled and sobbed herself to sleep by the side of the child, Pete got up from the sofa in the parlour and stole out of the house again. She may come up with the morning tide, he told himself. If she does, what matter about a lie, God forgive me? God help me, what matter about anything? If she did not, he would stick to his story, so that when she came back, wherever she had been, she would come home as an honest woman. And will be too, he thought. Yes, will be too, spite of all their dirty tongues, as sure as the Lord's in heaven. The dog trotted on in front of him as he turned up towards Balur. End of Part 4, Chapter 18all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain, Part 4, Chapter 19 Philip had not eaten much that night at dinner. He had pecked at the wing of a fowl, been restless, absent, preoccupied, and like a man struggling for composure. At intervals he had listened as for a step or a voice, then recovered himself and laughed a little. Auntie Nan had explained his uneasiness on grounds of natural excitement after the doings of the great day. She had loaded his plate with good things and chirruped away under the light of the lamp. "'So sweet of you, Philip, not to forget Pete amid all your success. He's really such a good soul. It would break his heart if you neglected him. Simple as a child, certainly, and, of course, quite uneducated. But Pete is fit to be the friend of any one, Auntie.' "'The friend, yes.' but you'll allow not exactly the companion. If he is simple, it is the simplicity of a nature too large for little things. The dear fellow, he's not a bit jealous of you, Philip. Such feelings are far below him, Auntie. He's your first cousin after all, Philip. There's no denying that, as he says, the blood of the Christians is in him. The conversation took a turn. Auntie Nan fell to talking of the other Peter, Uncle Peter Christian of Ballawane, this was the day of the big man's humiliation. The son he had doted on was disgraced. She tried, but could not help it. She struggled, but could not resist the impulse. In her secret heart the tender little soul rejoiced. Such a pity, she sighed. So touching when a father, no matter how selfish, is wrecked by love of a thankless son. I'm sorry, indeed I am, but I warned him six years ago, didn't I now? Philip was far away. He was seeing visions of Pete going home, 
the deserted house, the empty cradle, the desolate man alone and heartbroken. They rose from the table and went into the little parlour. Auntie Nan on Philip's arm, proud and happy. She fluttered down to the piano and sang, to cheer him up a little, an old song in a quavering old voice. Of the wandering falcon, the cuckoo complains, he has torn her warm nest, he has scattered her young. Suddenly Philip got up stiffly, and said in a husky whisper, "'Isn't that his voice?' "'Whose, dear?' "'Pete's.' "'Where, dearest?' "'In the hall.' "'I hear nobody. Let me look. No, Pete's not here. But how pale you are, Philip. What's amiss?' "'Nothing,' said Philip. I only thought, "'Take some wine, dear, or some brandy. You've overtired yourself today, and no wonder. You must have a long, long rest tonight.' "'Yes, I'll go to bed at once.' "'So soon. Well, perhaps it's best. You want sleep. Your eyes show that. "'Martha, is everything ready in the Deemster's room? All but the lamp? "'Take it up, Martha. Philip, you'll drink a little brandy and water first. "'I'll carry it to your room, then. You might need it in the night. "'Go before me, dear. Yes, yes, you must. "'Do you think I want you to see how old I am when I'm going upstairs?' Ah, uh, I hadn't to climb by the banisters this way when I came first to Ballure. On reaching the landing, Philip was turning to his old room, the bedroom he had occupied from his boyhood up, the bedroom of his mother's father, old Cap'n Billy. Not that way tonight, Philip. This way, there. What do you say to that? She pushed open the door of the room opposite, and the glow of the fire within rushed out on them. My father's room, said Philip, and he stepped back. Oh, I've aired it, and it's not a bit the worse for being so long shut up. See, it's like toast. Ooh, not the least sign of my breath. Come. No, Auntie, no. Are you afraid of ghosts? There's only one ghost lives here, Philip, the memory of your dear father, and that will never harm you. But this place is too sacred. No one has slept here since. That's why, dearest. But now you have justified your father's hopes, and it must be your room for the future. Ah, if he could only see you himself, how proud he would be. Poor father. Perhaps he does. Who knows, perhaps. Kiss me, Philip. See what an old silly I am, after all. So happy that I have to cry. But mind now, you've got to sleep in this room every time you come to hold court in Ramsey. I refuse to share you with Elm Cottage any longer. Talk about jealousy. If Pete isn't jealous, I know somebody who is, or soon will be. But Philip... Philip Christian. Yes? The sweet old face grew solemn. The greatest man has his cares and doubts and divisions. That's only natural, out in the open field of life. But don't be ashamed to come here whenever you are in trouble. It's what home is for, Philip. Just a place of peace and shelter from the rough world, when it wounds and hurts you. A quiet spot, dear, with memories of father and mother and innocent childhood, and with an old goose of an auntie, maybe, who thinks of you all day and every day, and is so vain and foolish, and, and who loves you, Philip, better than anybody in the world. Philip's arms were around the old soul, but he had not heard her. With a terrified glance towards the window, he was saying in a low, quick voice, Isn't that a footstep on the gravel? No, no, you're nervous tonight, Philip. Lie and rest. When you're asleep, I'll creep back and look at you. She left him, and he looked around. Not in all the world could Philip have found a spot so full of terrors. It was like a sepulchre of dead things, his dead father, his dead mother, his dead youth, his dead innocence, his slaughtered friendship, and his outraged conscience. Over the fireplace hung a portrait of his mother. It was the picture of a comely girl, young and soft, with full ripe lips and bright brown eyes. Philip shuddered as he looked at it. The portrait was like the ghost of himself looking through the veil of a woman's face. Facing this and hanging over the side of the bed was a portrait of his father. The eyes were full of light, the lines of the cheek were round, the mouth seemed to quiver with a tender smile. But Philip could not see it as it was. He saw it with straggling hair, damp and long as reeds, the cheeks pallid and drawn, the eyes like lamps in a mist, the throat bare of the shirt, and the lips kept apart by laboured breathing. Near the window stood the cot where he had once slept with Pete, and leaped up in the morning and laughed. On every hand, wherever his eye could rest, there rose a phantom of his lost and buried life, 
and Auntie Nanny's love and pride had brought him to this chamber of torture. The night was calm enough outside, but it seemed to lie dead within that room, so quiet was it and so still. There was a clock, but it did not go, and there was a cage for a bird, but no bird pecked in it. Philip thought he heard a knocking at the door of the house. Nobody answered it, so he rang for the maid. She came upstairs with a smile. "'Didn't you hear a knock at the front door, Martha?' "'No, sir,' said the girl. "'Strange, very strange. I could have sworn it was the knock of Mr. Quilliam.' "'Perhaps it was, sir. I'll go and look.' "'No matter. I was singing in my ears to-night. It must be that.' The girl left him. He threw off his boots and began to creep about the room as if he were doing something in which he feared detection. Every time his eyes fell on the portrait of his father, he dropped his head and turned aside. Presently he heard voices in the room below. This time the sound in his ears was no dreaming. He opened the door noiselessly and listened. It was Pete. Martha was answering him. Auntie Nan was calling from the dining room, and Pete was saying, No, no, in a light way and moving off. The gate of the garden clicked, and the front door was closed quietly. Then Philip shut the door of his own room without a sound. A moment later Auntie Nan reopened it. She was carrying a lighted candle. Such an extraordinary thing, Philip. Martha says you thought you heard Peter knocking, and do you know, he must have been coming up the hill at that very moment. He was so strange, too, and looked so wild. Asked if anybody had been here inquiring for him. As if anybody should. Wouldn't have me call to you, and went off laughing about nothing. Really, if I hadn't known him for a sober man. Philip felt sick and chill and he began to shiver. An irresistible impulse took hold of him. It was like the half-smothered fear which makes guilty men go to sit at the inquests of their murdered victims. "'Something wrong,' he said. "'Where are my boots?' "'Going to Elm Cottage, Philip? Pity the coachman drove back to Douglas. Hadn't you better send Martha? Besides, it may be only my fancy. Why worry in any case? You're too tender-hearted. Indeed you are.' Philip fled downstairs like one who flies from torture. While dragging on his coat in the hall, he began to foresee what was before him. He was to go to Pete, pretending to know nothing. He was to hear Pete's story and show surprise. He was to comfort Pete, perhaps to help him in his search, for he dared not appear not to help. He was to walk by Pete's side, looking for what he knew they should not find. He saw himself crawling along the streets like a snake, and the part he had to play revolted him. He went upstairs again. On second thoughts, you must be right, Auntie. I'm sure I am. If not, he'll come again. I'm sure he will. If there's anything amiss with Pete, he'll come first to me. There can be nothing amiss except what I say. Just a glass too much, maybe, and no great sin either, considering the day and how proud he is for your sake, Philip. I believe in my heart... That young man couldn't be prouder and happier if he stood in your own shoes instead. Good night, Auntie, said Philip in a thick gurgle. Good night, dear. I'm going to bed, and mind you go yourself. Being alone, Philip found himself leaning against the mantelpiece and looking across at his father's picture. He began to contrast his father with himself. He was a success. His father had been a failure. At seven and twenty, he was deemster at all events. At thirty his father had died a broken man. He had got what he had worked for. He had recovered the place of his people. And yet how mean a man he was compared to him who had done nothing and lost all. Failure was all that his father had had to reproach himself with. But he had to accuse himself of dishonour as well. His father's offence had been a fault. His own was a crime. If his father had been willing to betray love and friendship, he might have succeeded. Because he himself had been true to neither, he had not failed. The very excess of his father's virtues had kept him down. Every act of his own selfishness had pushed him up. His father had thought first of love and truth and an upright life, and last of money and rank and applause. The world had renounced his father because his father had first renounced the world. But it had opened its arms to him, and followed him with shouts and cheers, and loaded him with honours. And yet, miserable man, better be down in the ooze and slime of a broken life, better be dead and in the grave, 
for the dead in his grave must despise him. An awful picture rose before Philip. It was a picture of himself in the time to come. An old man, great, powerful, perhaps even beloved, may be worshipped, but heart dead, tottering on to the grave, and the mockery of a gorgeous funeral, with crowds and drums and solemn music. Then suddenly a great silence, as if the snow had begun to fall, and a great white light, and an awful voice crying, Who is this that comes with dust for a bleeding heart, and ashes for a living soul? Philip screamed aloud at the vision, as piece by piece he put it together. His cry died off with a tingle in the china ornaments of the mantelpiece, and he remembered where he was. Then two gentle taps came to the door of his room. He composed himself a little, snatched up a book, and cried, "'Come in!' It was Auntie Nan. She was in her night-dress and nightcap. A candle was in her hand, and the flame was shaking. "'Whatever's to do, my child?' she said. "'Only reading aloud, Auntie. Did I awaken you?' "'But you screamed, Philip.' "'Macbeth, Auntie. See the banquet scene. He has become king, you know, but his conscience—' He stopped. The little lady looked at him dubiously, and made a pull at the string of her nightcap, causing it to fall aside and give a grotesque appearance to her troubled old face. "'Take a little brandy, dear. I left it here on the dressing-table.' "'Don't trouble about me, Auntie. Good night again. There, go back to bed.' Half coaxing, half forcing her, he drew her to the door, and she went out slowly, reluctantly, doubtfully, the wandering strings of her cap trailing on her shoulders, and her bare feet nipping up the bottom of the nightdress behind her. Philip looked at the book he had snatched up in his haste. What had put that book of all books into his hand? What had brought him to that room of all rooms? And on that night of all nights, what devil out of hell had tempted Auntie Nan to torture him? He would not stay. He would go back to his own bed. Out on the landing he heard a low voice. It came from Auntie Nan's room. A spear of candlelight shot from her door, which was ajar. He paused and looked in. The white nightdress was by the bedside. The nightcap was buried in the counterpane. A cat had established itself beside it and was purring softly. Auntie Nan was on her knees. Philip heard his own name. God bless my Philip in the great place to which he has been called this day. Give him wisdom and strength and peace. Holy woman, with angels hovering over you, who dared to think of devils tempting your innocence and love? Philip went back to his father's room. He began to reconcile himself to his position. Though he had been extolling his father at his own expense, what had he done but realize his father's hopes? And after all, he could not have acted differently. At no point could he have behaved otherwise than he had. What had he to accuse himself for? If there had been sin, he had been dragged into it by blind powers which he could not command. And what was true of himself was also true of Kate. Ah, he could see her now. She was gone where he had sent her. There were tears in her beautiful eyes, but time would wipe them away. The duplicity of her old life was over. The corroding deceit, the daily torment, the hourly infidelity, all were left behind. If there was remorse, it was the fault of destiny, and if she was suffering the pangs of shame, she was a woman, and she would bear it cheerfully for the sake of the man she loved. She was going through everything for him. Heaven bless her! In spite of man and man's law, she was his love, his darling, his wife. Yes, his wife, by right of nature and of God, and come what would, he should cling to her to the last. Suddenly a thick voice cut through the still air of the night, Philip! It was Pete at last. He was calling up at the window from the path below. Philip groaned and covered his face with his hands. Philip! With rigid steps, Philip walked to the window and threw up the sash. It was starlight, and the branches were bending in the night air. Is it you, Pete? Yes, it's me. I was seeing the lamp, so I knew you weren't in bed at all. Studying a bit, it's like, eh? I thought I wouldn't waken the house, but just shout up and tell you. What is it, Pete? said Philip. His voice shivered like a sail attacking. Nothing much at all, only the wife's gone to England over by the night steamer. To 
To England? Oh, time for it too, I'm thinking. The wake and nervous she's been lately. You remember what the doctor was saying yonder Everin, when we christened the child? Send her out of the island, says he, and she'll be coming home another woman. Wasn't for going, though. Crying and shouting she wouldn't be laving the little one. So I had to put out a bit of authority. Of course, her husband's got the right to do that, Philip, eh? Well, I'll be taking the road again. Doing a fine night, isn't it? Makes a man unwilling to go to bed. Philip trembled and felt sick. He tried to speak, but could utter nothing except an inarticulate noise. As Pete went off, an owl screeched in the glen. Philip drew down the sash, pulled the blind, tugged the curtains across, stumbled into the middle of the floor and leaned against the bed. Such is the beginning of the end, he thought. The duplicity, the deceit, the daily torment which Kate had left behind were henceforth to be his own. At one flash, as of lightning, he saw the path before him. It was over cliffs and chasms and quagmires, where his foot might slip at any step. His head began to reel. He took the brandy bottle from the dressing table, poured out half a tumbler, and drained it at one draught. As he did so, his eyes above the rim of the glass rested on the portrait of his mother over the fireplace. The face as he saw it then was no longer the face of the winsome bride. It was the living face as he remembered it, bleared, bloated, gross, and drunken. She smiled at him. She beckoned to him. It was the beginning of the end, indeed. He was his mother's son as well as his father's. The father had ruled down to that day, but it was the turn of the mother now. He could not resist her. She was alive in his blood, and he was hers. Never before had he touched raw spirits, and the brandy mastered him instantly. Feeling dizzy, he made an effort to undress and get into bed. He dragged off his coat and his waistcoat, and threw his braces over his shoulders. Then he stumbled, and he had to lay hold of the bedpost. His hand grew chill and relaxed its hold. Stupor came over him. He slipped, he slid, he fell, and rolled with outstretched arms onto the floor. The fire went out and the lamp died down. Then the sun came up over the sea. It was a beautiful morning. The town awoke. People hailed each other cheerfully in the streets, and joy bells rang from the big church tower for the first court day of the new deemster. But the deemster himself still lay on the floor, with damp forehead and matted hair, behind the blind of the darkened room. End of Part 4, Chapter 19「Part five, Chapter One of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part five, Man and Man. Chapter One. It was Saturday, and the marketplace was covered with the carts and stalls of the country people. After some feint of eating breakfast, Pete lit his pipe called for a basket, and announced his intention of doing the marketing. "'Coming for the mistress, are you, Captain? "'I'm a sort of a grass widow, ma'am. "'What's your eggs today, Mistress Cowley?' Sixteen this morning, sir, and right ones, too. "'They were telling me you've been losing her.' "'Give me a shilling's worth, then. "'Any news over your side, Mag?' Two, four, eight, sixteen. "'It's every appearance we'll be getting an early harvest, Captain.' "'Is it yourself, Lisa? And how's your butter today? "'Bad to bait today, sir, and only thirteen pence halfpenny. "'Is the little one longing for the mistress, Captain? "'I'll take a couple of pounds, then. "'What for longing at all, when it's going bringing up by hand, it is? "'Put it in a cabbage leaf, Lisa.' "'Thus, with his basket on his arm and his pipe in his mouth, "'Pete passed from stall to stall.' chatting, laughing, bargaining, buying, shouting his salutations over the general hum and hubbub as he ploughed his way through the crowd, but listening intently, watching eagerly, casting out grapples to catch the anchor he had lost, and feeling all the time that if any eye showed sign of knowledge, if any one began with, Captain, I can tell you where she is, he must leap on the man like a tiger and strangle the revelation in his throat. Next day, Sunday, his friends from Sulby came to quiz and to question. 
He was lounging in his shirt sleeves on a deck chair in his ship's cabin, smoking a long pipe and pretending to be at ease and at peace with all the world. "'Fine morning, Captain,' said John the Clerk. "'It is doing a fine morning, John,' said Pete. "'Fine on the sea, too,' said Janake. "'Wonderful fine on the sea, Mr. Jelly.' "'A nice fair wind, though, if anybody was going by the packet to Liverpool. "'Was it as good, thank you, for the mistress on Friday night, Mr. Quilliam?' "'I'll guarantee,' said Pete. "'Plucky, though. I wouldn't have thought it of the same woman. "'I wouldn't really,' said John Ake. "'Alone, too, and landing on the other side so early in the morning,' said John the Clerk. "'Smart uncommon. It isn't every woman would have done it,' said Kelly the postman. "'Oh, we've mighty boys of women these days, we have, though,' snuffled the constable, and then they all laughed together. Pete watched their wheedling, fawning, and whisking of the tail, and then he said, "'Chut! What's there so wonderful about a woman going by herself to Liverpool when she's got somebody waiting at the stage to meet her?' The laughing faces lengthened suddenly. "'And had she then?' said John the Clerk. Pete puffed furiously, rolled in his seat, laughed like a man with a mouthful of water, and said, "'Why, certainly. My uncle, of course.' John Ake wrinkled his forehead. "'Uncle,' he said, with a click in his throat. "'Yes, my Uncle Joe,' said Pete. John Ake looked helplessly across at John the Clerk. John the Clerk puckered up his mouth, as if about to whistle, and then said in a faltering way, "'Well, I can't really say I've ever heard tell of your Uncle Joe before, Captain.' No, said Pete, with a look of astonishment. Not my Uncle Joseph, the one that left the island forty years ago and started in the coach and cab line? Well, that's curious. Where's he living? Bless me, where's this it is now? Chut, it's clean forgot at me. But I saw him myself coming home from Kimberley, and since then he's been writing constant. Send her across, says he. She'll be her own woman again, like winking. And you never heard tell of him? Not Uncle Joey with the bald head? "'Well, well, a smart old man, though. "'Man alive, the lively he is, too, "'and the laughable and the good company. "'To look at that man's face, "'you'd say the sun was shining regular. "'Oh, it's fine times she'll be having with Uncle Joe. "'No woman could be ill with yonder old man about. "'He'd break your face with laughing "'if it was bursting itself with a squinzy. "'And you never heard tell of my Uncle Joe "'of Scotland Road down Clarence Dockway? "'To think of that now.' They went off with looks of perplexity, and Pete turned into the house. They're trying to catch me. They're wanting to shame my poor little Kiri. I must keep her name sweet, he thought. The church bells had begun to ring, and he was telling himself that heavy though his heart might be, he must behave as usual. She'll be going walking to church herself this morning, Nancy, he said, putting on his coat, so I'll just slip across to chapel. He was swinging up the path on his return home to dinner when he heard voices inside the house. It's shocking to see the man pretending this and pretending that. It was Nancy. She was laying the table. There was a rattle of knives and forks. Pretending to eat, but only pecking like a robin. Pretending to sleep, but never a wink on the night. Pretending to laugh and to joke and wink, and a face at him like a ghost's, and his hair all through others. Walking about from river to quay and going on with all that rubbish, it's shocking, ma'am, it's shocking. hush a -bye, hush a -bye. It was the voice of Granny, low and quavery. She was rocking the cradle. You can't speak to him neither, but he's scolding you scandalous. I'm not used to being cursed at, I'm saying, and is it myself that has to be told to respect my own kitty? But cry shame on her, I must, when I look at the little boch there, and it's so helpless and so beautiful. Sterics, you say? Yes, indeed, ma'am. "'and if I stay here much longer, it's losing myself I will be too, "'with his pretending and pretending. "'Lave him to it, Nancy. "'His poor head's that moidered and mixed, it's like a black pudding. "'There's no saying what's inside of it. "'But he's good, though. "'Oh, right good he is for all, and the world's cold and cruel. "'Lave him alone, woman. "'Lave him alone, poor boy.' "'The child awoke and cried, "'and under cover of this commotion and the crowing and cooing of the two women, Pete stepped back to the gate, clashed it hard, swung noisily up the gravel, and rolled into the house with a shout and a laugh. Well, well, Granny, my gosh, who'd have thought of seeing Granny now? And how's the old angel today? So you've got the little one there. Oh, you rogue, you. You're on Granny's lap, are you? How's Caesar? And how's Mrs. Gorry doing? 
Look at that now. Did you ever? Opening one eye first to make sure if the world's all right. The child's wise. Coo hoo Smart with the dinner, Nancy. Wonderful hungry the chapel's making a man. Coo hoo What's she like now, Granny? When I set her to my knee like this, I can see my own little Kiri again, said Granny, looking down ruefully, rocking the child with one knee and doubling over it to kiss it. So she's like the mammy, is she, said Pete, blowing at the baby and tickling its chin with his broad forefinger. Mammy's gone to the old uncle's, hasn't she, my lammy? At that Granny fell to rocking herself as well as the child, and to singing a hymn in a quavery voice. Then, with a rattle and a rush, throwing off his coat and tramping the floor in his shirt sleeves, while Nancy dished up the dinner, Pete began to enlarge on Kate's happiness in the place where she had gone. Tremendous grand the old man's house is, you wouldn't believe. A regular Dempster's palace. The grandeur on it is a show and a pattern. Plenty to eat, plenty to drink, and a boy at the door with white buttons dotting on his brown coat, bless you like, like a turnip field in winter. Then the man himself. Goodness me, the happy that man is. Happy Joe, they're calling him. Wouldn't trust but he'll be taking Kate to a theatre. Well, and why not, if a person's down a bit? A merry touch and go? Where's the harm at all? Fact is, Granny, that's why we couldn't tell you Kate was going. Caesar would have been objecting. He's fit enough for it. Ha, ha, ha. Granny looked up at Pete as he laughed, and the broad rose withered on his face. Hmm, hmm, he said, clearing his throat. I'm bad dreadful wanting a smoke. And past the dinner table, now smoking and ready, he slithered out of the house. Caesar was Pete's next visitor. He said nothing of Kate, and neither did Pete mention Uncle Joe. The interview was a brief and grim one. It was a lie that Ross Christian had been sent by his father to ask for a loan, but it was true that Peter Christian was in urgent need of money. He wanted six thousand pounds as mortgage on Ballawhaine. Had Pete got so much to lend? No need for personal intercourse. Caesar would act as intermediary. Pete took only a moment for consideration. Yes, he had got the money, and he would lend it. Caesar looked at Pete. Pete looked at Caesar. He's talking all this rubbish, thought Caesar, but he knows where the girl has gone to. He knows who's taken her. He means to kick the rascal out of his own house neck and crop and right enough, too, and the Lord's own vengeance. But Pete's thoughts were another matter. The old man won't live to redeem it, and the young one will never try. It'll do for Philip some day. End of Part 5, Chapter 1《Part 5, Chapter 2 of The Manxman》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain Part 5, Chapter 2 For three days Pete bore himself according to his wont, thinking to silence the evil tongues of the little world about him, and keep sweet and alive the dear name which they were wanting to befoul and destroy. By Tuesday morning the strain had become unbearable. On pretenses of business, of pleasure, of God knows what folly and nonsense, he began to scour the island. He visited every parish on the north, passed through every village, climbed every glen, found his way into every out-of-the-way hut, and scraped acquaintance with every old woman living alone. Sometimes he was up in the vague foredawn, creeping through the quiet streets like a thief, going silently, stealthily, warily, until he came to the roads, or the fields, or the open curragh, and could give swing to his step, and breath to his lungs, and voice to the cries that burst from him. Two long weeks he spent in this wild quest, and meanwhile he was as happy as a boy to all outward seeming, whistling, laughing, chafing, bawling, talking nonsense, any nonsense, and kicking up his heels like a kid. But wheresoever he went, and howsoever early he started on his errands, he never failed to be back at home at seven o'clock in the evening, washed, combed in his slippers and shirt-sleeves, smoking a long clay over the garden gate as the postman went by with the letters. She'll write, he told himself. When she's mending a bit, she'll ease our mind and write. Dear old Pete, excuse me for not writing afore. That'll be the way of it. 
Oh, trust her, trust her. But day followed day, and no letter came from Kate. Ten evenings running, he smoked over the gate, leisurely, largely, almost languidly, but always watching for the peak of the postman's cap as it turned the corner by the courthouse, and following the toes of his foot as they stepped off the curb, to see if they pointed in his direction, and then turning aside with a deep breath and a smothered moan that ended in a rattle of the throat and a pretense at spitting. The postman saw him as he went by, and his little eyes twinkled treacherously. "'Nothing for you yet, Captain,' he said at length. Chut said Pete, with a mighty puff of smoke. "'My business isn't done by correspondence, Mr. Kelly.' "'Oh, no, but when a man's wife's away,' began the postman. "'Oh, I see,' said Pete, with a look of intelligence, and then with a lofty wave of the hand. "'She's like her husband, Mr. Kelly, not bothering much with letters at all.' "'You'll be longing for a line, though, Captain. That's only natural.' "'No news is good news. I can lave it with her.' "'Of course, that's truth enough, yes. But still and for all, the taste of a letter, it's doing no harm, Captain. Easy writ, too, and sweet to get sometimes, you know. Shows a woman isn't forgetting a man when she's away.' "'Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly,' said Pete, with his hand before his face, palm outwards. "'Not necessary? Well, I'll lave it with you. Good night, Captain.' "'Good night to you, sir,' said Pete. He had laughed and tut-tutted, and lifted his eyebrows and his hands in mock protest and a pretense of indifference, but the postman's talk had cut him to the quick. "'People are suspecting,' he thought. "'They're saying things.' This made him swear, but a thought came behind that made him sweat instead. "'Philip will be hearing them. They'll be telling him she doesn't write to me, that I don't know where she is, that she has left me, and that she's a bad woman. To make Kate stand well with Philip was an aim that had no rival but one in Pete's reckoning, to make Philip stand well with Kate. Out of the shadowland of his memory of the awful night of his bereavement, a recollection which had been lying dead until then came back now in its grave clothes to torture him. It was what Caesar had said of Philip's fight with Ross Christian. Philip himself had never mentioned it. That was like him, but when evil tongues told of Ross and hinted of mischief, Philip would know something already. He would be prepared. Perhaps he would listen and believe. Two days longer Pete sat in the agony of this new terror and the dogged impatience of his old hope. She'll write. She'll not leave me much longer. But she did not write, and on the second night before returning to the house from the gate he had made his plan. He must silence scandal at all hazards. However his own heart might bleed with doubts and fears and misgivings, Philip must never cease to think that Kate was good and sweet and true. "'Off to bed, Nancy,' he cried, heaving into the hall like a man in drink. "'I've work to do tonight, and want the house to myself.' "'Goodness me, is it yourself that's talking of bed, then?' said Nancy. Seven in the ever and two, and the child not an hour out of my hands. "'And dear knows what work it is if you can't be doing it with good people about you.' "'Come, get off, woman. You're looking tired, mortal. "'The little one's ragging you terrible. "'But what's it saying, Nancy? Bed is half bread. "'Truth enough, too, and the other half is beauty. "'Get off now. You're spoiling your complexion dreadful. "'I'll never be getting that husband for you.' "'Thus coaxing her, cajoling her, watching her, dodging her, nagging her, driving her, "'he got her off to bed at last. "'Being alone, he looked around, listened, shut the doors of the parlour and the kitchen, put the bolt on the door of the stairs, the chain on the door of the porch, took off his boots and went about on tiptoe. Then he blew out the lamp, filled and trimmed and relit it, going down on the hearthrug to catch the light of the fire. After that he settled the table, drew up the armchair, took from a corner cupboard pens and ink, a blotting pad, a packet of notepaper and envelopes, a stick of sealing wax, a box of matches, a postage stamp, the dictionary, and the exercise book in which Kate had taught him to write. As the clock was striking nine, Pete was squaring himself at the table, pen in hand, and his tongue in his left cheek. Half an hour later he was startled by an interruption. "'Who's there?' he shouted in a ferocious voice, leaping up with a look of terror, like a man caught in a crime. "'It was only Nancy.' who had come creeping down the stairs under pretense of having forgotten the baby's bottle. 
He made a sort of apologetic growl, handed the flat bottle through an opening like a crack, and ordered her back to bed. Goodness sake, said Nancy, going upstairs. Is it coining money the man is? Or is it whiskey itself that's doing on him? Two hours afterwards, Pete fancied he saw a face at the window, and he caught up a stick, unchained the door, and rushed into the garden. It was no one. The town lay asleep. The night was all but airless. Only the faintest breeze moved the leaves of the trees. There was no noise anywhere except the measured beat of the sea in its everlasting coming and going on the shore. Stepping back into the house, where the fire chirped and the kettle sang and all else was quiet, he resumed his task, and somewhere in the dark hours before the dawn he finished it. The fingers of his right hand were then inky up to the first joint, his collar was open, his neck was bare, his eyes were ablaze, the cords on his face were big and blue. Great beads of cold sweat were standing on his forehead, and the carpet around his chair was littered as white as if a snowstorm had fallen on it. He went down on his knees and gathered up these remnants and burnt them, with the air of a man destroying the evidences of his guilt. Then he put back the ink and the dictionary, the blotting pad and sealing wax, and replaced them with a loaf of bread, a table knife, a bottle of brandy, and a drinking glass. After that he made up the fire with a shovel of slack, that it might burn until morning, removed the lamp from the table to the window recess that it might cast its light into the darkness outside, and unchained the outer door that a wanderer of the night, if any such there were, might enter without knocking. He did all this in the absent manner of a man who did it nightly, then unbolting the staircase door, and listening a moment for the breathing of the sleepers overhead, he crept into the dark parlour overlooking the road, and lay down on the sofa to sleep. It was done. Pete's great scheme was afoot. The mighty secret which he had enshrouded with such awful mystery lay in an envelope in the inside breast pocket of his monkey jacket, signed, sealed, stamped, and addressed. Pete had written a letter to himself, End of Part 5, Chapter 2「Part 5, Chapter 3 of The Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part 5, Chapter 3 the next day the crier was crying, Great meeting, Manx fishermen, on zigzag at Peel, when boats come in tomorrow morning. Protest again harbour taxes. The thing itself, thought Pete, with his hand pressed hard on the outside of his breast pocket. At five o'clock in the afternoon he went down to the harbour, where his nicky lay at the quay, shouted to the master, Take an odd man tonight, Mr. Kemish, then dropped to the deck and helped to fetch the boat into the bay. They had to haul her out by poles along the quay wall, for the tide was low and there was no breakwater. It was still early in the herring season, but the fishing was in full swing. Five hundred boats from all parts were making for the fishing ground. It lay off the southwest tail of the island. Before Pete's boat reached it, the fleet was sitting together, like a flight of sea-fowl, and the sun was almost gone. The sun went down that night over the hills of Morn, very angry and red in its setting. The sky to the northwest was dark and sullen. The round line of the sea was bleared and broken, but there was little wind and the water was quiet. Bring to and shoot, cried Pete, and they dropped sail to the landward of the fleet, off the shoulder of the Calf Island, with its two lights making one. The boat was brought head to the wind, with the flowing tide veering against her. The nets were shot over the starboard quarter, and they dropped astern. The bow was swung round to the line of the floating mollags, and boat and nets began to drift together. Supper was served, the pump was worked, the lights were run up, the small boat was sent round with a flare to fright away the evil spirits, and then the night came down, a dark night without moon or stars, shutting out the island, though it stood so near, and even the rocks of the hen and chicken. The first man for the lookout took up his one hour's watch at the helm, and the rest went below. Pete's bunk was under the binnacle, 
and the light of its lamp fell on a stamped envelope which he took out of his breast pocket from time to time that he might read the inscription. It ran, Captain Peter Quilliam, Elm Cottage, Ramsey, Isle of Man. He looked at it lovingly, fondly, yearningly, yet with a certain awe, too, as if it were the casket of some hidden treasure, and he hardly knew what it contained. The dim-lit cabin was quiet, the net boiler sparched drops of hot water at intervals, the fire of the cooking stove slid and fell, the men breathed heavily from unseen beds, and the sea washed as the boat rolled. "'What's she saying, I wonder, I wonder? God bless her,' he mumbled, and then he too fell asleep. Two hours before hauling, they proved the fishing by taking in a pair of the net, found good herring, and blew the horn as signal that they were doing well. Then out of the black depths around, wherein no boat could be seen, the lights of other boats came floating silently astern, until the company about them in the darkness was like a little city of the sea and the night. At the first peep of morning over the round shoulder of the calf, the little city awoke. There were the clicks of the capstan, and the shouts of the men as the nets came back to the boats, heavy and white with fish. All being aboard, the men went down on the deck, according to their wont, every man on his knee with his face in his cap, and then leapt up with a shout, perhaps an oath, swung to the wind, hoisted the square sails, and made for home. The dark northwest was lowering by this time, and the sea was beginning to jump. Breakfast, boys, sang out Pete, with his head above the companion, and all but the helmsman went below. There was a pot full of the drop fish, and every man ate his warp of herring. It had been a great night's fishing. Some of the boats were full to the mouth, and all had plenty. We'll do middling if we get a market, said Pete. We've got to get home first, said the master, and at the same moment a sea struck the windward quarter with the force of a sledgehammer, and the block at the masthead began to sing. We'll run for Peel this morning, boys, said Pete, smothering his voice in a mouthful. Peel, said the master, shooting out his lip. They've got no harbour there at all with a cat's paw of a breeze, let alone a northwester. I'm for going up to the meeting, said Pete in an incoherent way. Then they tacked before the rising gale, and went off with the fleet as it swirled like a flight of gulls abreast of the wind. The sea came tumbling down like a shoal of sea hogs, and washed the faces of the men as they sat in oilskins on the hatch-head, shaking the herring out of the nets into the hold. But their work only began when they came into Peel. The tide was down, there was no breakwater, the neck of the harbour was narrow, and four hundred boats were coming to take shelter and to land their cargoes. It was a scene of tumult and confusion, shouting, swearing, and fighting among the men, and crushing and cranching among the boats as they nosed their way to the harbour mouth, threw ropes onto the quay, where fifty ropes were round one post already, or cast anchors up the bank of the castle rock, which was steep and dangerous to lie on. Pete got landed somehow, but his nicky with half the fleet turned tail and went round the island. As he leapt ashore, the helpless harbour-master, who had been bellowing over the babble through a cracked trumpet, turned to him and said, "'For the Lord's sake, Captain Quilliam, if you've got a friend that can lend us a hand, go off to the meeting at seven o'clock.' "'I mean to,' said Pete, but he had something else to do first. It was the task that had brought him to Peel, and no eye must see him do it. Slowly and slyly, like one who does a doubtful thing and pretends to be doing nothing, he went stealing through the town, behind the old courthouse and up Castle Street, into the marketplace, and across it to the line of shops which make the principal thoroughfare. At one of these shops, a little single-roomed place, with its small shutter still up, but the door half open and a noise of stamping going on inside, he stopped in a lounging way, half twisting on his heel as if idly looking back. It was the post office. With a stealthy look around, he put a trembling hand into his breast pocket, drew out the letter, screened it by the flat of his big palm, and posted it. Then he turned hurriedly away and was gone in a moment, like a man who feared pursuit, down a steep and tortuous alley that led to the shore. The morning was early. The shops were not yet open. Only the homes of the fishermen were putting out curling wreaths of smoke. The silent streets echoed to his lightest footstep. But the shore road was busy enough. 
Fishermen in sea boots and sou'westers, with oilskin over one arm and a string of herring in the other hand, were trooping from the harbour up to the zigzag by the rock called the Craig Mallin. It was at the end of the bay, where cliff and beach and sea together form a bag like the cod end of the trawl net. It's not the fishermen at all, it's the farmers they're thinking of, said one. You're right, said Pete, and it's some of ourselves that's to blame for it. How's that, said somebody. Easy enough, said Pete. When I came home from Kimberley, I met an old fisherman. You know the man, Billy. Well, you do. Dan, Phil Nelly, of Ramsey. How's the fishing, Phil, says I. He gave me a hm, and a heist of his neck. And I'm not fishing no more, says he. The wife's keeping a private hotel, says he. And what are you doing yourself, says I. I'm walking about, says he. And gosh bless me, if the man wasn't wearing a collar and carrying a stick, and prating about advertising the island, if you please. At the sound of Pete's voice, a group of the men gathered about him. "'That's not the worst, neither,' said he. "'The other day I tumbled over Tom Hommy. "'You know Tom Hommy? Yes, you do, the little deaf man up Malheur. "'He was lying in the hedge by the public house, three sheets in the wind. "'Why aren't you out with the boats, Tom?' says I. "'Wash for should I go out with the boats, "'when the childer can earn more on the roads,' says the drunken wastrel. "'And is yonder your boys and girls tossing somersaults at the tail of the tripper's car?' says I. "'Yes,' says he, "'and they'll earn more in a day at their caperings than their father in a week at the herrings.' "'I believe it enough,' said one. "'The man's about right,' said another. "'And a querulous voice behind said, "'Wonderful the prosperity of the island since the visitors came to it.' "'Get out with you there, for a disgrace to the name of Manxman,' "'sang out Pete over the heads of those that stood between.' with the farming going to the dogs and the fishing going to the devil. Do you know what the old island's coming to? It's coming to an island of lodging-house keepers and hackney-car drivers. Not the Isle of Man at all, but the Isle of Manchester. There was a tremendous shout at this last word. In another minute Pete was lifted shoulder-high over the crowd onto the highest turn of the zigzag path, and bidden to go on. There were five hundred faces below him, putting out hot breath in the cool morning air. The sun was shooting over the cliffs, a canopy as of smoke above their heads. On the top of the crag the sea-fowl were jabbering, and the white sea itself was climbing on the beach. Men, said Pete, there's not much to say. This morning's work said everything. We'd a right fishing last night, hadn't we? Four hundred boats came up to Peel, and we hadn't less than ten maize apiece. That's you that smarted your figuring and ciphering, spake out now. That's four thousand mays, isn't it? Shouts of, right. Oh, you're quick wonderful. No holding you at all when it's money that's in. Four thousand mays ready and waiting for the steamers to England. But did we land it? No, nor half of it neither. The other half's gone round to other ports, too late for the day's sailing. And half of that half will be going rotten and getting chucked back into the sea. That's what the Manx fishermen have lost this morning, because they haven't harbours to shelter them, and yet they're talking of levying harbour dues. Man, Veen, he's a boy. He's all that. Go it, Captain. What are we to do? Do, cried Pete. I'll tell you what you're to do. This is Friday. Next Thursday is old Midsummer Day. That's Tinwell Court Day. Come to St. John's on Thursday. Every man of you come. Come in your sea boots and your jerseys. Let the governor see you mane it. Give us reasonable hope of harbour improvement and we'll pay, says you. If you don't, we won't. And if you try to make us, we're two thousand strong and we'll rise like one man. Don't be freckened. You've a right to be bold in a good cause. I'll get somebody to speak for you. You know the man I mean. He stood the fisherman's friend before today, and he isn't going taking off his cap to the best man that's setting foot on Tinwell Hill. It was agreed. Between that day and Tinwell Day, Pete was to enlist the sympathy of Philip, and to go to Port St. Mary to get the cooperation of the Southside fishermen. The town was astir by this time, the sun was on the beach, and the fishermen trooped off to bed. End of Part 5, Chapter 3《Part Five, Chapter Four of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. 
Part Five, Chapter Four. Pete was back in his ship's cabin in the garden the same evening with a heart the heavier because for one short hour it had forgotten its trouble. The flowers were opening, the roses were creeping over the porch, the blackbird was singing at the top of the tree. But his own flower of flowers, his rose of roses, his bird of birds, where was she? Summer was coming, 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 coming with its light, coming with its music, coming with its sweetness, but she came not. The clock struck seven inside the house, and Pete, pipe in hand, swung over to the gate. No need tonight to watch for the postman's peak, no need to trace his toes. A letter for you, Mr. Quilliam. Hearing these words, Pete, his eyes half shut as if dozing in the sunset, wakened himself with a look of astonishment. What? For me, is it? A letter, you say? Oh, I see, taking it and turning it in his hand. Just a line from the mistress, it's like. Well, well, a letter for me, if you please. And he laughed like a man much tickled. He was in no hurry. He rammed his dead pipe with his finger, lit it again, sucked it, made it quack, drew a long breath, and then said quietly, Let's see what's the news at all. He opened the letter leisurely, and read bits of it aloud, as if reading to himself, but holding the postman while he did so, in idle talk on the other side of the gate. And how are you living today, Mr. Kelly? Oh, hm, getting that much better. It's extraordinary. Yes, a nice Everin. Very, Mr. Kelly, nice, nice. That happy and comfortable. And Uncle Joe is that good. Heavy bag at you tonight, you say? Oh, heavy, yes, heavy. Love to Granny and all inquiring friends. Nothing, Mr. Kelly, nothing. Just a scribe of a line, thinking a man might be getting uneasy. She needn't, though, she needn't. But should. It's nothing. Writing a letter is nothing to her at all. Why, she'd be knocking that off, bless you, holding out a half-sheet of paper, in less than an hour and a half. Truth enough, sir. Then looking at the letter again. What's this, though? P.N. They're always putting a P.N. at the bottom of a letter, Mr. Kelly. P.N. I was expecting to be home before, but I wouldn't get away for Uncle Joe taking me to the theatres. Ha, ha, ha! A mighty boy is Uncle Joe. But Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly with a solemn look. Not a word of this to Caesar. The postman had been watching Pete out of the corners of his ferret eyes. Do you know, Captain, what Black Tom is saying? What's that, said Pete, with a sudden change of tone. He's saying there is no Uncle Joe. No Uncle Joe, cried Pete, lifting voice and eyebrows together. The postman signified assent with a nod of his peak. Well, that's rich, said Pete, in a low breath raising his face as if to invoke the astonishment of the sky itself. No, Uncle Joe, he repeated in a tone of blank incredulity. Ask the man if it's in bed he is. Why, and Pete's eyes opened and closed like a doll's. He'll be saying there's no Auntie Joanie next. The postman looked up inquiringly. Never heard of Auntie Joanie, Uncle Joe's wife? No? Well, really, really, is it sleeping I am? Not Auntie Joanie, the primitive? Oh, a good old woman as ever lived, a saint, if ever the like was in, and died a triumphant death, too. No theatres for her, though. She won't bemain herself. No, but she's going to chapel regular, and getting up in the middle of every night of life to say her prayers. Deed she is. So Black Tom says there is no Uncle Joe? Pete gave a long whistle, then stopped it sudden with his mouth agape, and said from his throat, I see. He put his mouth close to the postman's ear and whispered, Ever hear Black Tom talk of the fortune he's expecting through the court of chancery? The postman's peak bobbed downwards. You have? Tom's thinking to grab it all for himself. Ha-ha, that's it. Ha-ha. The postman went off, blinking and giggling, and Pete reeled up the path, biting his lip and muttering, Keep it up, Pete, keep it up. It's ploughing a hard furrow, though. Then aloud, a letter from the mistress, Nancy. Nancy met him in the porch, clearing her fingers thick with dough. There you are, said Pete, flapping the letter on one hand. Good sakes alive, said Nancy. Did it come by the post, though, Pete? Look at the stamp, woman, and see for yourself, said Pete. My goodness me, from Kiri, you say? Let me in, then, and I'll be reading you bits. Nancy went back to her kneading with looks of bewilderment and Pete followed her, opening the letter. 
She's well enough, Nancy. No need to read that part at all. But see, running his forefinger along the writing, kisses for the baby and love to Nancy and tell Granny not to be fretting, etc., etc., see? Nancy looked up at her thumping and thunging and said, Did Mr. Kelly give it to you? He did that, said Pete, this minute at the gate. It's his time, isn't it? Nancy glanced at the clock. I suppose it must be right, she said. Take it in your hand, woman, said Pete. Nancy cleaned her hands and took the letter, turned it over and felt it in her fingers, as if it had been linen. And this is from Kerry, is it? It's nice, too. I haven't much schooling, Pete, but I'm asking no better than a letter myself. It's like a peppermint in your frock on Sunday. If you're low, you're always knowing it's there anyway. She looked at it again, and then she said, like one who says a strange thing, I once had a letter myself. Deed I had, Pete. It was from father. He went down in the black sloop, trading oranges with the blacks in their own island somewhere. They put into the port of London one day when they were having a funeral there. What's this one they were calling after the big boots? Wellingtons, that's the man. They were writing home all about it, the people and the chariots and the fighting horses and the music in the streets and the cathedrals, and we were never hearing another word from them again, never. To Miss Annie Kane, your affectionate father, Joe Kane. I knew it all off, every word, and I kept it ten years in my box under the lavender. Philip came later. He was looking haggard and tired. His face was pallid and drawn. His eyes were red, quick and wandering. His hair was neglected and ragged. His step was wavering and uncertain. Gosh, alive, man, cried Pete. Didn't you take oath to do justice between man and man? Philip looked up with alarm. Well, he said. Well, cried Pete, with a frown and a clenched fist. There's one man you're not doing justice to. Who's that, said Philip, with eyes down. Yourself, said Pete, and Philip drew a long breath. Pete laughed, protested that Philip must not work so hard, and then plunged into an account of the morning's meeting. Tremendous talk of enthusiasm. Man, Veen, man, Veen, didn't I say we'd rise as one man? We will, too. We're going up to Tinwall Court on Tinwall Day, two thousand strong. Tinwall Court? Yes, and why not? Drum and fife bands, bless you, two of them. Not much music, maybe, but there'll be noise enough. It's all settled. Southside fishermen are coming up Foxhall Way. Northside men going down by Peel, meeting under Harry Delaney's tree, and going up to the hill en masse. No bawling, though, no singing out, no disturbing the court at all. Well, well, what then, said Philip? Then we're wanting you to spake for us, Dempster. Oh, nothing much, nothing to rag you at all. Just tell them flat we won't. That'll do. It's a serious matter, Pete. I must think it over. Oh, think and think enough, Dempster. But mind you do it, though. The boys are counting on you. He's our anchor, and he'll hold, they're saying. But bother the harbours anyway, reaching his hand for something on the mantelpiece. What do you think? Nay, said Philip, with a long breath of weariness and relief. Guess then, said Pete, putting his hand behind him. Philip shook his head and smiled feebly. Then, with the expression of a boy on his birthday, Pete leaned over Philip and said in a half whisper across the top of his head, I've heard from Kate. Philip turned ghastly. His lip trembled, and he stammered, You've... you've heard from Kate, have you? Look at that, cried Pete, and round came the letter with a triumphant sweep. Philip's respiration grew difficult and noisy. Slowly, very slowly, he reached out his hand, took the letter, and looked at its superscription. Read it, read it, said Pete. No secrets at all. With head down and eyebrows hiding his eyes, with trembling hands that tore the envelope, Philip took out the letter and read it in passages, broken, blurred, smudged, as by the smoke of a forecastle lamp. Dearest Pete, I am getting that much better. I am that happy and comfortable. Sometimes I am longing for a sight of the little one's sweet face. No more at present, your own true wife. Come to the P.N. yet, Philip, said Pete. He was on his knees before the fire, lighting his pipe with a red coal. Expecting to be home soon, but give my love and best respects to the Dempster when you see him. He was so good to me when we're foreign the half was never told you. 
She's not laving a man on aisy, you see, said Pete. Philip could not speak. His throat was choking. His tongue filled his mouth. His eyes were swimming in tears that scorched them. Nancy, who had been up to Sulby with news of the letter, came in at the moment, and Philip raised his head. I told my aunt not to expect me tonight, Nancy. Is my room upstairs ready? Oh, yes, always ready, Your Honour, said Nancy, with a curtsy. He got up, with head aside, took a candle from Nancy's hand, excused himself to Pete. He was tired, sleepy, had a heavy day tomorrow, said good night, and went upstairs, stumbling and floundering, tore open his bedroom door, and clashed it back like a man flying from an enemy. Pete thought he had succeeded to admiration, but he looked after Philip and was not at ease. He had no misgivings. Writing was writing to him, and it was nothing more. But in the deep midnight, Philip, who had not slept, heard a thick voice that was like a sob coming from somewhere downstairs. He opened his door, crept out onto the stairhead, and listened. The house was dark. In some unseen place the voice was saying, "'Lord, forgive me for deceiving Philip. I couldn't help it, though. Thou knows thyself I couldn't. A lie's a dirty thing, Lord. It's like chewing dough. It sticks in your throat and chokes you. But I had to do it to save my poor lost lamb.' and if I didn't I should go mad myself. Thou knows I should. So forgive me, Lord, for Kiri's sake. Amen. The thick voice stopped. The house lay still. Then the child awoke in the room beyond, and its thin cry came through the darkness. Philip crept back in terror. This is what she had to go through. Oh, God, my God! End of Part 5, Chapter 4《Part Five, Chapter Five of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part Five, Chapter Five. Caesar called next day and took Pete to the office of the High Bailiff, where the business of the mortgage was completed. The deeds of Ballawhaine were then committed to Caesar's care for custody and safe keeping and he carried them off to his safe at the mill with a long stride and a face of fierce triumph. The old Ballawain is dying, he thought, and if we kick out the young one some day, it'll only be the Lord's hand on a rascal. On drawing his big cheque, Pete had realised that with reckless spending and more reckless giving, he had less than a hundred pounds to his credit. No matter, he thought, Philip will pay me back when he comes into his own. Granny was with Nancy at Elm Cottage when Pete returned home. The child was having its morning bath, and the two women were on their knees at either side of the tub, cackling and crowing like two old hens over one egg. "'Oh, did you ever now, Nancy? Deed no, you never did see a little angel. Up a daisy. Cry I must, Granny, when I see it looking so beautiful. Warm towels, you say? I'm a girl of this sort. When I get my heart down, I can never get it up again.' Full as earth, is it? Here, then. boo loo loo the bog millish. Nancy, we must be shortening her soon. And with that they fell to an earnest counsel on frocks and petticoat, and other mysteries unread by man. Pete sat and watched and listened. People will be crying shame on her if they see the granny doing everything, he thought. That night he lounged through the town and examined the shop windows out of the corner of his eye. He was trying to bear himself like a workman enjoying his Saturday night's ramble in clean clothes, but the streets were thronged, and he found himself observed. Not here, he told himself. I can buy nothing here. Doesn't do to be asleep at all, and a man isn't always in bed when he's sleeping. Some hours later, Nancy and the child being upstairs, Pete bethought himself of something that was kept at the bottom of a drawer. Going to the drawer to open it, he found it stiff to his tugging, and it came back with a jerk which showed it had not lately been disturbed. Pete found what he looked for, and came upon something beside. It was a cardboard box, tied about with a string, which was knotted in a peculiar way. Kate's knot, thought Pete with a sigh. He slipped it, and opened the lid and took out a baby's hood of scarlet plush. The very thing, he thought. He held it, mouth open, over his big brown hand, and laughed with delight. She's been buying it for the child and never using it. 
His eyes glistened. The very thing, he thought, and then he took down pen and paper to write something to go with it. This is what he wrote. For little Catherine from her love and mother. Then he held it at arm's length and looked at it. The subscription crossed the whole face of a half-sheet of paper, but the triumphant success of his former effort had made him bold. He could not resist the temptation to write more, so he turned the paper over and wrote on the back, Tell Papa not to worry about me. I expect to be home soon, but don't know exactly. His eyes were swimming by the time he got that down, but they brightened again as he remembered something. We've had great times here, Uncle Joe. Must go on milking that old cow, he thought. Took me to see the Prince of Wales yesterday. He could not help it. He began to take a wild joy in his own inventions. Flags and bands of music all day and luminations all night. It was grand we were top of an omnibus going down Lord Street and saw him as plain as plain. Bless me, said Pete, dropping his pen and rubbing his hands in ravishing contemplation of his own fiction. The next thing we hear she'll be riding in her carriage and pair. He was sobbing a little for all that, in a low, smothered way, but he could not deny himself one word more. Love to all inquiring friends and best respects to the Dempster, if I'm not forgot at him. The second forgery of love being finished, he went about the house on tiptoe, found brown paper and twine, put the hood back into the box with his half-sheet peeping from between the frills where the little face would go, and made it up with his undeft fingers into an ungainly parcel, which he addressed to himself as before. After that he did his accustomed duty with the lamp and the door, and lay down in the parlour to sleep. On Monday at dinner he broke out peevishly with, Terrible botheration, Nancy. I must be going to Port St. Mary about that thunder and demonstration. Then from underneath the sofa in the parlour he rooted up a brown paper parcel, stuffed it under his coat, buttoned it up, and so smuggled it out of the house. End of Part 5, Chapter 5《Part Five, Chapter Six of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain, Part Five, Chapter Six. They set sail early in the afternoon and ran down the coast under a fair breeze that made the canvas play until the sea hissed. The day was wet and cheerless. A thick mist enshrouded the land and going by Laxey they could just descry the top arc of the great wheel like a dun-coloured ghost of a rainbow in a grey sky. As they came to Douglas the mist was lifting, but the rain was coming down in a soaking drizzle. A band was playing dance tunes on the iron pier, which shot like a serpent's tongue out of the mouth of the bay. The steamer from England was coming round the head, and her seasick passengers were dense as a crowd on her forward deck the men with print handkerchiefs tied over their caps, the women with their skirts over their drooping feathers. A harp and a violin were scraping lively airs amidships. The town was like a cock with his tail down, crowing furiously in the wet. When they came to Port St. Mary, the mist had risen and the rain was gone, but the fishing town looked black and sullen under a lowering cloud. The tide was down and many boats lay on the beach and in the shallow water within the rocks. Pete was put ashore. His nicky went round the calf to the herring ground beyond the shoulder. A number of fishermen were waiting for him on the quay, with heavy looks and hands deep in their trousers' pockets. "'No need for much preaching at all,' said Pete, pointing to the boats lying aground. "'There you are, boys, fifty of you at least, with no room to warp for the rocks. Yet they're for taxing you for dues for a harbour.' "'Go ahead, Captain,' said one of the fishermen. There's five hundred men here to back you up through thick and thin. Pete posted his brown paper parcel as stealthily as he had posted his letter, and left Port St. Mary the same night for Douglas. The roads were thick with coaches, choked full with pleasure-seekers from Port Erin. These cheerful souls were still wearing the clothes which had been drenched through in the morning. Their boots were damp and cold. They were chill with the night air, but they did not repine. 
They sang and laughed and ate oranges, drew up frequently at wayside houses, and handed round bottles of beer with the corks drawn. In their own way they were bright and cheerful company. Sometimes hold the fort, sung in a break going ahead, mingled with Molly and I and the baby from lusty throats coming behind. Battling through Castle Town, they shouted wild chaff at the redcoats lounging by the castle, and when the darkness fell they dropped to sleep, the men usually on the women's shoulders, and then the horses' hoofs were heard splashing along the muddy road, and every rider cracked his whip over a chorus of stertorous snores. Douglas was ablaze with light as they dipped down to it from the dark country. Long, sinuous tails of light where the busy streets were running in and out, this way and that, and belching into the wide squares and marketplaces like the race of a current fire. The sleepers awoke and shook themselves. "'Going to the castle tonight?' said one. "'What do you think?' said another, and they all laughed at the foolish question. "'I'll sleep here,' thought Pete. "'I've not searched Douglas yet.' The driver found him a bed at his mother's house. It was a lodging house in Church Street, overlooking the churchyard. Finding himself so near to Athol Street, Pete thought he would look at the outside of Philip's chambers. He lit on the house easily, though the street was dark. It was one of a line of houses having brass plates, each with its name, and always the word advocate. Philip's house bore one plate only, a small one, with the name hardly legible in the uncertain light. It ran, The Deemster Christian. Having spelt out this inscription, Pete crept away. That was the last house in the island at which he wished to call. He was almost afraid of being seen in the same town. Philip might think he was in Douglas to look for Kate. Pete rambled through the narrow thoroughfares of Post Office Place, Haywood Lane and Fancy Street until he came to the seafront. It was now full tide of busy night and the holiday town seemed to be given over to enjoyment. The steps of the terraces were thronged. Itinerant photographers pitched their cameras on the curbstones. Every open window had its dark heads with the light behind. Pianos were clashing in houses, harps were twanging in the street, tinkling tramcars like toast racks were sweeping the curve of the bay. There was a steady flow of people on the pavement, and from water's edge to cliff top, three parts round like a horse's shoe, the town flashed and fizzled and sparkled, and blazed under its thousand lights with the splendour of a forest fire. Pete called to mind the blinking and groping of the dear old half-lit town to the north. He remembered the dark village at the foot of the lonely hills, with its trout stream burrowing under the low bridge, and he thought, she may have tired of it all, poor thing. He looked at every woman's face as she went by him, hungering for one glimpse of a face he feared to see. He did not see it, and he wandered like a lost soul through the little gay town until he drifted with the wave that flowed around the bay into the place that was known as the castle. It was a dancing palace in a garden, built in the manner of a conservatory, with the ground level for those who came to dance and the galleries for such as came to see. Seated by the front rail of the gallery, Pete peered down into the faces below, Three thousand young men and young women were dancing, the men in flannels and coloured scarves, the women in light muslins and straw hats. Sometimes the white lights in the glass roof were coloured with red and blue and yellow. The low buzz of the dancers' feet, the clang and clash of the brass instruments, the boom of the big drum, the quake of the glass house itself, and the low rumble of the hollow floor beneath, it was like a battlefield set to music. She may have tired, poor thing, God knows she may, thought Pete. His eyes were growing hazy and his head dizzy when he became conscious of a waft of perfume behind him, and a soft voice saying at his ear, Were you looking for anybody then? He turned with a start and looked at the speaker. It was a young girl with a pretty face, thick with powder. He could not be angry with the little thing. She was so young and she was smiling. Yes, he said, I was looking for somebody. And then he tried to shake her off. "'Is it Maudie, you mean, dear? "'Are you the young man from Dublin?' "'Lave me, my girl, lave me,' said Pete, "'patting her hand and twisting about. "'The girl looked at him with a sort of pity, "'and then close at his neck she said, "'A fine boy like you shouldn't be going fretting his heart "'about the best girl that's in.' "'He looked at the pretty face again, "'and the little knowing airs began to break down. "'You're a Manx girl, aren't you?' 
The smile vanished like a flash. How do you know that? My tongue doesn't tell you, does it? And the little thing was ashamed. Pete took the tight-gloved fingers in his big palm. So you're my little countrywoman, then, he said. How old are you? The painted lips began to tremble. Sixteen for harvest, she answered. My God, exclaimed Pete. The darkened eyelids blinked. She was beginning to cry. It wasn't my fault. He was a visitor with my mother at Balor, and he left me to it. Pete took a sovereign out of his pocket and shut it in the girl's hand. Go home tonight, my dear, he whispered, and then he clambered out of the place. Not there, cried Pete in his heart. Not there. I swear to God she is not there. That ended his search. He resolved to go home the same night, and he went back to his lodgings to pay his bill. Turning out of Athol Street, Pete was almost overrun by a splendid equipage, with two men in buff on the box seat, and one man behind. The governor's carriage, said somebody. At the next moment it drew up at Philip's door, its occupant alighted, and then it swung about and moved away. It was the young deemster, said a girl to her companion, as she went skipping past. Pete had seen the tall, dark figure, bent and feeble, as it walked heavily up the steps. Truth enough, he thought. There's nothing got in this world without paying the price of it. It was three in the morning when Pete reached Ramsay. Elm Cottage was dark and silent. He had to knock again and again before awakening Nancy. Now if this had been Kate, he thought, and a new fear took hold of him. His poor darling, his wandering lamb, could she have knocked twice? Where was she tonight? He had been picturing her in happiness and plenty. Was she in poverty and distress? All the world was sleeping. Was she asleep? His hope was slipping away. His great faith was breaking down. Lord, do not forsake me. Master, strengthen me. My poor lost love, where is she? What is she? Shall I see her face again? Something cold touched his hand. It was the dog. Without a bark, he had put his nose into Pete's palm. What, Dempster man, Dempster? The bat's ears were cocked. Pete felt them. The scut of a tail was wagged, and Pete got comfort from the battered old friend that had tramped the world at his heels. Nancy unchained the door, opened it an inch, held a candle over her head and peered out. My goodness, is it the man himself? However did you come home? By John the Flayer's pony, said Pete and he laughed and made light of his night-long walk. But next morning, when Nancy came downstairs with the child, Pete was busy with a screwdriver taking the chain off the door. Terrible old-fashioned, these chains. Must be moving with the times, you know. Then what are you putting in its place, said Nancy. You'll see, you'll see, said Pete. At seven that night, Pete was smoking over the gate when Kelly the thief came up with a brown paper parcel. Parcel for you, Mr. Crulliam, said the postman, with the air of a man who knew something he should not know. Pete blinked and looked bewildered. You don't say, he said. Well, if that's your name, began the postman, holding the address for Pete to read. Pete gave it a searching look. Captain Peter Crulliam, that's it, certainly. Elm Cottage. Yes, it must be right, he said, taking the parcel gingerly. Then with a prolonged, ooh, ooh shutting his eyes and nodding his head. I know, a bit of a present from the mother to the little one. Wonderful thoughtful a woman is about a baby when she's a mother, Mr. Kelly. The postman giggled, threw his finger seaward over one shoulder, and said, Why aren't you writing back to her, then? What's that? said Pete sharply, making the parcel creak. Why aren't you writing to tell her how the little one is, I'm saying? Pete looked at the postman as if the idea had dropped from heaven. I must have a head as thick as a mooring post, Mr. Kelly. Do you know I never once thought of it? I'm like Goliath when he got little David Stone at his forehead. Such a thing never entered my head before. Do it for all, Mr. Quilliam, said the postman, moving off. I will, I will, said Pete, and then he turned into the house. Scissors, Nancy, he shouted, throwing the parcel on the table. My sakes, a parcel, cried Nancy. Easy to tell where it comes from, too. See that knot, woman? said Pete with a knowing wink. What in the world is it, Pete? said Nancy. I wonder, said Pete. Paper's enough round it anyway. A letter? We'll look at that after, he said loftily, and then out came the scarlet hood. Gosh, bless me, what's this thing at all? And he held it up by the crown. 
Nancy made a cry of alarm, took the hood out of his hand, and scolded him roundly. These men, they're fit to spoil an angel's wings. Then she whipped up the baby out of the cradle, tried the hood on the little round head, and shouted with delight. Now I was thinking of that, do you know, she said. I was, yes, I was. Believe me or not, I was. Curie will be sending something for the little one the next time she writes, I was thinking. And behold ye, here it is. Something spakes to us, Nancy, said Pete. Deed it does, though. The child gurgled and purred, and for all her fine headgear she was absorbed in her bare toes. And there's yourself, Pete, going to Peel and to Douglas, and I don't know where, and you've never once thought of the little one, and knowing we were for shortening her, too. Pete cast down his head and looked ashamed. Well, no, of course, I never have. That's truth enough, he faltered. End of Part 5, Chapter 6part 5 chapter 7 of the manxman this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the manxman by sir hall kane part 5 chapter 7 pete went out to buy a sheet of note paper and an envelope a pen and a postage stamp he had abundance of all these at home but that did not serve his turn Going to as many shops as might be, he dropped hints everywhere of the purpose to which his purchases were to be put. Finally he went to the barbers in the marketplace and said, "'Will you write an address for me, John Ake? "'Course I will,' said the barber, sweeping a hand of velvet over one cheek of the postman, who was in the chair, leaving the other cheek in lather while he took up the pen. "'Mistress Peter Quilliam, care of Master Joseph Quilliam, Esquire, Scotland Road, Liverpool,' dictated Pete." "'What number, Captain?' said Janake. "'Number?' said Pete, perplexed. "'Bless me, what's this the number is now? "'Oh, by sudden inspiration, five hundred and fifteen. Five hundred, do you say five? said the postman, "'from the half of his mouth that was clear. Five, said Pete emphatically. "'Oh, they're well up.' "'If you say so, Captain,' said the barber, "'and down went five one five. Pete returned home with the stamped and addressed envelope open in his hands. Claim the table quick, he shouted. I must be writing to Kiri. Will I give her your love, Nancy? With much hemming and harring and clearing of his throat, Pete was settling himself before a sheet of note paper when the door opened and Philip stepped into the house. His face was haggard and emaciated. His eyes burned as with a fire that came up from within. I've come to warn you, he said. You're in great danger. "'You must stop that demonstration.' "'Sit down, sir, sit down,' said Pete. "'Philip did not seem to hear. "'He walked to and fro with short, nervous, noiseless steps. "'The governor sent for me last night, and I found him in a frenzy. "'Deemster,' he said, "'they tell me there's to be a disturbance at Tinwald. "'Have you heard of anything?' "'I said yes, I had heard of a meeting of fishermen at Peel. "'They talk of their rights,' said he. I'll teach them something of one right they seem to forget, the right of the governor to shoot down the disturbers of Tinwall, without judge or jury. That's a very old prerogative, Your Excellency, I said. It comes down from more lawless days than ours. You will never use it. Will I not, said he. Listen, I'll tell you what I've done already. I've ordered the regiment at Castletown to be on Tinwall Hill on Tinwall Day. Every man of these, there are three hundred, shall have twenty rounds of bull cartridge. Then if the vagabonds try to interrupt the court, I've only to lift my hand, so, and they'll be mown down like grass. You can't mean it, I said, and I tried to take his big talk lightly. Judge for yourself, see? And he showed me a paper. It was an order for the ambulance wagons to be stationed on the ground, and a request to the doctors of Douglas to be present. Then we've made the old boy see that we mean it, said Pete. "'If you know any one of the ringleaders, Deemster,' he said, with a look into my face, "'somebody had been with him. There are tell-tales everywhere.' "'It's the way of the world still,' said Pete. "'Tell him,' said he, "'that I don't want to take the life of any man. I don't want to send any one to penal servitude. It was useless to protest. The man was mad, but he was in earnest. His plan was folly, frantic folly, but it was based on a sort of legal right.' So for the Lord's sake, Pete, stop this thing. Stop it at once, and finally, it's life or death. 
If ever you thought my word worth anything, you'll do as I bid you now. God knows where I should be myself if the governor were to do what he threatens. Stop it, stop it. I haven't slept for thinking of it. Pete had been sitting at the table, chewing the tip of the pen, and now he lifted to the paleness and wildness of Philip's face a cool, bold smile. It's good of you, Phil. We've a right to be there, though, haven't we? You've a right, certainly, but... Then, by gosh, we'll go, said Pete, dropping the pen and bringing his fist down on the table. The penalty will be yours, Pete, yours. You are the man who will suffer. You first, you alone. Pete smiled again. No use, I'm incorrible. I'm like Danny Clay, the sheep-stealer, when he came to die. I'm going to eternal judgment. What'll I do, says Dan? Give back all you've stolen, says the parson. I'll chance it first, says the old rascal. It's the other fellow that's for stealing this time, but I'll chance it, Philip. Death it may be, and judgment too, but I'll chance it, boy. Philip's eyes wandered over the floor. Then you'll not change your plan for anything I've told you? I will, though, said Pete, for one thing anyway. You shan't be getting into trouble. I'll be spokesman for the fisherman myself. Oh, I'll speak enough if they get my dander up. I'll just square my arms across my chest, and I'll say, Your Excellency, I'll say, you can't do it, and you shan't do it, because it isn't right. But shoot, botheration to all such bobbery. Look here, man alive, look here. She's not forgetting the little one, you see. And making a proud sweep of the hand, Pete pointed to the scarlet hood. It had been put to sit across the back of a china dog on the mantelpiece, with Pete's half-sheet of paper pinned to the strings. Philip recognized it. The hood was the present he had made as godfather, his eyes blinked, his mouth twitched, the cords of his forehead moved. So she... she sent that, he stammered. Listen here, said Pete, and he unpinned the paper and read the message aloud with flourishes of voice and gesture. For little Catherine from her loving mother, papa not to worry, love to all inquiring friends, best respects to the Dempster if I'm not forgot at him. Then in an offhand way he tossed the paper into the fire. Oh, what's a bit of a letter, he said largely, as it took flame and burned. Philip's bloodshot eyes seemed to be starting from his head. Nancy's right. A man would never have thought of the like of that. Now would he, said Pete, looking proudly from Philip to the hood, and from the hood back to Philip. Philip did not answer. Something seemed to be throttling him. But when a woman goes away, she leaves her eyes behind her, as you might say. "'What'll I be getting for them that's at home?' she's thinking. "'And up comes a nice warm little thing for the baby. "'Oh, the women's good, Philip. "'They're what they make the sovereigns of, God bless them.' "'Philip felt as if he must rush out of the house shrieking. "'One moment he stood up before Pete, as though he meant to say something, "'and then he turned to go. "'Not sleeping tonight? No? "'Have to get back to Douglas? "'Then maybe you'll write me a letter first. "'Philip nodded his head and returned.' his mouth tightly closed, sat down at the table, and took up the pen. "'What is it?' he asked. "'Am I to give you the words, Phil?' "'Yes. Well, if you won't be thinking main. Pete charged his pipe out of his waistcoat pocket, and began to dictate. "'Dear wife!' At that Philip gave an involuntary cry. "'Or oh, best to begin proper, you know. Dear wife,' said Pete again. Philip made a call on his resolution.' and put the words down. His hand felt cold. His heart felt frozen to the core. Pete lit up and walked to and fro as he dictated his letter. Nancy sat knitting by the cradle with one foot on the rocker. Glad to get your welcome letter, darling, and the bonnet for the baby. Go on, said Philip in an impassive voice. Got that down, Philip? Oh, you're smart, wonderful with the pen, though. When she's got it on her little head, you'd laugh tremendous. She's straight like a little John the Baptist in the church window. Pete paused. Philip lifted his pen and waited. Done already? Man, Veen, there's no holding you. Glad to hear you're so happy and comfortable with Uncle Joe and Auntie Joni. Give the pair of them my fond love and best respects. We're getting on beautiful and I'm as happy as a sandboy. Sometimes Granny gets a bit down with longing, and so does Nancy, but I tell them you'll be home for their funeral sermon anyway, and then they're comforted wonderful. Don't be writing his rubbish and lies, your honour, said Nancy. 
Shoot, woman, where's the harm at all? A merry touch to keep a person's spirits up when she's away from home, eh, Philip? And Pete appealed to him with a nudge at his writing elbow. Philip gave no sign. With a look of stupor, he was staring down at the paper as he wrote. Pete puffed and went on. Caesar's at it still, going through the Bible same as a trawl boat, fishing up the little texts. The Dempster's putting a sight on us regular, and you're not forgot at him neither. Deed no, but thinking of you constant, and trusting you're the better for leaving home. Going too fast, am I? So I'm baiting you at last, eh? A cold perspiration had broken out on Philip's forehead, and he was looking up with the eyes of a hunted dog. Am I too... Must I write that, he said in a helpless way. Course, go ahead, said Pete, puffing clouds of smoke and laughing. Philip wrote it. His hand was now stiff. It sprawled and splashed over the paper. As for myself, I'm a sort of a grass widow, and if you keep me without a wife much longer, you'll be taxing me for a bachelor. Pete put his pipe on the mantelpiece, cleared his throat repeatedly, and began to be afflicted with a cough. "'Glad to hear you're coming home soon, darling. <coughs> "'Dearest Kiri, I'm missing you mortal. <coughs> "'Worse nor at Kimberley. <coughs> "'When I'm going to bed, where is she tonight, I'm saying? "'And when I'm getting up, where is she now, I'm thinking? "'And in the dark midnight I'm asking myself, "'Is she asleep, I wonder? <coughs> <coughs> "'Come home quick, Boch, but not before you're well at all.' "'Never do fetch her too soon, you know,' he said in a whisper over Philip's shoulder, with another nudge at his elbow. Philip answered incoherently, and shrank under Pete's touch, as if he had been burnt. The coughing continued. The dictating began again. "'I'm keeping a warm nest for you here, love. There'll be a welcome from everybody, and nobody saying anything but the good and the kind. So come home soon, my true little wife, before the foolish old heart of your husband is losing him.' Pete coughed violently, and stretched his neck and mouth awry. This cough I've got in my neck is fit to tear me in pieces, he said. A spoonful of cold pinjane, Nancy. It's terrible good to soften the neck. Nancy was nodding over the cradle. She had fallen asleep. Philip had turned white and giddy and sick. For one moment an awful impulse seized him. He wanted to fall on Pete, to lay hold of him, to choke him. The consciousness of his own inferiority... His own duplicity made him hate Pete. The very sweetness of the man sickened him. He could not help it. The last spark of his self-pride was fighting for its life. Then in shame, in remorse, in horror of himself and dread of everything, he threw down the pen, caught up his hat, shouted good night in a voice like the growl of a beast in terror, and ran out of the house. Nancy started up from a doze. Goodness gracious, she said and the cradle rocked violently under her foot. "'He's that tender-hearted and sympathising,' whispered Pete as he closed the door. <coughs> "'The letter's finished, though, and here's the envelope.'" End of Part 5, Chapter 7「Part 5, Chapter 8 of The Manxman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part 5, Chapter 8 The following evening the Deemster was in his rooms in Athol Street. His hat was on, his cloak was over his arm, he was resting his elbow on the sash of the window and looking vacantly into the churchyard. Jem was behind him, answering at his back. Their voices were low. They scarcely moved. "'All well upstairs,' said Philip. "'Pretty well, Your Honour. "'More cheerful and content?' "'Much more, except when Your Honour is from home. "'The Deemster's back, she'll say, "'and her poor face will be like sunshine on a rainy day.' Philip remained silent for a moment, and then said in a scarcely audible voice, "'Not fretting so much about the child, Jemmy.' "'Just as anxious to hear of it, though. "'Has he been to Ramsay today? "'Did he see her? "'Is she well? "'That's the word constant, sir.' "'The deemster was silent again, "'and Jem was withdrawing with a deep bow. "'Jemmy, I'm going to Government House, "'and may be late. "'Don't wait up for me.' "'Jem answered in a half-whisper. 
Someone waits up for your honour whether I do or not. He's at home now, she'll say, and then creep away to bed. Philip muttered thickly and huskily, The decanter is empty. Leave out another bottle. Then he turned to go from the room, keeping his eyes from his servant's face. He found the governor as violent as before, and eager to fall on him before he had time to speak. They tell me, Deemster, that the leader of this rising is a sort of left-hand relative of yours. Surely you can stop the man. I've tried to, Your Excellency, and failed, said Philip. The governor tossed up his chin. I'm told the fellow can't even write his own name, he said. It's true, said Philip, an illiterate and utterly uneducated person. All the same, he's the wisest and strongest man on this island, said Philip decisively. The governor frowned, and the pockmarks on his forehead seemed to swell. The wisest and strongest man on this island will have to leave it, he said. Philip made no answer. He had come to plead, but he saw that it was hopeless. The governor put his right hand in the breast of his white waistcoat. He was alone in the dining room after dinner, and darted at Philip a look of anger and command. Deemster, he said, if, as you say, you cannot stop this low-bred rascal, there's one thing you can do. Leave him to himself. That is to say, said Philip, out of a corner of his mouth, to you. To me be it. And who has more right, said the governor hotly. Philip held himself in hand. He was silent, and his silence was taken for submission. Cracking some nuts and munching them, the governor began to take another tone. I should be sorry, Mr. Christian, if anything came between you and me, very sorry. We've been good friends thus far, and you will allow that you owe me something. Don't you see it yourself? This man is dishonouring me in the eyes of the island. If you have tried your best to keep his neck out of the halter, let the consequences be his own. Eh? said Philip, with his eyes on the floor. You have done your duty by the man, I say. Help yourself to a glass of wine. Still Philip did not speak. The governor saw his advantage, but little did he guess the pitiless power of it. The fellow is your kinsman, Deemster, and I shall not ask you to deal with him. That would be inhuman. If there is no hope of restraining him tomorrow, wise as he is, if he will not listen to saner counsels, I will only beg of you. But this is a matter for the police. You are a high official now. It would be a pity to give you pain. Stay at home. I'll gladly excuse you. You look as if a day's rest would do you good. Philip drank two glasses of the wine in quick succession. The governor poured him a third and went on. I don't know what your feeling for the man may be. It can't be friendship. I'm sure he's a thorn in your flesh. And as long as he's here, he will always be. Philip looked up with inquiry, doubt, and fear. Ah, I knew it. Even if this matter goes by, your time will come. You'll quarrel with the fellow yet. You know you will. It's in the nature of things, if he's the man you say. Philip drank the third glass of wine and rose to go. Leave him to me. I'll deal with him. You'll be done with him, and a good riddance too, I reckon. And now come in to the ladies. They'll know you're here. Philip excused himself and went off with feverish gestures and an excited face. The governor is right, he thought, as he went home over the dark roads. Pete was a thorn in his flesh, and always would be. His enemy, his relentless enemy, notwithstanding his love for him. The misery of the past month could not be supported any longer. Perpetual fear of discovery, perpetual guard of the tongue, keeping watch and ward on every act of life, today, tomorrow, the next day, on and on until life's end in wretchedness or disgrace. It was insupportable. It was impossible. It could not be attempted. Then came thoughts that were too fearful to take form, too awful to take words. They were like the flapping of unseen wings going by him in the night, but the meaning of them was this. If Pete persists in his purpose, there will be a riot. If anyone is injured, Pete will be transported. If anyone is killed, Pete will be indicted for his life. Well, I have done my duty by him, his heart whimpered. I have tried to restrain him. I have tried to restrain the governor. It isn't my fault. What more can I do? Philip walked fast. Here was the way to escape from the evil that beset his path. Fate was stretching out her hands to him. When men had done wrong, they did yet more wrong to elude the consequences of their first fault. But there was no need for that in his case. The hour was late. A strong breeze was blowing off the sea. It flicked his face with salt as he went swinging down the hill into the town. His blood was afire. 
He had a feeling, never felt before, of courage and even ferocity. Something told him that he was not so good a man as he had been, but it was a tingling pleasure to feel that he was a stronger man than before. Should he tell Kate? No. Let the thing go on. Let it end. After it was over, she would see where their account lay. Thinking in this way, he laughed aloud. The town was quiet when he came to it. So absorbed had he been, that though the air was sharp, he had been carrying his cloak over his arm. Now he put it on, and drew the hood close over his head. A dog, a homeless cur, had begun to follow at his heels. He drove it off, but it continued to hang about him. At last it got in front of his feet, and he stumbled over it in one of his large, quick strides. Then he kicked the dog, and it crossed the dark street yelping. He was a worse man, and he knew it. He let himself into the house with his latch-key, and banged the door behind his back. But no sooner had he breathed the soft, woolly, stagnant air within than a change came over him. His ferocious strength ebbed away, and he began to tremble. The hall passage and staircase were in darkness. This was by his orders. Coming in late, he always forgot to put out the gas. But the lamp of his room was burning on the candle-rest at the stairhead, and it cast a long sword of light down the staircase well. Chilled by some unknown fear, he had set one foot on the first tread when he thought he heard the step of someone coming down the stairs. It was a familiar step. He was sure he knew it. It must be a step he heard daily. He stopped, and the step seemed to stop also. At that moment there was a shuffling of slippered feet on an upper landing, and Gemma Lord called down, Is it you, Your Honour? With an effort he answered, Yes. Is anything the matter, called the manservant? There's somebody coming downstairs, isn't there, said Philip. Somebody coming downstairs, repeated the manservant, and the light shifted as if he were lifting the lamp. Is it you coming down, Jem? Me coming down? I'm here holding the lamp, Your Honour. Another of my fancies, thought Philip, and he laid hold of the handrail and started afresh. The step came on. He knew it now. It was his own step. An echo, he told himself. A dream, he thought. A mirage of the mind. And he compelled himself to go up. The step came down. It passed him on the stairs, going by the wall as he went by the rail, with an irresistible down-drive headlong heavily. Then came one of those moments of partial unconsciousness in which the sensation of a sound takes shape. It seemed to Philip that the figure of a man had passed him. He remembered it instantly. It was the same that he had seen in the lobby to the council chamber, his own figure, but wrapped in a cloak like the one he was then wearing, and with the hood drawn over the head. The body had been half turned aside, the face had been hidden, and the whole form had expressed contempt, repugnance, and loathing. "'Not well to-night, Your Honour," said the far-off voice of Gemma Lord. He was holding the dazzling lamp up to the deemster's face. "'A little faint. That's all. Go to bed.' Then Philip was alone in his room. "'Conscience,' he thought. "'Pete may go, but this will be with me to the end. "'Which, oh God, which?' He poured out half a tumbler from the bottle on the table and gulped it down at a draught. At the same moment he heard a light foot overhead. It was a woman's foot. It crossed the floor and then ceased. End of Part 5 Chapter 8"'Part Five, Chapter Nine of The Manxman. "'This is a LibriVox recording. "'All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. "'For more information or to volunteer, "'please visit LibriVox.org. "'The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, "'Part Five, Chapter Nine. "'Next morning the Deemster was still sleeping "'while the sun was shining into his room. "'He was awakened by a thunderous clamour, "'which came as from a nail driven into the back of his head. Opening his eyes, he realized that somebody was knocking at his door, and shouted in a robust bass, "'Christian, I say, ever going to get up at all?' It was the clerk of the rolls. Under one of his heavy poundings, the catch of the door gave way, and he stepped into the room. "'Degenerate manxman!' he roared. "'In bed on Tinwell morning. Pooh! this room smells of dead sleep, dead spirits, and dead everything!' Let me get at that window. You pitch your clothes all over the floor. Ah, that's fresher. Headache? I should think so. Get up then, and I'll drive you to St. John's. 
Don't think I'll go today, sir, said Philip in a feeble whimper. Not go? Holy saints! Judge of his island and not to go to Tinwald? What will the governor say? He said last night he would excuse my absence. Excuse your fiddlesticks. The air will do you good. I've got the carriage below. Listen, it's striking ten by the church. I'll give you fifteen minutes, and step into your breakfast room and look over the times. The clerk rolled out, and then Philip heard his loud voice through the door in conversation with Gemma Lord. And how's Mrs. Cottier today? Middling, sir, thank you, sir. You don't let us see too much of her, Jemmy. Not been well since coming to Douglas, sir. Cups and saucers rattled, the newspaper creaked, the clerk cleared his throat, and there was silence. Philip rose with a heavy heart, still in the torment of his great temptation. He remembered the vision of the night before, and broad morning as it was, he trembled. In the Isle of Man such visions are understood to foretell death, and the man who sees them is said to see his soul. But Philip had no superstitions. He knew what the vision was, he knew what the vision meant. Gemma Lord came in with hot water, and Philip, without looking round, said in a low tone as the door closed, "'How now, my lad?' "'Fretting again, Your Honour," said the man, in a half-whisper. He busied himself in the room a moment, and then added, "'Somehow she gets to know things. Yesterday evening now, I was taking down some of the bottles, and I met her on the stairs. Next time I saw her, she was crying.' Philip said in a confused way, fumbling the razor, "'Tell her I intend to see her after Tinwald.' "'I have, Your Honour. It's not that, Mr. Cottier,' she answered me. "'My wig and gown today, Jemmy,' said Philip, and he went out in his robes as Deemster. The day was bright, and the streets were thronged with vehicles. Brakes, wagonettes, omnibuses, private carriages, and cadgers' carts, all loaded to their utmost, were climbing out of Douglas by way of the road to Peel. The town seemed to shout. The old island rock itself seemed to laugh. "'Bless me, Christian,' said the clerk of the rolls, looking at his watch. Do you know it's half past ten? Service begins at eleven. Drive on, coachman. You've eight miles to do in half an hour. Can't go any faster with this traffic on the road, sir, said the coachman over his shoulder. I got so absorbed in the newspaper, said the clerk, that, well, if we're late, we're late, that's all. Philip folded his arms across his breast and hung his head. He was fighting a great battle. No idea that the fisherman affair was going to be so serious, said the clerk. It seems the governor has ordered out every soldier and pensioner. If I know my countrymen, they'll not stand much of that. Philip drew a long breath. There was a cloud of dust. The women in the brakes were laughing. I hear a whisper that the ringleader is a friend of yours, Christian, an irregular relative of a high official, as the reporter says. Here's my cousin, sir, said Philip. What? The big curly-pated fellow you took home in the carriage? I say, coachman, no need to drive quite so fast. Philip's head was still down. The clerk of the rolls sat watching him with an anxious face. Christian, I am not so sure the governor wasn't right after all. Is this what's been troubling you for a month? You're the deuce for a secret. If there's anything good to tell, you're up like the sun. But if there's bad news going, an owl is a pole parrot compared with you for talking. Philip made some feeble effort to laugh and to say his head was still aching. They were on the breast of the steep hill going up to Greba. The road ahead was like a funnel of dust. The road behind was like the tail of a comet. Pity a fine lad like that should get into trouble, said the clerk. I like the rascal. He got round an old man's heart like a rope round a capstan. One of the big hearty dogs that make you say, By Jove, and I'm a manxman too. He's in the right in this affair, whatever the governor may say. And the governor knows it, Christian. That's why he's so anxious to excuse you. You can overawe the keys. And as for the council, we're paid our wages, God bless us, and are so many stuffed snipes on his stick. But you, you're different. Then the man is your kinsman, and blood is thicker than water. If it's only... Why, what's this? There was some whooping behind. The line of carriages swirled like a long serpent, half a yard near the hedge, and through the grey dust a large covered car shot by at the gallop of a fire engine. The clerk sat bolt upright. Now, what in the name of... It's an ambulance wagon, said Philip between his set teeth. A moment later, a second wagon went galloping past, then a third, and finally a fourth. Well, upon my... Ah, good day, doctor, good day, good day. The clerk had recognized friends on the wagons, 
and was returning their salutations. When they were gone, he first looked at Philip and then shouted, Coachman, right about face, we're going home again, and chance it. We can't be turning here, sir, said the coachman. The vehicles are coming up like bees going a-swarming. We'll have to go as far as Tinwald anyway. Go on, said Philip in a determined voice. After a while, the clerk said, Christian, it isn't worth while getting into trouble over this affair. After all, the governor is the governor. Besides, he's been a good friend to you. Philip was passing through a purgatorial fire, and his old master was feeding it with fuel on every side. They were nearing Tinwald, and could see the flags, the tents, and the crowds, as of a vast encampment, and hear the deep hum of a multitude, like the murmur of a distant sea. End of Part 5, Chapter 9《Part Five, Chapter Ten of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part Five, Chapter Ten. Tinwall Hill is the ancient Parliament ground of man. It is an open green in the midst of the island, with hills on three of its sides, and on the fourth the broad plain dipping to the coast. This green is of the shape of a guitar. Down the middle of the guitar there is a walled enclosure of the shape of a banjo. At the end stands a church. The round drum is the mount, which has four circles, the topmost being some six paces across. The carriage containing the deemster and the clerk of the rolls had drawn up at the west gate of the church, and a policeman had opened the door. There came the sound of singing from the porch. A quarter late, said the clerk of the rolls, consulting his watch. Shall we go in, your honour? Let us take a turn round the fair instead, said Philip. The carriage door was shut back, and they began to move over the green. The open part of it was covered with booths, barrows, stands, and show tents. There were cheap jacks with shoddy watches, phrenologists with two chairs, fat women, dwarfs, wandering minstrels, itinerant hawkers of toffee in tin hat boxes, and other shiny and slimy creatures with the air and grease of the towns. There were a few oxen and horses also, tethered and blanketed, and kicking up the dust under the dry turf. The crowd was dense already, and increasing at every moment. As the brakes arrived, they drove up with a swing that sent the people surging on either side. Some brought well-behaved visitors, others brought an eruption of ruffians. Down the neck of the enclosure and round the circular end of it stood a regiment of soldiers with rifles and bayonets. The steps to the mount were laid down with rushes. Two armchairs were on the top under a canopy hung from a flagstaff that stood in the centre. These chairs were still empty, and the mount and its approaches were kept clear. The sun was overhead, the heat was great, the odour was oppressive. Now and again the sound of the service within the church mingled with the crack of the toy rifle ranges and the jabber of the cheap jacks. At length there was another sound, a more portentous sound, the sound of bands playing in the distance. It came from both south and west, from the direction of Peel, and from that of Port St. Mary. They're coming, said the clerk, and Philip's face, when he turned his head to listen, quivered and grew yet more pale. As the bands approached, they ceased to play. Presently a vast procession of men from the west came up in silence to the skirt of the hill, and turned off in the direction from which the men from the south were seen to be coming. They were in jerseys and sea-boots, marching four deep, and carrying nothing in their brawny hands. One stalwart fellow walked firmly at the head of them. It was Pete. Philip could support the strain no longer. He got out of the carriage. The clerk of the rolls got out also, and followed him as he walked with wavering, irregular steps. Under the great tree at the junction of three roads, the two companies of fishermen met and fell into a general throng. There was a low wall around the tree trunk, and standing on this, Pete's head was clear above the rest. Boys, he was saying, there's three hundred armed soldiers on the hill yonder, with twenty rounds of ball cartridge apiece. You're going to the court because you've a right to go. You're going up peaceable, and when you're getting there, you're going to mix among the soldiers, three to every man two on either side and one behind. Then your spokesmen are going to spake out your complaint. If they're listened to, you're wanting no better. But if they're not, and if the word is given to fire on them, 
Then before this time to do it, you're going to stretch every man of the three hundred on his back and take his weapon. Don't hurt the soldiers. The poor soldiers are only doing what they're told. But don't let the soldiers hurt you neither. You're going there for justice. You're not going there to fight. But if anybody fights you, let him never forget the day he done it. Break up every taffy stand in the fair, if you can't find anything better. And if blood is shed, lave the man that orders it to me. And now go up, boys, like men and like manxmen. There was no cheering, no shouting, no clapping of hands, only broken exclamations and a sort of confused murmur. Come, whispered the clerk of the rolls, putting his hand through Philip's quivering arm. Little does the poor devil think that if blood is shed, he will be the first to fall. God in heaven, muttered Philip. End of Part 5, Chapter 10「Part five, Chapter eleven of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part five, Chapter eleven. The crowd on Tinwald had now gathered thick down the neck of the enclosure, a dense round the mount. To the strains of the national anthem played by the band of the regiment, the governor had come out of the church. He was in cocked hat and with sword, and the sword of state was carried upright before him. With his keys, council, and clergy, he walked to the hilltop. There he took one of the two chairs under the canopy. The other was taken by the bishop in his lawn. Their followers came behind and broke up on the hill into an indiscriminate mass. A number of ladies were admitted to the space on the topmost mound. They stood behind the chairs with their parasols still open. There are men that the densest crowd will part and make way for. The crowd had parted and made way for Philip. As the court was being fenced, he appeared with his companion at the foot of the mount. There he was recognized by many, but he scarcely answered their salutations. The governor made a deferential bow, smiled, and beckoned to him to come up to his side. He went up slowly, pausing at every other step, like a man who was in doubt if he ought to go higher. At length he stood at the governor's right hand, with all eyes upon him, for the favourite of the great is favoured. He was then the highest figure on the mount, the governor and the bishop being seated. The people could see him from end to side of the tinwald, and he could see the people as they stood closely packed on the green below. The business of the court began. It was that of promulgating the laws. Philip's senior colleague, the old deemster of the happy face, read the titles of the laws in English. Then the coroner of the premier sheeting began to recite the same titles in Manx. Nobody heard them. Hardly anybody listened. The ladies on the mount chatted among themselves. The keys and the clergy intermingled and talked. The officials of the council looked at the crowd. And the crowd itself, having nothing to hear, no more to see, indifferent to doings they could not understand, resumed their amusements among the frivolities of the fair. There were three persons in that assembly of fifteen thousand who were following the course of events with feverish interest. The first of these was the governor, whose restless eyes were rolling from side to side with almost savage light. The second was the captain of the regiment, who was watching the governor's face for a signal. The third was Philip, who was looking down at the crowd and seeing something that had meant for himself alone. The fishermen came up quietly, three thousand strong, Half a hundred of them lounged around the magazine. The ammunition was at their command. The rest pushed, edged, and elbowed their way through the people until they came to the line of the guard. Wherever there was a red coat, behind it there were three jerseys and stocking caps. Philip saw it all from his elevation on the mount. His face was deadly pale, his eyelids wavered, his lower lip trembled, his hand twitched. When he was spoken to, he hardly answered. He was like a man holding counsel with himself and half in fear that everybody could read his hidden thoughts. He was in the last throes of his temptation. The decisive moment was near. It was heavy with the fate of his afterlife. He thought of Pete and the torture of his company, of Kate and the unending misery of her existence, of himself and the deep duplicity to which he was committed. From all this he could be freed forever. By what? By doing nothing, having already done his duty? Only let him command himself, and then, 
relief from an existence enthralled by torment, from constant alarm and watchfulness, peace, sleep, love, Kate. Somebody was speaking to him over his shoulder. It was nothing, only the quip of a witty fellow, descendant of a Spanish freebooter. Ladies caught his eye, smiled and bowed to him. A little man, whose swarthy face showed African blood, reached up and quoted something about the bounds of freedom wide and wider. The coroner had finished. The proceedings were at an end. There was a movement. Something had happened. The governor had half risen from his chair. Twelve men in sea boots and blue jerseys had passed the line of the guard and were standing midway across the steps of the mount. One of them was beginning to speak. It was Pete. Governor, he said, but the captain of the regiment was abreast of him in a moment, and a score of the soldiers were about his companions at the next breath. The fishermen stood their ground like a wall, and the soldiers fell back. There was hardly any scuffle. Governor, said Pete again, touching his cap. The governor was twisting in his seat. Looking first at Pete and then at the captain, he was in the act of lifting his hand when suddenly it was held by another hand at his side, and a low voice whispered at his ear, "'No, sir, for God's sake, no!' "'It was Philip. "'The governor looked at him with amazement. "'What do you mean?' "'I mean,' said Philip, still whispering over him hotly and impetuously, "'that there's only one way back to Government House, "'but if you lift your hand it will be one too many. "'I mean that if blood is shed, you'll never live to leave this mount. "'I mean that your three hundred soldiers are only as three hundred rabbits "'in the claws of three thousand crows.' At the next instant he had left the governor, and was face to face with the fisherman. Fisherman, he cried, lifting both hands before him, let there be no trouble here today, no riot, for God's sake, no bloodshed. Listen to me. I am the grandson of a fisherman. I have been a fisherman myself. I love the fisherman. As long as I live I will stand by you. Your rights shall be my rights, your sins my sins, and where you go I will go too. Then swinging back to the governor, he bowed low and said in a deferential voice, "'Your Excellency, these men mean no harm. They wish to speak to you. They have a petition to make. They will be loyal and peaceable.' But the governor, having recovered from his first fear, was now in a flame of anger. "'No,' he said with the accent of authority, "'this is no time and no place for petitions.' "'Forgive me, Your Excellency,' said Philip with a deeper bow. This is the time of all times, the place of all places. There had been a general surging of the keys and clergy towards the steps, and now one of them cried out of their group, Is Tinwell Court to be turned into a bear garden? And another said in a cynical voice, Perhaps your excellency has taken somebody else's seat. Philip raised himself to his full height, and answered with his eyes on the speakers, We are free-born men on this island, your excellency. We did not come to Tinwald to learn order from the grandson of a Spanish pirate, or freedom from the son of a black chief. Hold hard, boys, cried Pete, lifting one hand against his followers, as if to keep them quiet. He was boiling with a desire to shout till his throat should crack. The governor had exchanged rapid looks and low whispers with the captain. He saw that he was outwitted, that he was helpless, that he was even in personal danger. The captain was biting his leg with vexation that he had not reckoned more seriously with this rising, that he had not drawn up his men in column. "'Your Excellency will hear the fishermen,' said Philip. "'No, no, no,' said the governor. He was at least a brave man, if a vain and foolish one. There was silence for a moment. Then standing erect and making an effort to control himself, Philip said, "'May it please, Your Excellency, you fill a proud position here.' You are the ruler of this island under your sovereign lady, our queen. But we, your subjects, your servants, are in a prouder position still. We are Manxmen. This is the court of our country. Hold hard, cried Pete again. For a thousand years men with our blood and our names have stood on this hill to hear the voice of the people, and to do justice between man and man. That's what the place was meant for. If it has lost that meaning, root it up. It is a show and a sham. Bravo! cried Pete. He could hold himself in no longer, and his word was taken up with a shout, both on the hill and on the green beneath. Philip's voice had risen to a shrill cry, but it was low and meek, as he added, bowing yet lower while he spoke. Your Excellency will hear the fisherman? The governor rolled in his seat. Go on, he said impatiently. 
The men made their petition. Three or four of them spoke briefly and to the point. They had had harbours, their father's harbours, which had been freed to them forty years before. Don't ask them to pay harbour dues until proper harbours were provided. The governor gave his promise. Then he rose, the band struck up God Save the Queen, and the legislature filed back to the chapel. Philip went with them. He had fought a great battle, and he had prevailed. Through purging fires the real man had emerged, but he had paid the price of his victory. His eye burned like live coal. His cheekbones seemed to have upheaved. He walked alone. His ancient colleague had stepped ahead of him. But now and again, as he passed down the long path to the church door, fishermen and farmers pushed between the rifles of the guards and said in husky voices, Let me shake you by the hand, Dempster. The scene was repeated with added emotion half an hour afterwards, when the court being adjourned and the governor gone in ominous silence, Philip came out, white and smiling, and leaning on the arm of his old master, the clerk of the rolls. He could scarcely tear himself through the thick-set hedge of people that lined the path to the gate. As he got into the carriage, his smile disappeared. Sinking into the seat, he buried himself in the corner and dropped his head on his breast. The people began to cheer. "'Drive on!' he cried. The cheering became loud. "'Drive! Drive!' he cried. The people cheered yet louder. They thought that they had seen a grand triumph that day a man triumphing over the governor. But there had been a grander triumph which they had not seen, a man triumphing over himself. Only one saw that, and it was God. End of Part 5, Chapter 11《Part 5, Chapter 12 of The Manxman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain. Part 5, Chapter 12 Pete seemed to be beside himself. He laughed until he cried. He cried until he laughed. His resonant voice rang out everywhere. Hear him? My gosh, it was like a bugle spaking. There's nobody can spake but himself. When the others are toot tooting, it's just Polly put the kettle on, mimicking a mincing treble. See the little puffin on his throne of turf there? Looked as if old Nick had been thrashing peas on his face for a week. Pete's enthusiasm rose to frenzy, and he began to sweep through the fair, bemoaning his country and pouring mouthfuls of anathema on his countrymen. Man in veg village, sweet little Isle of Man, with your English governors and your English bishops, and boys of your own worth ten of them. Manini Greihach, beloved Manxman, you're driving them away to be bishops for others and governors abroad, and yourselves going to the dogs and the devil, and damn you. Pete's prophetic mood dropped to a jovial one. He bought the remaining stock in trade of an itinerant toffee seller, and hammered the lid of the tin hat box to beat up the children. They followed him like hares hopping in the snow, and he distributed his bounty in inverse relation to size, a short stick to a big lad, a long stick to a little one, and two sticks to a girl. The results were an infantile war. Here a damsel of ten squaring her lists to fight a hulking fellow of twelve for her sister of six, and there a mother wiping the eyes of her boy of five and whispering, Hush, boch, hush! You shall have the bladder when we kill the pig. Pete began to drink. How do, fatty? Taking joy of you, Ewan? Are you in life, Tom? Half a glass of rum will do no harm, boys. Not the drink at all. Just the good company, you know. He hailed the women also, but they were less willing to be treated. I'd have more respect for my quarterly ticket, sir, said Betsy. She was a primitive, with her husband on the plan bag. There's a hole in your pocket, Captain. Stop it up with your fist, man, said Lisa. She was a gombeen woman, and when she got a penny in her hand it was a prisoner for life. Chut, woman, said Pete. What's the good book saying? Riches have wings, let the birds fly them. And off he went, reeling and tottering, and laughing his formidable laugh. Pete grew merry. Rooting up the remains of the fisherman's band, he hired them to accompany him through the fair. They were three little musicians, now exceedingly drunk, 
and their duty was to play Hail Isle of Man as he went swaggering along in front of them. Hail Isle of Man, sweet ocean land, I love thy sea-girt border. Play up, Jackie. The barley sown, potatoes down, we'll get our boats in order. Thus he forged through the fair, capering, laughing, shouting protests over his shoulder when the tipsy music failed, pretending to be very drunk, trying to show that he was carrying on, that he was going it, that he hadn't a second thought, but watching everything for all that, studying every face, and listening to the talk of everybody. Whips of money at him, Lisa, whips of it, millions, they're saying. He's spending it like flitters, then. The Manx chaps isn't fit for fortunes. No, they aren't. I wonder in the world what sort of wife there's at him. I don't allow my husband the purse. Three halfpence is enough to be giving any man at once. Wife, you're saying? Don't you know, woman? Then some whispering. Base, boy, more base, I tell thee. We then sought next the soothing sex our sweethearts at Port Erin. Who is the man at all? Why, Captain Quilliam from Kimberley. Deed, man, him that married with some of the Caesar Glenmore's ones. She's left him, though, and gone off with a wastrel. You don't say. Well, I saw the young woman myself. At Quiggins Hall there's enough for all, good beer and all things prosper. All oh, boys. Peter drawn up suddenly, and stopped his musicians with a sweep of the arm. Were you spakin', Mr. Corteen? Nothing, Captain. No need to stare at all. I was only saying I was at the camp meeting at Sulby, and I saw... Go on, Jackie. A pleasant place with beds of A's when we are done our supper. The unhappy man was deceiving himself at least as much as anybody else. After looking for the light of intelligence in every face, waiting for a word, watching for a glance, expecting every moment that someone from south or north, or east or west, would say, I've seen her. Yet covering up the burning coal of his anxiety with the ashes of mock merriment, he tried to persuade himself that Kate was not on the island if nobody at Tinwald had seen her, that he had told the truth unwittingly, and that he was as happy as the day was long. End of Part 5, Chapter 12Part 5, Chapter 13 of The Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain. Part 5, Chapter 13. A man in a gig came driving a long horned cow in front of him. Driver, horse, gig, and cow were like animated shapes of dust, but Pete recognized them. Is it yourself, Caesar? So you're for selling old Horney? Grieve my heart I am to do it, sir. Many a good glass of milk she has given to me and mine, and Caesar was ready to weep. Going falling in fits, isn't she, Caesar? Hush, man, hush, man, said Caesar, looking about. A good cow, very, but down twice since I left home this morning. I'd give a bad sixpence to see Caesar selling that cow, thought Pete. Three men were bargaining over a horse. Two were selling, the third, it was Black Tom, was buying. Rising five years, sir, sired by my homet. Oh, I've got the papers to prove it, said one of the two. What, man? Five, shouted Black Tom down the horse's open mouth. She'll never see eight the longest day she lives. No use to saving the man, said the other dealer, speaking in Manx. She's sixteen. Now she's nine, anyway. Fair play, boys. Spake English before a poor fellow, said Black Tom with a snort. This brother of mine lows she's seven, said the first of the two. You thundering liar, said Black Tom in Manx. He says she's sixteen. Dealing ponies, then, asked Pete. Anything, sir, anything. Buying for farmers up Lonan Way, said Black Tom. Come on, said Pete. Here's Caesar with a longhorn cow. They found the good man tethering a white, long-horned cow to the wheel of the tipped-up gig. "'How do, Caesar? And how much for the long-horn?' said Black Tom. "'Oh, look at the base, Mr. Quilliam. Examine her for yourself,' said Caesar. "'Middling fair you are, 
Good quarter, five calves. Is it five, Caesar? said Black Tom, holding one of the long horns. Three, sir, and calving again for February. No milk fever? No. Kicks a bit of milking? Never. Fits? Ever had fits, Caesar? Opening wide one of the cow's eyes. Have you known me these years for a decent man, Mr. Quilliam? began Caesar in an injured tone. Well, what's the figure? Fourteen pounds, sir, and she'll take the road before I'll go home with a pound less. Fourteen? What? Ten. I'll give you ten, not a penny more. Good day to you, Mr. Quilliam, said Caesar. Then, as if by an afterthought, You're an old friend of mine, Thomas. A very old friend, Tom. I'll split you the difference. Break a straw on it, said Black Tom, and the transaction was complete. I've had a clean strike here. The base is worth fifteen, chuckled Black Tom in Pete's ear as he drove the cow into a shed beyond. I must be buying another cow in place of poor old Horny, whispered Caesar as he dived into the cattle stand. Strike up, Jackie, shouted Pete. West of the mine, the day being fine, the tide against us veering. Ten minutes later, Pete heard a fearful clamour, which drowned the noise that he himself was making. Within the shed the confusion of tongues was terrific. "'What's this at all?' he asked, crushing through with an honest face. "'The man's cow has fits,' cried Black Tom. "'I'll have my money back. The old psalm-singing Tommy Noddy. "'Did he think he was lifting the collection? "'My money! My twelve golden pounds!' "'If Black Tom had not been as bald as a bladder, "'he would have torn his hair in his mortification, "'but Pete pacified him. "'Caesar is looking for another cow. "'Sell him his own back again.' Impossible? Who says it's impossible? Cut off her long horns, and he'll never be knowing her from her grandmother. Then Pete made up to Caesar and said, Tom's got a mailie, a hornless cow to sell, and it's the very thing you're wanting. Is she a good mailie? asked Caesar. Ten quarts either end of the day, Caesar, and fifteen pounds of butter a week, said Pete. Where's the base, sir? said Caesar. They met Black Tom leading a hornless white cow from the shed to the green. "'Are you coming together, Peter?' he said cheerfully. Caesar eyed the cow doubtfully for a moment, and then said briskly, "'What's the price of the mailie, Mr. Quilliam?' "'Oh, look at the base first, Mr. Cregeen. Examine her for yourself, sir.' "'Yes, yes, well, yes. A middling good base enough. Four calves, Thomas?' Two, sir, and calves again for January.' Twenty-four quarts of new milk every day of life, and butter fit to burst the churn for you. No fever at all? No fits? No? Ah, oh, have you known me these teens of years, Mr. Cregeen? Well, what do you say? Eleven pounds for the cow, Tom? Thirteen, Caesar, and if you're worn an old friend. Hold your hand, Mr. Quilliam. I'm not a man when I've got a bargain. Manx notes or the dust, Thomas? Gold? Here you are, then, one, two, three, four, giving the cow another searching glance across his shoulder. It's wonderful, though. The straight she's like old horny. Five, six, seven, in colour and size, I mean. Eight, nine, ten. And if she won a maley cow, now eleven, twelve, the money hanging from his thumb. Will that be enough, Mr. Quilliam? No, half a one, then. Oh, you're hard, Tom. Thirteen. Having paid the last pound, Caesar stood a moment, contemplating his purchase, and then said doubtfully, "'Well, if I hadn't, Granny will be saying it's the same base back.' The cow began to reel. "'Yes, and it—no, surely, a mailie for all.' The cow fell. "'It's got the same fits anyway,' cried Caesar, and then he rushed to the cow's head. "'It is the same base. The horns are going cutting off at her.' "'My money back.' Give me my money back, my thirteen yellow sovereigns, the sweat of my brow, he cried. Oh, no, said Black Tom, there's no money giving back at all. If the cow was good enough for you to sell, she's good enough for you to buy, and he turned on his heel with a laugh of triumph. Caesar was choking with vexation. Never mind, sir, said Pete. If Tom has taken a main advantage of you, it'll be all said right at the judgment. You've that satisfaction anyway. Have I? No, I haven't, said Caesar from between his teeth. The man's clever. He'll get himself converted before he comes to die, and then there'll not be a word about cutting the horns off my cow. Strike up, Jackie, shouted Pete. 
Hail, Isle of Man, sweet ocean land, I love thy sea-girt border. End of Part 5, Chapter 13《Chapter 14 of the Manxman》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 5 Chapter 14 The sky became overcast, rain began to fall, and there was a rush for the carts. In half an hour Tinwald Hill was empty and the people were splashing off on every side like the big drops of rain that were pelting down. Pete hired a brake that was going back to the north, and gathered up his friends from Ramsey. When these were seated, there was a rush of helpless and abandoned ones who were going in the same direction, young mothers with children, old men and old women. Pete hauled them up till the seats and the floor were choked, and the brake could hold no more. He got small thanks. Such crushing and scrooging! I declare my black merino frock that I've only had on once will be teetotal spoiled. If they don't start soon, I'll be taking the neuralgy dreadful. They got started at length, and at the tail of a line of stiff carts they went rattling over the mountain road. The harebells nodded their washed faces from the hedge, and the talk was brisk and cheerful. Our Tom sold a heifer, and got a good price. What for didn't you buy the mare of call at Beldroma, Ewan? Did I want to be killed as dead as a herring? Kicks, does she? Bait her, man, bait her. A horse is like a woman. If you aren't baiting her now and then. They stopped at every halfway house. It was always halfway to somewhere. The men got exceedingly drunk and began to sing. At that the women grew very angry. Sakes alive, you're no better than a lot of cottonies. Deed, but they're worse than any cottonies, ma'am. Some excuse for the like of them, in their cotton mills all the year, and nothing at home but a piece of grass the size of your hand in the backyard, and going hopping on it like a lark in a cage. The rain came down in torrents, the mountain path grew steep and desolate, the few houses passed were empty and boarded up, gorse bushes hissed to the rising breeze, geese scuttled and screamed across the untilled land, a solitary black crow flew across the leaden sky, and on the sea outside a tall pillar of smoke went stalking on and on, where the pleasure steamer carried her freight of tourists round the island. Then songs gave way to sighs. Some of the men began to pick quarrels, and some to break into fits of drunken sobbing. Pete kept them all up. He chaffed and laughed and told funny stories. Choking, stifling, wounded to the heart as he was, still he was carrying on, struggling to convince everybody and himself as well, that nothing was amiss, that he was a jolly fellow, and had not a second thought. He was glad to get home, nevertheless, where he need play the hypocrite no longer. Going through Sulby, he dropped out of the brake and looked in at the ferry. The house was shut. Granny was sitting up for Caesar, and listening for the sound of wheels. There was something unusual and mysterious about her. Cruddled over the fire, she was smoking a long clay in little puffs of blue smoke that could barely be seen. The sweet old soul in her troubles had taken to the pipe as a comforter. Pete could see that something had happened since morning, but she looked at him with damp eyes, and he was afraid to ask questions. He began to talk of the great doings of the day at Tinwald, then of Philip, and finally of Kate, apologising a little wildly for the mother not coming home sooner to the child, but protesting that she had sent the little one no end of presents. "'Presents, bless ye,' he began rapturously. "'You don't ate enough, Pete. "'Deed you don't,' said Granny. Eight? "'Did you say eight? cried Pete. "'If you'd seen me at the fair, you'd have said, "'That man's got the inside of a lime-kiln. "'Oh, no, Granny, I'm not letting my jaws travel far. "'When I've got anything before me, it's down, same as an ostrich.' "'Going away in the darkness, he heard Caesar creaking up in the gig "'with old Horny, now old Maley, driving along in front of him. Nancy was waiting for Pete at Elm Cottage. She tried to bustle him upstairs. "'Come, man, come,' she said. "'Get yourself off to bed, and I'll bring your clothes down to the fire.' He had never slept in the bedroom since Kate had left. "'Chut! I've lost the habit of beds,' he answered. "'Always used of the gable loft, you know, and the wind above the thatch.' 
Not to be thought to behave otherwise than usual, he went upstairs that night. But feather beds are saft, pented rooms are bonny, but a kiss, o oh, my dear love, better's far than onny. The rain was still falling, the sea was loud, the mighty breath of night was shaking the walls of the house and rioting through the town. He was wet and tired, longing for a dry skin and a warm bed and rest. Yet fain would I rise and rin, if I thought I would meet my dearie. The long strained rapture of faith and confidence was breaking down. He saw it breaking. He could deceive himself no more. She was gone. She was lost. She would lie on his breast no more. God help me! O oh Lord help me! he cried in his crushed and breaking heart. End of part five. Chapter fourteen. Part five. Chapter fifteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain. Part five. Chapter fifteen. When Kate thought of her husband after she had left him, it was not with any crushing sense of shame. She had injured him, but she had gained nothing by it. On the contrary, she had suffered, she had undergone separation from her child. To soften the hard blow inflicted, she had outraged the tenderest feelings of her heart. As often as she thought of Pete and the deep wrong she had done him, she remembered this sacrifice. She wept over this separation. Thus she reconciled herself to her conduct towards her husband. If she had bought happiness at the cost of Pete's sufferings, her remorse might have been deep. But she had only accepted shame and humiliation and the severance of the dearest of her ties. When she had said in the rapture of passionate confidence that if she possessed Philip's love, there could be no humiliation and no shame, she had not yet dreamt of the creeping degradation of a life in the dark, under a false name, in a false connection, a life under the same roof with Philip, yet not by his side, unacknowledged, unrecognized, hidden and suppressed. Even at the moment of that avowal, somewhere in the secret part of her heart, where lay her love of refinement and her desire to be a lady, she had cherished the hope that Philip would find a way out of the meanness of their relation, that she would come to live openly beside him. She hardly knew how, and she did not care at what cost of scandal for with Philip as her own she would be proud and happy. Philip had not found that way out, yet she did not blame him. She had begun to see that the deepest shame of their relation was not hers but his. Since she had lived in Philip's house, the man in him had begun to decay. She could not shut her eyes to this rapid demoralization, and she knew well that it was the consequence of her presence. The deceptions, the subterfuges, the mean shifts forced upon him day by day, by every chance, every accident, were plunging him in ever-deepening degradation. And as she realized this, a new fear possessed her, more bitter than any humiliation, more crushing than any shame, the fear that he would cease to love her, the terror that he would come to hate her, as he recognized the depth to which she had dragged him down. End of Part 5, Chapter 15 Part 5, Chapter 16 of The Manxman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain Part 5, Chapter 16 Back from Tinwald, Philip was standing in his room. From time to time he walked to the window, which was half open, for the air was close and heavy. A misty rain was falling from an empty sky, and the daylight was beginning to fail. The tombstones below were wet, the trees were dripping, the churchyard was desolate. In a corner under the wall lay the angular wooden lid which is laid by a grave-digger over an open grave. Presently the iron gates swung apart, and a funeral company entered. It consisted of three persons and an uncovered deal coffin. One of the three was the sexton of the church, Another was the curate, the third was a policeman. The sexton and the policeman carried the coffin to the church door, which the curate opened. 
He then went into the church and was followed by the other two. A moment later there were three strokes of the church bell. Some minutes after that the funeral company reappeared. It made for the open grave in the corner by the wall. The cover was removed, the coffin was lowered, the policeman half lifted his helmet, and the sexton put a careless hand to his cap. Then the curate opened a book and closed it again. The burial service was at an end. Half an hour longer the sexton worked alone in the drenching rain, shoveling the earth back into the grave. Some waif, thought Philip, some friendless, homeless, nameless waif. He went noiselessly up the stairs to the floor above, slinking through the house like a shadow. At a door above his own he knocked with a heavy hand, and a woman's voice answered him from within. Is anyone there? It is, he said. I'm coming to see you. Then he opened the door and slipped into the room. It was a room like his own at all points, only lower in the ceiling, and containing a bed. A woman was standing with her back to the window, as if she had just turned about from looking into the churchyard. It was Kate. She had been expecting Philip, and waiting for him, but she seemed to be overwhelmed with confusion. As he crossed the floor to go to her, he staggered, and then she raised her eyes to his face. "'You are ill,' she said. "'Sit down. Shall I ring for the brandy?' "'No,' he answered. "'We have had a hard day at Tinwell. Some trouble, some excitement. I'm tired, that's all.' He sat on the end of the bed, and gazed out on the veil of rain, slanting across the square church tower in the sky. "'I was at Ramsey two days ago,' he said. "'That's what I came to tell you.' Ah! She linked her hands before her and gazed out also. Then in a trembling voice she asked, Is mother well? Yes, I did not see her, but, yes, she bears up bravely. And, and, the word stuck in her throat. And Pete? Well, also, in health at all events. You mean that he is broken-hearted? With a deep breath he answered, To listen to him you would think he was cheerful enough. A little Catherine? She is well, too. I did not see her awake. It was late, and she was in her cradle. So rosy and fresh and beautiful. My sweet darling, she was clean, too. They take care of her, don't they? More care they could not take. My darling baby, has she grown? Yes, they talk of taking her out of the long clothes soon. Nancy is like a second mother to her. Kate's foot was beating the floor. "'Oh, why can't her own mother?' she began, and then in a faltering voice. "'But that cannot be, I suppose. Do her eyes change? Are they still blue? "'But she was asleep, you say. My dear baby, was it very late? Nine o'clock? Just nine? "'I was thinking of her at that moment. It is true I'm always thinking of her, but I remember because the clock was striking. "'She will be in her little cot now, I thought, bathed and clean, and so pretty in her nightdress, the one with the frill.' My sweet, sweet angel. Her speech was confused and broken. Do you think if I never see her until... Well, I know her if... It's useless to think of that, though. Is her hair like... What is the colour of her hair, Philip? Fair, quite fair. As fair as mine was. She swirled round, came face to face with him and cried, Philip, Philip, why can't I have my darling to myself? She would be well enough here. I could keep her quiet. Oh, she would not disturb you, and I should be so happy with my little Kate for company. The day is long with me sometimes, Philip, and I could play with her all the day, and then at night, when she would be in the cot, I could make her little stock of clothes, her frocks and her little pinafores, and... Impossible, Kate, impossible, said Philip. She turned to the window. Yes, she said in a choking voice, I suppose it would even be stealing to fetch her away now. Only think... A mother stealing her own child? Oh, gracious heaven, have I sinned myself so far from my innocent baby? My child, my child, my little Catherine. Her bosom heaved, and she said in a hard tone, I dare say they think I'm a bad mother because I left her to others to nurse her and to love her, to see her every day and all day, to bathe her sweet body, and to comb her yellow hair, to look into her little blue eyes, and to watch all her pretty, pretty ways. Oh, yes, yes, she said, with increased emotion. I dare say they think that of me. They think nothing but what is good of you, Kate, nothing but what is good and kind. 
She looked out on the rain which fell unceasingly, and said in a low voice, "'Is Pete still telling the same story, that I am only away for a little while, that I am coming back?' "'He is writing letters to himself now, and saying they come from you.' "'From me?' "'Such simple things, all in his own way, full of love and happiness. I am so happy and comfortable. It is pitiful. He is like a child. He never suspects anything.' You are better and enjoying yourself and looking forward to coming home soon, sending kisses and presents for the baby too, and greetings for everybody. There are messages for me also, your true and loving wife. It's terrible. She covered her face with both hands. And is he telling everybody? Yes, that's what the letters are meant for. He thinks he is keeping your name sweet and your place clean, so that you may return at any time and scandal may not touch you. "'Oh, why do you tell me that, Philip? "'It is dragging me back, "'and the child is dragging me back also. "'Does he show the letters to you?' "'Worse than that, Kate, much worse. "'He makes me answer them. "'I answered one the other night. "'Oh, when I think of it, "'dear wife, glad to get your welcome letters. "'God knows how I held the pen. "'I was giddy enough to drop it. "'He gave you all the news "'about your father and granny and everybody, "'all in his own bright way. "'Poor old Pete!' the cheeriest, sunniest soul alive. The Dempster is putting a sight on us regular. Trust you are the better for leaving home. It was awful, awful. Dearest Kiri, I'm missing you mortal, worse than Kimberley. So come home soon, my true little wife, to your foolish old husband, for his heart is losing him. He leapt up and began to tramp the floor. But why do I tell you this? I should bear my own burdens. Her hands had come down from her face, which was full of a great compassion. "'And did you have to write all that?' she asked. "'Oh, he meant no harm. He had no thought of hurting anybody. He never dreamt that every word was burning and blistering me to the heart of hearts.' His voice deepened, and his face grew hard and ugly. "'But it was the same as if some devil out of hell had entered into the man and told him how to torture me as if the cruelest tyrant on earth had made me take up the pen and write down my own death warrant. I could have killed him. I could not help it. Yes, I felt at that moment as if, oh, what am I saying? He stopped, sat on the end of the bed again, and held his head between his hands. She came and sat by his side. Philip, she said, I am ruining you. Yes, I am corrupting you. I, who would have had you so high and pure, and you so pure-minded, I am bringing you to ruin. Having me here is destroying you, Philip. No one visits you now. You are shutting the door on everybody. I heard you come in last night, Philip. I heard you every night. Yes, I know everything. Oh, you will end by hating me. I know you will. Why don't you send me away? It will be better to send me away in time, Philip. Besides, it will make no difference. We are in the same house, yet we never meet. Send me away now, before it is too late." He dropped his hand and felt for her hand. He was trying not to look into her face. We have both suffered, Kate. We can never hate one another. We have suffered for each other's sake. She clung tightly to the hand he gave her and said, Then you will never forsake me, whatever happens? Never, Kate, never, he answered, and with a smothered cry she threw her arms about his neck. The rain continued to pour down on the roofs and on the tombs with a monotonous plash. "'But what is to be done?' she said. "'God knows,' he answered. "'What is to become of us, Philip? "'Are we never to smile on each other again? "'We cannot carry a burden like this forever. "'Today, tomorrow, the next day, the next year? "'Is it to go on like this for a lifetime? "'Is this life? "'Is there nothing that will end it?' "'Yes, Kate, yes. "'There is one thing that will end it. "'One thing only.' "'Do you mean death?' He did not answer. She rose slowly from his side and returned to the window, rested her forehead against the pane, and looked down on the desolate churchyard and the sexton at his work in the rain. Suddenly she broke the silence. Philip, she said, I know now what we ought to do. I wonder we had never thought of it before. What is it? he asked. She was standing in front of him. Her breath came quickly. Tell Pete that I am dead. No, no, no. She took both his hands. Yes, yes, she said. He kept his face away from her. 
Kate, what are you saying? What is more natural, Philip? Only think, if you had been anybody else, it would have come to that already. You must have hated me for dragging you down into this mire of deceit. You must have forsaken me, and I must have gone to wreck and ruin. Oh, I see it all, just as if it had really happened. A solitary room somewhere, alone, sinking, dying, unknown, unnamed, forgotten. His eyes were wandering about the room. It will kill him. If his heart can break, it will break it, he said. He has lived after a heavier blow than that, Philip. Do you think he is not suffering? For all his bright ways and hopeful talk and the letters and the presents, do you think he is not suffering? He liberated his hands and began to tramp the room as before, but with head down and hands linked behind him. It will be cruel to deceive him, he said. No, Philip, but kind. Death is not cruel. The wound it makes will heal. It won't bleed for ever. Once he thinks I am dead, he will weep a little, perhaps, and then— She was stifling a sob. Then it will be all over. Poor girl, he will say. She was much to blame. I loved her once, and never did her any wrong. But she is gone, and she was the mother of little Catherine. Let us forget her faults. He had not heard her. He was standing before the window, looking down. You are right, Kate. I think you must be right. I'm sure I am. He will suffer, but he will get over it. Yes, indeed. And you, Philip, he will torture you no longer. No more letters, no more presents, no more messages. I'll do it. I'll do it tomorrow, he said. She opened her arms wide and cried, Kiss me, Philip, kiss me. We shall live again. Yes, we shall laugh together still. Kiss me, kiss me. Not yet. When I come back. Very well. When you come back. She sank into a chair, crying with joy, and he went out as he had entered, noiselessly, stealthily, like a shadow. When a man who is not a criminal is given over to a deep duplicity of life, he will clutch at any lie, wearing the mask of truth, which seems to shield him from shame and pain. He may be a wise man in every other relation, a shrewd man, a far-seeing and even a cunning man, but in this relation, that of his own honour, his own fame, his own safety, he is certain to be a blunderer, a bungler, and a fool. Such is the revenge of nature, such is God's own vengeance. End of Part 5 Chapter 16「Five, Chapter Seventeen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part Five, Chapter Seventeen. Philip was walking from Ballure House to Elm Cottage. It was late, and the night was dark and silent, a muggy, dank, and stagnant night without wind or air, moon or stars. The road was quiet, the trees were still, the sea made only a far-off murmur. And as he walked he struggled to persuade himself that in what he was about to do he would be doing well. It will not be wrong to deceive him, he thought. It will only be for his own good. The suspense would kill him. He would waste away. The sap of the man's soul would dry up. Then why should I hesitate? Besides, it is partly true, true in his own sense, and that is the real sense. She is dead, dead to him. She can never return to him. She is lost to him forever. So it is true, after all. It is true. It's a lie, said a voice into his ear. He started. He could have been sure that somebody had spoken. Yet there was nobody by his side. He was alone in the road. It must have been my own voice, he thought. I must have been thinking aloud. And then he resumed his walk and his meditation. And if it is a lie, is it therefore a crime, he asked himself? Sure it is. How very sure. It was a wise man that said so. A great fault once committed is the first link in a chain. The other links seem to be crimes also. But they are not. They are consequences. Our fault was long ago and even then it was partly the fault of fate. If the past could be recalled, we could not act differently unless our fates were different. 
and what has followed has been only the consequence. It was the consequence when Kate was married to Pete. It was the consequence when she left him. And this is the consequence. It is a lie, said the same voice by his side. He stopped. The darkness was gross around him. He could see nothing. Who's there? he demanded. There was no answer. He stretched his hand out nervously. There was no one at his side. It must have been the wind in the trees, he thought. But there could be no wind in the stagnant dampness of that air. It was like my own voice, he thought. Then he remembered how his man in Douglas had told him that he had contracted a habit of talking to himself of late. It was my own voice, he thought, and he went on again. A lie is a bad foundation to build on, that's certain. The thing that should be cannot rest on the thing that is not. It will topple down. It will come to ruin. It will wreck everything. Still, it's a lie, said the voice again. There could be no mistaking it this time. It was a low, deep whisper. It seemed to be spoken in the very cavity of his ear. It was not his own voice, and yet it struck upon his sense with the sound as of his own. It must be his own voice speaking to himself. When this idea took hold of him, he was seized with a deadly shuddering. His heart knocked against his ribs, and an icy coldness came over him. Only the same tormenting dream, he thought. Before it was a vision, now it is a voice. It is generated by solitude and separation. I must resist it, I must be strong. It will drive me into an oppression as of madness. Men do not see their souls until they are bordering on madness from religious mania or crime. A lie, a lie, said the voice. This is madness itself. To paint faces on the darkness, to hear voices in the air, is madness. The madman can do no more. A lie, said the voice again. He cast a look over his shoulder. It was the same as if someone had touched him and spoken. He walked faster. The voice seemed to walk with him. I will hold myself firm, he thought. I will not be afraid. Reason does not fail a man until he allows himself to believe that it is failing. I am going mad, he thinks. And then he shrieks and is mad indeed. I will not depart from my course. If I do so now, I shall be lost. The horror will master me, and I shall be its slave forever. He had turned out of Balur into the Ramsey Road, and he could see the town lights in the distance, but the voice continued to haunt him persistently, besiegingly, despotically. Great God, he thought, what is the imaginary devil to the horror of this presence? Your own eye, your own voice, always with you, always following you. No darkness so dense that it can hide the sight, no noise so loud that it can deaden the sound. He walked faster. Still the voice seemed to stride by his side, an invisible thing with deliberate and noiseless step, from which there was no escape. He drew up suddenly and walked slower. His knees were tottering. He was treading as on waves. Yet he went on. I will not yield. I will master myself. I will do what I intended. I am not mad, he thought. He was at the gate of Elm Cottage by this time, and with a strong glow of resolution, he walked boldly to the door and knocked. End of Part 5, Chapter 17「Five, Chapter Eighteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain. Part Five, Chapter Eighteen. Pete had not awakened until late that morning. While still in bed, he had heard Granny and Nancy in the room below. The first sound of their voices told him that something was amiss. "'Oh, God bless me, God bless me,' said Nancy, as though with uplifted hand. "'It was Kelly the postman,' said Granny, in a doleful tone, the tone in which she had spoken between the puffs of her pipe. "'The dirt,' said Nancy. "'He was up at Caesar's before breakfast this morning,' said Granny. "'There now,' cried Nancy. "'There's men like that, though, just eager for mischief. "'It's sweeter than all their prayers to them. "'But where can she be, then? "'Has she made away with herself, poor thing?' 
That's what I was asking Caesar, said Granny. If she's gone with the young Ballawain, what for aren't you going to England over and fetching her home, says I. And what did Caesar say? No, says he, not a step, says he. If she's dead, says he, we'll only know it a day the sooner, and if she's in life, it'll be a disgrace to us the longest day we live. Oh, Bolyavine, Bolyavine, said Nancy, when some men is getting religion, there's no more inside at them than a gutted herring, and they're good for nothing but to put up in the chimney to smook. It's Black Tom, woman, said Granny. Caesar's freckin' mortal of the man's tongue going. It's water to his wheel, he's saying. He'll be telling me to set my own house in order, and me a local preacher, too. But how's the man himself? Pete, said Nancy. Oh, tired enough last night, and not down yet. Hush, it's his foot on the loft. Poor boy, poor boy, said Granny. The child cried, and then somebody began to beat the floor to the measure of a long-drawn hymn. Granny must have been sitting before the fire with the baby across her knees. Something has happened, thought Pete as he drew on his clothes. A moment later something had happened indeed. He had opened a drawer of the dressing-table and found the wedding ring and the earrings where Kate had left them. There was a commotion in the room below by this time, but Pete did not hear it. He was crying in his heart. It is coming. I know it. I feel it. God help me. Lord forgive me. Amen, amen. Caesar the postman and the constable, as a deputation from the Christians, had just entered the house. Black Tom was with them. He was the ferret that had fetched them out of their holes. Get thee home, woman, said Caesar to Granny. This is no place for thee. It is the abode of sin and deception. It's the home of my child's child, and that's enough for me, said Granny. Get thee back, I tell thee, said Caesar and come thee to this house of shame no more. Take her, Nancy, said Granny, giving up the child. Shame enough, indeed, I'm thinking, when a woman has to shut her heart to her own flesh and blood, if she's not to disrespect her husband. And she went off weeping. But Caesar's emotions were walled in by his pietistical views. Every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land, for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold, said Caesar, with a cast of his eye towards Black Tom. Well, if I ever, said Nancy, the husband that wanted the like of that from me now, a hundredfold indeed. No, not for a hundred hundredfolds, the nasty dirt. Don't be turning up your nose, woman, but call your master, said Caesar. It's more than someone's need to do, then, and I won't call my master neither, no thank you, said Nancy. I've something to tell him, and I've come too for to do it, said Caesar. The devil came farther than ever you did, and it was only a lie he was bringing for all that, said Nancy. Hold your tongue, Nancy Kane, said Caesar, and take that popish thing off the child's head. It was the scarlet hood. Pity the money that's wasted on the like wasn't given to the poor. I've heard something the same before, Caesar Cregeen, said Nancy. It was Judas Iscariot was saying it first and you're just thieving it from the thief. Chut, said Caesar, goaded by the laughter of Black Tom. I'll call the man myself. Peter Quilliam! And he made for the staircase door. Stand back, cried Nancy, holding the child like a pillow over one of her arms and lifting the other threateningly. Oh, you'll never be raising your hand to the man of God, woman, giggled Black Tom. Won't I, though, said Nancy grimly. "'or the man of the devil, either,' she added, flashing at himself. "'The woman's not to trust, sir,' snuffled the constable. "'She's only an infidel, anyway. "'I've heard tell of her saying she didn't believe the whale swallowed Jonah.' "'That's the difference between us, then,' said Nancy, "'for there's some of you Manx ones would believe if Jonah swallowed the whale.' "'The staircase door opened at the back of Nancy, and Pete stepped into the room.' "'What's this, friends?' he asked in a careworn voice. Caesar stepped forward with a yellow envelope in his hand. "'What's that, sir?' he answered. Pete took the envelope and opened it. "'That's your letter back to you through the dead letter office, isn't it?' said Caesar. "'Well,' said Pete. "'There's nobody of that name in that place, is there?' said Caesar. "'Well,' said Pete again. 
Letters from England don't come through Peel, but your first letter had the Peel postmark, hadn't it? Well? Parcels from England don't come through Port St. Mary, but your parcel was stamped in Port St. Mary, wasn't it? Anything else? The handwriting inside the letter wasn't your own handwriting, was it? The address on the outside of the parcel wasn't your own address, no? Is that all? Enough to be going on, I'm thinking. What about Uncle Joe, said Black Tom with another giggle? Your mistress is not in Liverpool. You don't know where she is. She has gone the way of all sinners, said Caesar. Is that what you're coming to tell me, said Pete? No, we're coming to tell you, said Caesar, that as a notorious loose liver we must be putting her out of class, and we're coming to call on yourself to look to your own salvation. You've deceived us, Mr. Quilliam. You've grieved the spirit of the Lord, with another glime in the direction of Black Tom. You've brought contempt on the fellowship that counts you for one of the fold. You've given the light of your countenance to the path of an evil doer, and you've brought down the head of a child of God with sorrow to the grave. Caesar was moved by his self-satisfied piety, and began to make noises in his nostrils. Let us lay the case before the Lord, he said, and he went down on his knees and prayed. Our brother has deceived us, O Lord, but we forgive him freely. Forgive thou also his trespasses, so that at the last he escape hellfire. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial, wherever she is this day. May it be good for her to be cut off from the body of the righteous. Grant that she feel this mercy in her carnal body before her eternal soul be called to everlasting judgment. Lord, strengthen thy servant. Let not his natural affections be as the snare of the fowler under his feet. Though it grieve him sore, even to tears and tribulation, help him to pluck out the gourd that groweth in his own bosom. Dear heart alive, cried Nancy, clattering her clogs. It's a wonder in the world the man isn't thinking shame to blacken his own daughter before the Almighty himself. Be merciful, O Lord, continued Caesar, to all rank unbelievers, and such as live in heathen darkness in a Christian land, and don't know Saturday from Sunday, and are imperant uncommon and bad with the tongue. Stop that now, cried Nancy. That's meant for me. Pete had stood through this in silence, but with an angry, miserable face. Beg pardon all, he said. I'm not going for denying to what you say. I'm like the fish at the heel of the trawl boat. The net's closing in on me and I'm caught. The game's up. I did deceive you. I did write those letters myself. I've no Uncle Joe nor no Auntie Joanie neither. My wife's left me. I'm not knowing where she is or what's becoming of her. I'm done, and I'm for throwing up the sponge. There were grunts of satisfaction. But don't you feel the need of pardon, brother, said Caesar? I don't, said Pete. What I was doing, I was doing for the best. And if I was doing wrong, the Almighty will have to forgive me. That's about all. Caesar shot out his lip. Pete raised himself to his full height and looked from face to face, until his eyes settled on the postman. But it takes a thief to catch a thief, he said. Which of you was the thief that catched me? Maybe I've been only a blundering blockhead, and perhaps you've been clever and smart uncommon, but I'm thinking there's some of you hasn't been rocked enough for all that. He held out the yellow envelope. This letter was sealed when you gave it to me, Mr. Cregeen. How did you know what was inside of it? On Her Majesty's service, you say, but it isn't dead letters only that's coming with words same as that. The postman was meddling with his front hair. The Lord has his own ways of doing his work, has he, Caesar? I never heard tell, though, that opening other people's letters was one of them. Mr. Kelly's ferret eyes were nearly twinkling themselves out. Pete threw letter and envelope into the fire. You've come to tell me you're going to turn my wife out of class. All right, you can turn me out too, and if the money I gave you is anywhere handy, you can turn that out at the same time, and make a clean job. Black Tom was doubling with suppressed laughter at the corner of the dresser, and Caesar was writhing under his searching glances. You're knowing a dale about the old book, and I'm not knowing much, said Pete, but isn't it saying somewhere, let him that's without sin amongst you chuck the first stone? 
I'm not worth mentioning for a saint myself, so I leave it with you. His voice began to break. You're thinking a dale about the broken law, seemingly, but I'm thinking more about the broken heart. There's the like in somewhere you go bail. The woman that's gone may have done wrong. I'm not saying she didn't, poor thing. But if she comes home again, you may turn her out, but I'll take her back. Whatever she is and whatever she's done, so help me God I will. And I'll not wait for the day of judgment to ask the Almighty if I'm doing right. Then he sat down with his back to them on a chair before the fire. Now you can go home to nurse, said Nancy, wiping her eyes, and lave me to sweeten the kitchen. It's wanting water enough after dirts like you. Caesar also was wiping his eye, the one nearest to Black Tom. Come, he said with plaintive resignation. Our errand was useless. The Ethiopian cannot change his skin, nor the leopard his spots. No, but he can get a top coat to cover them, though, said Nancy. Oh, that flea sticks, does it, Caesar? Don't blame the looking-glass if your face is ugly. Caesar pretended not to hear her. Well, he said with a sigh, discharged at Pete's back, we'll pray, spite of appearances, that we may all go to heaven together some day. No, thank you, not me, said Nancy. I wouldn't be main myself going anywhere with the like of you. The Job in Caesar could bear up no longer. Vain and ungrateful woman, he cried, who hath eaten of my bread and drunken of my cup. Cursing me, are you, said Nancy? Sakes, you must have been found in the bulrushes at Pharaoh's daughter and made a prophet of. No use bandying words, sir, with a single woman that lives alone with a single man, said Mr. Nip lightly. Nancy flopped the child from her right arm to her left, and with the back of her hand she slapped the constable across the face. Take that for the cure of a bad heart, she said, and tell the dempster I gave it you. Then she turned on the postman and black Tom. Out of it, you little thief, your mouth's only a dirty town well and your tongue's the pump in it. Go home and die, you big black spider. You're old enough for it and wicked enough too. Out of it, the lot of you, she cried and clashed the door at their backs and then opened it again for a parting shot. And if it's true you're on your way to heaven together, just let me know and I'll see if I can't put up with the other place myself. End of part five, chapter eighteen. Part five, chapter nineteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part five, chapter nineteen. That evening Pete was sitting with one foot on the cradle rocker, one arm on the table, and the other hand trifling tenderly with the ring and the earrings which he had found in the drawer of the dressing table, when there was a hurried knock on the door. It had the hollow reverberation of a knock on the lid of a coffin. "'Come in,' called Pete. It was Philip, but it was almost as if death had entered, so thin and bony were his cheeks, so wild his eyes, so cold his hands. Pete was prepared for anything. "'You found me out, too. I see you have,' he said defiantly. "'You needn't tell me it's chasing caught fish.' "'Be brave, Pete,' said Philip. "'It will be a great shock to you.' Pete looked up, and his manner changed. "'Speak it out, sir. It's a poor man that can't stand.' "'I've come on the saddest errand,' said Philip, taking a seat as far away as possible. "'You found her. You've seen her, sir.' "'Where is she?' "'She is,' began Philip, and then he stopped. "'Go on, mate. I've known trouble before today,' said Pete. "'Can you bear it?' said Philip. "'She is,' and he stopped again. "'She is where?' said Pete. "'She is dead,' said Philip at last. Pete rose to his feet. Philip rose also, and now poured out his message with the headlong rush of a cataract. In fact, it all happened some time ago, Pete, but I couldn't bring myself to tell you before. I tried, but I couldn't. It was in Douglas, of a fever, in a lodging, alone, unattended. Hold hard, sir, give me time, said Pete. I had a gunshot wound at Kimberley, 
and since then I've a stitch in my side at whiles, and sometimes a bit of a catch in my breathing. He staggered to the porch door and threw it open, then came back panting. Dead! Dead! Kate is dead! Nancy came from the kitchen at the moment, and hearing what he was saying, she lifted both hands and uttered a piercing shriek. He took her by the shoulders and turned her back, shut the door behind her, and said, holding his right hand hard at his side, "'Women are brave, sir, but when the storm breaks on a man—' He broke off and muttered again, "'Dead! Kiri is dead!' The child, awakened by Nancy's cry, was now whimpering fretfully. Pete went to the cradle and rocked it with one foot, crooning in a quavering treble. hush a -bye, hush a -bye. Philip's breathing was oppressed. He felt like a man at the edge of a precipice, with an impulse to throw himself over. "'God, forgive me,' he said. "'I could kill myself. I've broken your heart.' "'No fear of me, sir,' said Pete. I'm an old hulk that's seen weather. I'll not go to pieces from inside at all. Give me time, mate, give me time. And then he went on muttering as before, Dead. Kiri, dead. Hush up, I. My Kiri, dead. The little one slept, and Pete drew back in his chair, nodded into the fire, and said in a weak, childish voice, I've known her all my life, do you know? She's been my little sweetheart since she was a slip of a girl and slapped the schoolmaster for baiting me wrongously. Sweet little thing in them days, mate, with her brown feet and tossing hair, and now she's a woman and she's dead. The Lord have mercy upon me. He got up and began to walk heavily across the floor, dipping and plunging as if going upstairs. The bright and happy she was when I started for Kimberley, too, with her pretty face by the azing stones in the morning, all laughter and mischief. Five years I was seeing it in my dreams like that, and now it's gone. Kiri is gone. My Kiri. God help me. Oh, God, have mercy upon me. He stopped in his unsteady walk, and sat and stared into the fire. His eyes were red. Blotches of heart's blood seemed to be rising to them, but there was not the sign of a tear. Philip did not attempt to console him. He felt as if the first syllable would choke in his throat. I see how it's been, sir, said Pete. While I was away, her heart was changing her, and when I came back, she thought she must keep her word. My poor lamb! She was only a child, anyway. But I was a man. I ought to have seen how it was. I'm like a drowning man, too. Things are coming back on me. I'm seeing them plain enough now, but it's too late. My poor Kiri! And I thought I was making her so happy. Then, with a helpless look, you wouldn't believe it, sir, but I was never once thinking nothing else. No, I wasn't. It's a fact. I was same as a sailor working all the voyage home, making a cage and painting it gold for the love bird he'd catched in the sunny land somewhere. But when he's putting it in, it's only wanting away, poor thing. With a sense of groveling meanness, Philip sat and listened. Then, with eyes wandering across the floor, he said, You have nothing to reproach yourself with. You did everything a man could do, everything. And she was innocent also. It was the fault of another. He came between you. Perhaps he thought he couldn't help it. Perhaps he persuaded himself. God knows what lie he told himself. But she's innocent, Pete. Believe me, she's... Pete brought his fist down heavily on the table, and the rings that lay on it jumped and tingled. What's that to me, he cried hoarsely. What do I care if she's innocent or guilty? She's dead, isn't she? And that's enough. Curse the man, I don't want to hear of him. He's mine now. What for should he come here between me and my own? The torn heart and racked brain could bear no more. Pete dropped his head on the table. Presently his anger ebbed. Without lifting his head, he stretched his hand across the rings to feel for Philip's hand. Philip's hand trembled in his grasp. He took that for sympathy and became the more ashamed. "'Give me time, mate,' he said. "'I'll be my own man soon. "'My head's moithering dreadful. "'I'm not knowing if I heard you right. "'In Douglas, you say? "'By herself, too? "'Not by herself, surely. "'Not quite alone, neither. "'She found you out, didn't she? "'You'd be there, Phil. "'You'd be with her yourself. "'She'd be wanting for nothing.' 
Philip answered huskily, his eyes still wandering. If it will be any comfort to you, yes, I was, with her. She wanted for nothing. My poor girl, said Pete. Did she send, had she any, maybe she said a word or two, at the last, eh? Philip clutched at the question. There was something at last that he could say without falsehood. She sent a prayer for your forgiveness, he said. She told me to tell you to think of her as little as might be, not to grieve for her too much, and to try to forget her, so that her sin also might be forgotten. And the little one? Anything about the little one? asked Pete. That was the bitterest grief of all, said Philip. It was so hard that you must think her an unnatural mother. My Catherine, my little Catherine, my sweet angel. It was her cry the whole day long. I see, I see, said Pete, nodding at the fire. She left the little one for my sake, wanting it with her all the while. Poor thing. You'd comfort her, Philip. You'd let her go easy. The child is well and happy, I told her. He's thinking nothing of yourself but what is good and kind, I said. God's peace rest on her, my darling, my wife, said Pete solemnly. Then suddenly in another tone, Do you know where she's buried? Philip hesitated. He had not foreseen this question. Where had been his head that he had never thought of it? But there was no going back now. He was compelled to go on. He must tell lie on lie. Yes, he faltered. Could you take me to the grave? Philip gasped. The sweat broke out on his forehead. Don't be freckin', sir, said Pete. I'm my own man again. Could you take me to my wife's grave? Yes, said Philip. He was in the rapids. He was on the edge of precipitation. He was compelled to go over. He made a blindfold plunge. Lie on lie. Lie on lie. Then we'll start by the coach tomorrow, said Pete. Philip rose with rigid limbs. He had meant to tell one lie only, and already he had told many. Truly a lie is a cripple. It cannot stand alone. Good night, Pete. I'll go home. I'm not well tonight. We'll stop the coach at your aunt's gate in the morning, said Pete. They stepped to the door together, and stood for a moment in the dank and lifeless darkness. The world's getting wonderful lonely, man, and you're all that's left to me now, Phil. You and the child. I'm not for wailing, though. When I got my gunshot wound out yonder, I was away over the big veldt, hundreds of miles from anywhere, behind the last bush and the last blade of grass, with the stones and the ashes and the dust, about as far, you'd say, as the world was finished, and never looking to see herself and the old island and the old faces no more. I'm not so lonesome as that at all. Good night, old fellow, and God bless you. The gate opened and closed. Philip went stumbling up the road. He was hating Pete, to hate this open-hearted man who had dragged him into an entanglement of lies was the only resource of his stifled conscience. Pete went back to the house, muttering, Kiri is dead, Kiri is dead. He put the catch on the door and said, Close the shutters, Nancy, and then returned to his chair by the cradle. End of Part 5, Chapter 19《Part Five, Chapter Twenty of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part Five, Chapter Twenty. Later the same night, Pete carried the news to Sulby. Granny was in the bar room, and he broke it to her gently, tenderly, lovingly. Loud voices came from the kitchen. Caesar was there in angry contention with Black Tom. An open Bible was between them on their knees. Tom tugged it towards him, bobbed his blunt forefinger down on the page, and cried, There's the text. That'll pin you, publicans and sinners. Caesar leaned back in his seat, and said with withering scorn, It's a bad business. I'll give you leave to say that. It's men like you that's making it bad but whether it is better for a bad business to be in bad hands or in good ones. There's a big local preacher in London, they're telling me, that's hot for joining the public house to the church and turning the parsons into the publicans. That's what they all were on the Isle of Man in old days gone by, and pity they're not so still. 
Oh, I've been giving it my serious thoughts, sir. I've been making it a subject for prayer. Will I give up my public or hold fast to it to keep it out of the worst hands? And I'm strong to believe the Lord hath spoken. It's a little vineyard, a little work in a little vineyard. Stick to it, Caesar, and so I will. Pete stepped into the kitchen and flung his news at Caesar with a sort of wild melancholy, as who would say, There, is that enough for you? Are you satisfied now? Mere ye sure. It's the hand of God, said Caesar. A middling bad hand, then, said Pete. I've seen better anyway. A high spiritual pride took hold of Caesar. Black Tom was watching him, and working his big eyebrows vigorously. With mouth firmly shut and head thrown back, Caesar said in a sepulchral voice, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Pete made a crack of savage laughter. Aren't you feeling it, sir, said Caesar? Not a field near me, said Pete. I never did the Lord no harm that I know of, but he's taken my young wife and left my poor innocent little one motherless. Unsearchable the wisdom and justice of God, said Caesar. Unsearchable, said Pete. It's all that, but I don't know if you're calling it justice. I'm not myself. It isn't my tally. Blasphemy? I lave it with you. A scoffer, am I? So be it. The Lord's licked me, and I've had enough. But I'm not going down on my knees for it anyway. The Almighty and me is about quits. With that word on his lips, he strode out of the place, grim, implacable, almost savage, a fierce smile fluttering on his ashy face. End of Part 5 Chapter 20「Part five, Chapter twenty one of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part five, Chapter twenty one. Granny came to Elm Cottage next morning with two duck eggs for Pete's breakfast. She was boiling them in a saucepan when Pete came downstairs. Come now, she said coaxingly, as she laid them on the table with the water smoking off the shells. But Pete could not eat. He hasn't destroyed any food these days, said Nancy. A little before she had rolled her apron, slipped out into the street, and brought back a tiny packet screwed up in a bit of newspaper. Perhaps he'll eat them on the road, said Granny. I'll put them in the handkerchief in his hat anyway. My faith, no woman, cried Nancy. He's the mischief for sweating. He'll be mopping his forehead and forgetting the eggs. But here, where's your waistcoat pocket, Pete? Have you room for a hayseed anywhere? There. It's a quarter of twist, poor boy, she whispered behind her hand to Granny. Thus they vied with each other in little attentions to the downhearted man. Meantime Crow, the driver of the Douglas coach, a merry old sinner with a bulbous nose and short hair, standing erect like the steel pins of an electric brush, was whistling as he put his horses to in the marketplace. Presently he swirled round the corner and drew up at the gate. The women then became suddenly quiet and put their aprons to their mouths, as if a hearse had stopped at the door. But Pete bustled about and shouted boisterously to cover the emotion of his farewell. Goodbye, Granny. I'll say a word for you when I get there. Goodbye, Nancy. I'll not be forgetting yourself neither. Goodbye, Lil Boch dropping on one knee at the side of the cradle. What right has a man's heart to be going losing him while he has a little innocent like this to live for? Goodbye. There was a throng of women at the gate talking of Kate. Oh, a civil person, very. A civiler person never was. It's me that'll be missing her too. I served her eggs to the day of her death, as you might say. Good morning, Christian Anne, says she. Just like that. Welcome, you say? I was at home at the woman's door. And the beautiful she came home in the gig with the baby. Only yesterday, you might say. And now, Lord a massy. Hush, it's himself. I'm fit enough to cry when I look at the man. The cheerful heart is broke at him. Hush. They dropped their heads so that Pete might avoid their gaze, and held the coach door open for him, expecting that he would go inside as to a funeral. But he saluted them with, Good morning, all, and leapt to the box seat with Crow. 
The coach stopped to take up the deemster at the gate of Balua House. Philip looked thin and emaciated, and walked with a death-like weakness, but also a feverish resolution. Behind him, carrying a rag, came Auntie Nan in her white cap, with little nervous attentions and a face full of anxiety. "'Drive inside today, Philip,' she said. "'No, no,' he answered, and kissed her, pushed her to the other side of the gate with gentle protestation, and climbed to Pete's side. Then the old lady said, "'Good morning, Peter. I'm so sorry for your great trouble and trust. But you'll not let the deemster ride too long outside if it grows. He's had a sleepless night, and—' "'Go on, Crow,' said Philip in a decisive voice. "'I'll see to that, Miss Christian, ma'am,' shouted Crow over his shoulder. "'His honour's studying a bit too hard, that's what he is. "'But a gentleman's not much use if his wife's a widow, as the man said, eh? "'Looking well enough yourself, though, Miss Christian, ma'am. "'Getting younger every day, in fact. "'I'll have to be fetching that East Indy captain up yet. "'I will that. Ha-ha! "'Get on, boxer.' "'Then, with a flick of the whip, they were off on their journey.' The day was calm and beautiful. Old Barul wore his yellow skull-cap of flowering gorse, the birds sang on the trees, and the sea on the shore sang also with the sound of far-off joy-bells. It was a heart-breaking day to Pete, but he tried to bear himself bravely. He was seated between Philip and the driver. On the farther side of Crow there were two other passengers, a farmer and a fisherman. The farmer, a foul-mouthed fellow with a long staff and two dogs racing and barking on the road, was returning from Midsummer Fair, at which he had sold his sheep. The fisherman, a simple creature, was coming home from the mackerel fishing at Kinsale, with a box of the fish between his legs. "'The wife's been having a little one since I was laving in March,' said the fisherman, laughing all over his bronze face. "'A boy, do you say? Oh, another boy, of course.' Three of them now, all men. Got a letter at Ramsey Post Office coming through. She's getting on as nice as nice, and the old woman's busy doing for her. Gee, a boxer, we'll wet its head at the Hibernian, said Crow. I'm not particular at all, said the fisherman cheerily. The mackerel's been doing middling this season anyway. And then in his simple way he went on to paint home and the joy of coming back to it, with the new baby and the mother in childbed, and the grandmother as housekeeper, and the other children waiting for new frocks and new jackets out of the earnings of the fishing, and himself going round to pay the grocer what had been put on strap while he was at Kinsale, till Pete was melted and could listen no longer. "'I'm persuaded still she wasn't well when she went away,' he whispered, turning his shoulder to the men and his face to Philip. He talked in a low voice, just above the rumble of the wheels trying to extenuate Kate's fault and to excuse her to Philip. "'It's no use thinking hard of anybody, is it, sir?' he said. "'We can't crawl into another person's soul, as the saying is.' After that he asked many questions about Kate's illness, about the doctor, about the funeral, about everything except the man. Of him he asked nothing. Philip was compelled to answer. He was like a prisoner chained at the galleys. He was forced to go on. They crossed the bridge over the top of Ballaglass, which goes down to the mill at Cornet. "'There's the glen, sir,' said Pete. "'Ah, oh, the dear old days! Wading in the water, leaping over the stones, clambering on the trunks. Oh, dear! Oh, dear! Bareheaded and barefooted in those times, sir, but smart extraordinary, and a terrible notion of being dressy, too. Twisting ferns about her little neck for lace, sticking a mountain thistle sparkling with dew on her breast for a diamond, twining a trail of fuchsia round her head for a crown. Oh, dear, oh, dear. And now, well, well, to think, to think. There was laughter on the other side of the coach. What do you say, Captain Pete? shouted Crow. What's that? asked Pete. The fisherman had treated the driver and the farmer at the Hibernian and was being rewarded with robustious chaff. "'I'm telling Dan Johnny here these childers that's coming when a man's away from home isn't much to trust. Best put a sight up with the little one not to the wise woman of Glen Alden, eh? A man doesn't like to bring up a cuckoo in the nest. What do you say, Captain?' "'I say you're a dirty old devil, Crow, and I don't want to be chucking you off your seat,' said Pete. And with that he turned back to Philip. 
The driver was affronted, but the farmer pacified him by an appeal to his fear. He'd be coarse to tackle the same fellow. I saw him clane out a tent with one hand at Tinwald. It's a wonder she didn't come home for all, said Pete at Philip's ear. At the end, you know. Couldn't face it out, I suppose. Nothing to be afraid of, though, if she'd only known. I had kept things middling straight up to then, and I'd have broke the head of the first man that had wagged a tongue. But maybe it was myself she was freckened of. Freckened of me. Poor thing, poor thing. Philip was in torment. To witness Pete's simple grief, to hear him breathe a forgiveness for the erring woman, and to be trusted with the thoughts of his heart as a father might be trusted by a young child. It was anguish. It was agony. It was horror. More than once he felt an impulse to cast off his load, to confess, to tell everything. But he reflected that he had no right to do this, that the secret was not his own to give away. His fear restrained him also. He looked into Pete's face, so full of manly sorrow, and shuddered to think of it transformed by rage. "'Sit hard, gentlemen. Bridges work here,' shouted Crow. They were at the top of the steep descent going down to Laxey. The white town lay sprinkled over the green banks of the glen, and the great water-wheel stood in the depths of the mountain gill behind it. "'She's there. She's yonder. It's herself at the door. She's up. She's looking out for the coach,' cried the fisherman, clambering up to the seat. "'Aisy all,' shouted Crow. "'No use, Mr. Crow. Nothing will persuade me, but that's herself with the little one in a blanket at the door.' Before the coach had drawn up at the bridge, the fisherman had leapt to the ground, shouldered his keg, shouted, "'Good ever and all,' and disappeared down an alley of the town. The driver alighted. A crowd gathered around. There were parcels to take up, parcels to set down, and the horses to water. Then the coach was ready to start again. The farmer with the dogs had gone, but there was a passenger for an inside place. It was a girl, a bright young thing, with a comely face and laughing black eyes. She was dressed smartly, after her country fashion, in a hat covered with scarlet poppies and with a vast brooch at the neck of her bodice. In one hand she carried a huge bunch of sweet-smelling gilvers. A group of girl companions came to see her off, and there was much giggling and chatter and general excitement. "'Are you forgetting the pouch and the pipe, Emma?' "'Let me see. Am I? No, it's here in my frock. "'Well, you'll be coming together by the coach at nine, it's like.' "'It's like we will, Lisa, if the steamer isn't late. "'Now then, ladies, off the step. "'Any room for a little calf in the straw with you, Missy? "'Freckened? "'Tut, only a little calf, as clean as clean, "'and breath as sweet as your own, Miss. "'There you are. "'It'll be lying quiet enough till we get to Douglas. "'All ready? "'Ready we are, then. "'Collar work now, gentlemen. "'Aise the horse, sir. "'Thank you. "'Thank you. "'Not you, Your Honour. "'Sit where you are, Dempster.' End of Part 5, Chapter 21《Part 5, Chapter 22 of The Manxman》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain Part 5, Chapter 22 Pete got down to walk up the hill, but Philip, though he made some show of alighting also, was glad of the excuse to remain in his seat. It relieved him of Pete's company for a while, at all events. He had time to ask himself again why he was there, where he was going to, and what he was going to do. But his brain was a cloudy waste. Only one picture emerged from the maze. It was that of the burial of the nameless waif in the grave at the foot of the wall. If he was conscious of any purpose, it was a vague idea of going to that grave. But it lay ahead of him only as an ultimate goal. He was waiting and watching for an opportunity of escape. If it came, God be praised. If it did not come, God help and forgive him. Meanwhile, Pete walked behind and caught fragments of a conversation between the girl and Crow. So you're going to meet himself coming home, miss, eh? My faith, how'd you know that? But it's yourself for knowing things, Mr. Crow. Has he been sailing foreign? Yes, sir. And nine months away for a week come Monday. 
but spoken at Hollyhead in Tuesday's paper and paid off in Liverpool yesterday. That's his initials, if you want to know. J.W. I worked them on the pouch myself. I've spun him a web for a jacket, too. Sweethearting with the minor fellows while Jemmy's been away? Have I, do you say? How people will be talking. Oh, no offence at all, but sorry you're not keeping another string to your bow, Missy. These sailor lads aren't particular anyway. Bless your heart, no, but getting as tired of one sweetheart as a pig of brewer's grain. Constant? Chut. When the like of that sort is away foreign, he lays up of the first girl he comes foul of. The girl laughed and shook her head bravely, but the tears were beginning to trickle from her eyes, and the hand that held the flowers was trembling. Don't listen to the man, my dear, said Pete. There's too much comic in these old bachelor bucks. Your boy is dying to get home to you. Go bail on that, Emma. The packet isn't making halfway enough for him, and he's bad dreadful wanting to ship aloft and let out the topsail. At the crest of the hill, Pete climbed back to Philip's side and said, The heart's a queer thing, sir. Got its winds and tides same as anything else. The wind blows contrary ways in one day, and it's the same with the heart itself. Changeable? Well, maybe. We shouldn't be too hard on it for all. If I'd only known now, she wasn't much better than a child when I left for Kimberley. And then what was I? I was only common stuff anyway. Not much fit for the likes of herself, when you think of it, sir. If I'd only guessed when I came back. I could have done it, sir. I was loving the woman like life. But if I'd only known now, well, and what's love if it's thinking of nothing but itself? If I'd thought she was loving another man by the time I came home, I could have given her up to him. Yes, I could. I'm persuaded I could. So help me God, I could. Philip was wasting on that journey like a piece of wax. Pete saw his face melting away till it looked more like a skeleton than the face of a man really alive. You mustn't be taking it so bad at all, Phil, said Pete. She'll be middling right where she's gone to, sir. She'll be right enough yonder, he said, rolling his head sideways to where the sun was going round to its setting. And then softly, as if half afraid she might not be, he muttered into his beard, God be good to my poor broken-hearted girl, and forgive her sins for Christ's sake. An elderly gentleman got on the coach at Onken. Hello, a deemster, he cried. You look as sober as an old crow. Sober, a whole crow, ha ha. He was a facetious person of high descent in the island. Crow never goes home without getting off the box once or twice to pick up the moonlight on the road, do you, Crow? That'll do, Parson, that'll do, roared Crow, and then his reverence leaned across the driver and directed the shaft of his wit at Philip. And how's the young housekeeper, Deemster? Philip shuddered visibly and made some inarticulate reply. Good-looking young woman, they're telling me. Gemma Lord's got taste, seemingly. But take care, Your Honour, take care. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife, nor his ox, nor his ass. Philip laughed noisily. The miserable man was writhing in his seat. Take an old fiddler's advice, Deemster. Have nothing to do with the women. When they're young, they're kittens to play with you. But when they're old, they're cats to scratch you. Pete twisted his body until the whole breadth of his back blocked the parson from Philip's face. A fortnight ago, you were saying, sir? A fortnight, muttered Philip. There'll be daisies growing on her grave by this time, said Pete softly. The parson had put up his nose glasses. Who's this fellow, Crow? Captain what? His honour's cousin? Cousin? Oh, of course, yes, I remember. Tinwald. Ah, hm. The coach set down its passengers in the marketplace. Pete inquired the hour of its return journey, and was told that it started back at six. He helped the girl to alight and directed her to the pier where a crowd of people were awaiting the arrival of the steamer. Then he rejoined Philip, who led the way through the town. The deemster was observed by everybody. As he passed along the streets there was much whispering and nudging, and some bowing and lifting of hats. He responded to none of it. He recognized no one. He who was famous for courtesy, renowned for gracious manners, beloved for a smile like sunshine, the brighter and more winsome when it broke as from a cloud, 
returned no man's salutation that day, and replied to no woman's greeting. His face was set hard like a marble mask. It passed along without appearing to see. Pete walked one step behind. They did not speak as they went through the town. Not a word or a sign passed between them. Philip turned into a side street and drew up at an iron gate which opened onto a churchyard. They were at the churchyard of St. George's. This is the place, said Philip huskily. Pete took off his hat. The gate was partly open. It was Saturday, and the organist was alone in the church practising hymns for Sunday service. They passed through. The churchyard was an oblong enclosure within high walls, overlooked on its long sides by rows of houses. One of these rows was Athol Street, and one of the houses was the Deemsters. It was late afternoon by this time. Long shadows were cast eastward from the tombstones. The horizontal sunlight was making the leaves very light. Philip walked noisily, jerkily, irregularly, like a man conscious of weakness and determined to conquer it. Pete walked behind, so softly that his foot on the gravel was hardly to be heard. The organist was playing Cooper's familiar hymn, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. There was a broad avenue bordered by railed tombs leading to the church door. Philip turned out of this into a narrow path which went through a bare green space that was dotted with pegs of wood and little unhewn slabs of slate, like an abandoned coit ground. At the farthest corner of the space he stopped before a mound near to the wall. It was the new-made grave. The scars of the turf were still unhealed, and the glist of the spade was on the grass. Philip hesitated a moment and looked round at Pete, as if even then, even there, he would confess. But he saw no escape from the mesh of his own lies, and with a deep breath of submission he pointed down, turned his head over his shoulder, and said in a strange voice, there. The silence was long and awful. At length Pete said in a broken whisper, Lave me, sir, lave me. Philip turned away, breathing audibly. A moment longer Pete stood where he was, gripping his hat with both hands in front of him. Then he went down on his knees. Oh, forgive me my hard thoughts of thee, he said. Jesus, forgive me my hard thoughts of my poor Kiri. Philip heard no more. The organ was very loud and triumphant. Deep in unfathomable minds, of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. A red shaft of sunlight tipped down on Pete's uncovered head from the top of the wall. The blessed tears had come to him. He was sobbing aloud. He was alone with his love at last. He was alone with her indeed. At that moment Kate was looking down from the window of her room. She saw him kneeling and praying by another's grave. Philip never knew how he got out of the churchyard. He crawled out, creeping along by the wall and slinking through the gate, heart sick and all but heart dead. When he came to himself he was standing in Athol Street, and a company of jolly fellows in a jaunting car, driving out of the golden sunset, were rattling past him with shouts and peals of laughter. End of Part 5, Chapter 22《5, Chapter 23 of The Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain. Part 5, Chapter 23 Kate was standing in her room with the door open, beating her hands together in the first helpless stupor of fear, when she saw a man coming up the stairs. His legs seemed to be giving way as he ascended. He was bent and feeble, and had all the look of great age. As he approached, he lifted his face, which was old and withered. Then she saw who it was. It was Philip. She made an involuntary cry, and he smiled upon her, a hard, frozen, terrible smile. He is lost, she thought. Her scared expression penetrated to his soul. He knew that she had seen everything. At first he tried to speak, but he could utter nothing. 
Then a mad desire seized him to lay hold of her, by the arms, by the shoulders, by the throat. Conquering this impulse, he stood motionless, passing his hands through his hair. She dropped her eyes and hung her head. Their abasement in each other's eyes was complete. He was ashamed before her, she was ashamed before him. One moment they faced each other thus, in silence, in pitiless and awful silence, and then slowly, very slowly, stupefied and crushed, he turned away and crept out of the house. It is the end, the end. What was the use of going farther? He had fallen too low. His degradation was abject. It was hopeless, irreparable, irremediable. End it all, end it all. The words clamoured in his inmost soul. Halting down the quay, he made for the ferry steps, where boats were waiting for hire. He had lately hired one of an evening, and pulled round the head for the sake of the breath and the silence of the sea. "'Going far out this evening, Your Honour?' the boatman asked. "'Farther than ever,' he answered. "'Pull, pull, away from the terrible past, away from the horrible present. The steamer had arrived and had discharged her passengers.' She was still pulsing at the end of the red pier like a horse that pants after running a race. A band was playing a waltz somewhere on the promenade. Pleasure boats were darting about the bay. Seabirds were sitting on the water where the sewers of the gay little town empty into the sea. Pull, pull! He was flying from remorse, from despair, from the deep duplicity of a double life, from the lie that had slain the heart of a living man. How low he had fallen! Could he fall lower without falling into crime? Pull, pull! He would be a criminal next, when a man had been degraded in his own eyes, and in the eyes of her he loved. Crime stood beckoning him. He might try, but he could not resist. He must yield, he must fall. It was the only degradation remaining. Better end everything before dropping into that last abyss. Pull, pull! He was the judge of his island, and he had outraged justice. Holding a false title, living on a false honour, he was safe of no man's respect, secure of no woman's good will. Exposure hung over him. He would be disgraced, the law would be disgraced, the island would be disgraced. Pull, 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 before it is too late. Out, far out, farther than tide returns, or sea tells stories to the shore. He had rowed like a slave escaping from his chains, in terror of being overtaken and dragged back. The voices of the harbour were now hushed. The music of the band was deadened. The horses running along the promenade seemed to creep like ants, and the traffic of the streets was no louder than a dull subterranean rumble. He had shot out of the margin of smooth blue water in which the island lay as on a mirror, and out of the shadow of the hill upon the bay. The sea about him now was running green and glistening, and the red sunlight was coming down on it like smoke. Only the steeples and towers and glass domes of the town reached up into luminous air. He could see the squat tower of St. George's silhouetted against the dying glory of the sky. Seven years he had been its neighbour, and it had witnessed such happy and such cruel hours. All the joy of work, the sweetness of success, the dreams of greatness, the rosy flushes of love— and then the tortures of conscience, the visions, the horror, the secret shame, the self-abandonment, and last of all, the twofold existence as of husband with wife, hidden, incomplete, unfulfilled, yet full of tender ties which had seemed like galling bonds so many a time, but were now so sweet when the hour had come to break them. How distant it all appeared to be, and was he flying from the island like this, the island that had honoured him, that had rewarded him beyond his deserts, and earlier than his dreams, that had suffered no jealousy to impede him, no rivalry to fret him, no disparity of age and service to hold him back, the little island that had seemed to open its arms to him and to cry, Philip Christian, son of your father, grandson of your grandfather, first of Manxmen, come up. Oh, for what might have been, useless regrets, Pull, pull, and forget. But the home of his childhood, Balur, Auntie Nan, his father's death, brightened by one hope, the last, but ah, how vain. Port Moor, 
Pete, the sea's calling me. Pull, pull. The sea was calling him indeed, calling him to the deep womb that is death, not birth. He was far out. The sun had gone. The island was like a bird of ashy grey stretched across the horizon. The great wing of night was coming down from the sky, and up out of the mysterious depth of the sea came the profound hum, the mighty voice that is the organ of the world. He took in the oars, and his tiny shell began to drift. At that moment his eye caught something at the bottom of the boat. It was a flower, a broken stem, a torn rose, and a few scattered rose leaves. Only a relic of the last occupants, but it brought back the perfume of love, a sense of tenderness, of bright eyes, of a caress, a kiss. His mind went back to Sulby, to the Melia, to the Glen, to the days so full of tremulous love, when they hovered on the edge of the precipice. They had been hurled over it since then. It was some relief that between love and honour he would not have to struggle any longer. And Kate? When all was over and word went round, the deemster is gone, what would happen to Kate? She would still be at his house in Athol Street. That would be the beginning of evil. She would wait for him, and when hope of his return was lost, she would weep for him. That would be the key of discovery. The truth would become known. Though he might be at the bottom of the sea, yet the cloud that hung over his life would break. It was inevitable, and she would be there to bear the storm alone, alone with the island which had been deceived, alone with Pete who had been lied to and betrayed. Was that just? Was that brave? And then, what then? What would become of her? Openly shamed, charged as she must be with the whole weight of the crime from whose burden he had fled, accused of his downfall, a Delilah, a Jezebel, what fate should befall her? Where would she go? Down to what depths? He saw her sinking lower than ever man sinks. He heard her appeals, her supplications. Oh, what have I done, he cried, that I can neither live nor die? Then in that delirium of anguish in which the order of nature is reversed, and external objects no longer produce sensation, but sensation produces, as it were, external objects, he thought he saw something at the bottom of the boat where the broken rose had been. It was the figure of a man, stretched out, still and lifeless. His eyes went up to the face. The face was his own. It was ashy grey, and it stared up at the grey sky. The brain image was himself, and he was dead. He watched it, and it faded away. There was nothing left but the scattered rose leaves and the torn flower on the broken stem. The terrible shadow was gone. He felt that it was gone forever. It was dead, and it would haunt him no longer. It had lived on an empire of evil doing, and his evil doing was at an end. He would see his soul no more. The tears gushed to his eyes and blinded him. They were the first he could remember since he was a boy. Alone between the two mirrors of sea and sky, the chain that he had dragged so long fell away from him. He was a free man again. Go back. Your place is by her side. Don't sneak out of life and leave another to pay. Suffering is a grand thing. It is the struggle of the soul to cast off its sin. Accept it. Go through with it. Come out of it purged. Go back to the island. Your life is not ended yet. End of Part 5, Chapter 23。Part 5, Chapter 24 of The Maxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part 5, Chapter 24 We were just going sending a little yawl after you, Dempster, when we were seeing you a bit overside the head yonder coming back. He's drifting home on the flowing tide, says I, and so you were. Must have been a middling stiff pull for all. We were thinking you were lost one while there. I was almost lost, but I'm here again, thank God, said Philip. He spoke cheerily, and went away with a light step. It was now full night, the town was lit up, and the musicians on the pavement were twanging their banjos and harps. Philip felt a sort of physical regeneration, a renewal of youth, 
a new birth of heart and hope. He was like a man coming out of some hideous Gehenna of delirious illness. He thought he had never been so light, so buoyant, so happy in his life before. The future was vague. He did not yet know what he would do. It would be something radical, something that would go down to the heart of his condition. Oh, he would be strong. He would be resolute. He would pay the uttermost farthing. He would not wait to count the cost. And she? She would be with him. He could do nothing without her. The partner of his fault would share his redemption also. God bless her. He let himself into the house and shut the door firmly behind him. The lights were still burning in the hall, so it was not very late. He mounted the stairs with a loud step and swung into his room. The lamp was on the table, and within the circle cast by its blue shade, a letter was lying. He took it up with dismay. It was in Kate's handwriting. Forgive me. I'm going away. It is all my fault. I have broken the heart of one man, and I am destroying the soul of another. If I stay here any longer, you will be ruined and lost. I am only a millstone about your neck. I see it, I feel it, and yet I have loved you so, and wish to be so proud of you. Your heart is brave enough, though I have sunk it down so low. You will live to be strong and good and true, though that can never be while I am with you. I have been far below you from the first. All along I have only been thinking how much I loved you. But you have had so many other things to consider. My life seems to have been one long battle for love. I think it has been a cruel battle, too. Anyway, I am beaten, and oh, so tired. Do not follow me. I pray of you do not try to find me. It is my last request. Think of me as on a long journey. I may be. The great God of heaven knows. I am taking the little cracked medallion from the bottom of the oak box. It is the only picture I can find, and it will remind me of someone else as well. My little Catherine, my motherless baby. I have nothing to leave with you but this. It was a lock of her hair. At first I thought of the wedding ring that you gave me when I came here, but it would not come off, and besides, I could not part with it. Goodbye. I ought to have done this long ago. But you will not hate me now? We could never be happy together again. Goodbye. End of Part 5, Chapter 24「six chapter one of the Manxman this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the Manxman by Sir Hall Kane part six man and God chapter one the summer had gone the gorse had dried up the herring fishing had ended and Pete had become poor his Nicky had done nothing, his last hundred pounds had been spent, and his creditors in scores, quiet as mice until then, were baying about him like bloodhounds. He sold his boat and satisfied everybody, but fell nevertheless to the position of a person of no credit and little consequence. On the lips of the people he descended from Captain Pete to Peter Bridget. When he saluted the rich with how-do, they replied with a stare, a lift of the chin, and you've the odds on me, my good man. To this he replied, with a roll of the head and a peal of laughter, Have I now, but you'll die for all. Balladjora Chapel had been three months rehearsing a children's cantata entitled Under the Palms, and building an arbour of palm branches on a platform for Pete's rugged form to figure in, but Caesar sat there instead. Still Pete had his six thousand pounds in mortgage on Ballawain. Only three other persons knew anything of that, Caesar, who had his own reasons for saying nothing, Peter Christian himself, who was hardly likely to tell, and the high bailiff, who was a bachelor and a miser, and kept all business revelations as sacred as are the secrets of another kind of confessional. When Pete's evil day came, and the world showed no pity, Caesar became afraid. "'I wouldn't sell out, sir,' said he. "'Hold on till Martinmas, anyway. The first half-year's interest is due, then.' There's no knowing what'll happen before that. What's it saying? He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. The old man has had a politic stroke, they're telling me. Oh, the Lord's mercy endureth forever. 
Pete began to sell his furniture. He cleared out the parlour as bare as a vault. Time for it, too, he said. I've been wanting the room for a workshop. Martin Mass came, and Caesar returned in high feather. No interest, he said. Give him the month's grace, and hold hard till it's over. The Lord will provide. Isn't it written? In the world you shall have tribulation. Things are doing wonderful, though. Last night going home from Balladjora, I saw the corpse lights coming from the big house to Kirk Christ's churchyard, with the parson psalming in front of them. The old man's dying. I've seen his soul. To thy name, O Lord, be all the glory. Pete sold out a second room, and turned the key on it. Mortal cosy and small this big ugly mansion is getting, Nancy, he said. The month's grace allowed by the deed of mortgage expired, and Caesar came to Elm Cottage, rubbing both hands. Turn him out, neck and crop, sir, not a penny left to the man, and six thousand golden pounds paid into his hands seven months ago. But who's wondering at that? There's Ross back again, carrying half a ton of his friends over the island, and lashing out the silver like dust. Your silver, sir, yours. And here's yourself with the world darkening round you terrible. But no fear of you now. The meek shall inherit the earth. Oh, God is opening his word more and more, sir, more and more. There's that black Tom, too. He was talking big a piece back, but this morning he was up before the high bailiff for charming and cheating, and was put away for the Dempster. Lord, keep him from the gallows and hellfire. Oh, it's a refreshing season. It was God speaking to me by providence when I told you to put money on that mortgage. What's the scripture saying? For brass I bring thee gold. Turn him out, sir, turn him out. Didn't you tell me that old Ballowain had a palatic stroke, said Pete? I did, but he's a big man. Let him pay his way, said Caesar. Samson was a strong man, and Solomon was a wise one, but they couldn't pay money when they hadn't got it, said Pete. Let him look to his son, then, said Caesar. That's just what he's going to do, said Pete. I'll let him die in his bed, God forgive him. The winter came, and Pete began to think of buying a dandy, which, being smaller than a nicky and of your rig, he could sail of himself, and so earn a living by fishing the cod. To do this he had a further clearing of furniture, thereby reducing the size of the house to three rooms. The feather bed left his own bedstead, the watch came out of his pocket, and the walls of the whole kitchen gaped and yawned in the places where the pictures had been. The bog bane to the rushy currack, say I, Nancy, said Pete. Not being used to such grandeur, I was taking it hard. Never could remember to wind that watch. And feathers, bless you, don't I remember the little mother with a sickle and a bag going cutting the long grass on the steep bruise for the cow, and drying a handful for myself for a bed? Sleeping on it? Never slept the like since at all. The result of Pete's first week's fishing was twenty cod and a gigantic ling. He packed the cod in boxes and sent them by crow and the steam packet to the market in Liverpool. The ling he swung on his back over his oilskin jacket and carried it home, the head at his shoulder and the tail dangling at his legs. There, he cried, dropping it on the floor. Split it and salt it and you've breakfasts for a month. When the remittance came from Liverpool, it was a postal order for seven and sixpence. Never mind, said Pete. We're baiting Dan Hommy anyway. The old muff has only made seven and a penny. The weather was rough, the fishing was bad, the tackle got broken, and Pete began to extol plain living. Gough, bless me, he said, I don't know in the world what's coming to the old island at all. When I was for a manservant with Caesar, the farming boys were eating potatoes and herrings three times a day. But now? Butcher's mate every dinner time, if you please, and tay, the girls must be having it regular and taken no shame with them neither. My sake, I remember when the mother would be whispering, Keep an eye on the road, boy, while I'm brewing myself a cup of tea. Truth enough, Nancy, an ounce a week and a pound of sugar, and people wondering at the woman for that. The mountains were taken from the people, and they were no longer allowed to cut turf for fuel, coals were dear, the winter was cold, and Pete began to complain of a loss of appetite. My teeth must be getting bad, Nancy, he whined. They were white as milk and faultless as a negro's. Don't domesticate my food somehow. What's the odds, though? 
Can't ate supper at all, and that's some constellation. Nothing like going to bed hungry, Nancy, if you're wanting to get up with an appetite for breakfast. Then the beautiful drames, woman. Gough, bless me, the dinners and the feasts and the banquets you're eating in your sleep. Now if you filled your skin like a high bailiff before going to bed, ten to one you'd have a bergain riding on your breast the night through, and drame of dying for a drink of water. Oh, sleep's a regular radical good for levelling up anyway. Christmas approached. Servants boasted of the Christmas boxes they got from their masters, and Pete remembered Nancy. Nancy, said he, they're telling me Lisa Billy Naclay is getting twenty pound per year per annum at her new situation in Douglas. She isn't nothing to yourself at cooking. Mustn't let the little one stand in your way, woman. She's getting a big girl now, and I'll be taking her out in the dandy with me, and tying her down on the low deck there, and giving her a pig's bladder and she'll be playing away as nice as nice, see? Nancy looked at him, and he dropped his eyes before her. Is it wanting to get done with me, you are, Pete? she said in a quavering voice. There's my black. I can sell it for something. It's never been worn at me since I sat through the service with Granny the Sunday after we got news of Kiri. And I'm not a big eater, Pete. Never was. You can clear me of that anyway. A bit of bread and cheese for my dinner when you are out at the fishing, and I'm asking no better. Hold your tongue, woman, cried Pete. Hold your tongue afore you break my heart. I've seen my rich days, and I've seen my poor days. I've tried both, and I'm content. End of Part 6, Chapter 1《Part Six, Chapter Two of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part Six, Chapter Two. Meantime, Philip and Douglas was going from success to success, from rank to rank, from fame to fame. Everything he put his hand to counted to him for righteousness. When he came to himself after the disappearance of Kate, his heart was a wasted field of volcanic action, with ashes and scoriae of infernal blackness on the surface, but the wholesome soil beneath. In spite of her injunction, he set himself to look for her. More than love, more than pity, more than remorse prompted and supported him. She was necessary to his resurrection, to his new birth. So he scoured every poor quarter of the town, every rookery of old Douglas, and this was set down to an interest in the poor. An epidemic broke out on the island, and during the scare that followed, wherein some of the wealthy left their homes for England, and many of the poor betook themselves to the mountains, and even certain of the doctors found refuge in flight, Philip won golden opinions for presence of mind and personal courage. He organized a system of registration, regulated quarantine, and caused the examination of everybody coming to the island or leaving it. From day to day he went from house to house, from hospital to hospital, from ward to ward. No dangers terrified him. He seemed to keep his eye on each case. He was only looking for Kate, only assuring himself that she had not fallen victim to the pest, only making certain that she had not come or gone. But the divine madness which seizes upon a crowd when its heart is touched laid hold of the island at the sight of Philip's activities. He was worshipped. He was beloved. He was the idol of the poor. Almost everybody else was forgotten in the splendour of his fame. No committee could proceed without him. No list was complete until it included his name. Philip was ashamed of his glories, but he had no heart to repudiate them. When the epidemic subsided, he had convinced himself that Kate must be gone, that she must be dead. Gone, therefore, was his only hold on life, and dead was his hope of a moral resurrection. He could do nothing without her but go on as he was going. To pretend to a new birth now would be like a deathbed conversion. It would be like renouncing the joys of life after they have renounced the renouncer. His colleague, the old deemster, was stricken down by paralysis, and he was required to attend to both their duties. This made it necessary at first that all Deemster's courts should be held in Castletown, and hence Ramsay saw him rarely. He spent his days in the courthouse of the castle, and his nights at home. He 
His fair hair became prematurely white, and his face grew more than ever like that of a man newly risen from a fever. Study, said the world, and it bowed its head the lower. Yet he was seen to be not only a studious man, but a melancholy one. To defeat curiosity, he began to enter a little into the life of the island, and as time went on, to engage in some of the social duties of his official position. On Christmas Eve he gave a reception at his house in Athol Street. He had hardly realised how it would tear at the tenderest fibres of memory. The very rooms that had been Kate's were given over to the ladies who were his guests. All afternoon the crush was great, and the host was the attraction. He was a fascinating figure, so young yet already so high, so silent yet able to speak so splendidly, and then so handsome with that whitening head and that smile like vanishing sunshine. In the midst of the reception Philip received a letter from Ramsay that was like the cry of a bleeding heart. "'My little one is ill, they're saying. She's dying. Come to me for God's sake, Pete.' The snow was beginning to fall as the guests departed. When the last of them was gone, the clock on the bureau was striking six, and the night was closing in. By eight o'clock Philip was at Elm Cottage. End of Part 6, Chapter 2《6 Chapter 3 of the Manxman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part 6 Chapter 3 Pete was sitting at the foot of the stairs, unwashed, uncombed, with his clothes half buttoned and his shoes unlaced. Phil, he cried, and leaping up he took Philip by both hands and fell to sobbing like a child. They went upstairs together. The bedroom was dense with steam, and the forms of two women were floating like figures in a fog. "'There she is, the boch cried Pete in a pitiful wail. The child lay outstretched on Granny's lap, with no sign of consciousness, and hardly any sign of life except the hollow breathing of bronchitis. Philip felt a strange emotion come over him. He sat on the end of the bed and looked down. The little face, with its twitching mouth and pinched nostrils, beating with every breath, was the face of Kate. The little head, with its round forehead and the silvery hair brushed back from the temples, was his own head. A mysterious throb surprised him, a great tenderness, a deep yearning, something new to him, and born, as it were, in his breast at that instant. He had an impulse, never felt before, to go down on his knees where the child lay, to take it in his arms, to draw it to him to fondle it, to call it his own, and to pour over it the inarticulate babble of pain and love that was bursting from his tongue. But someone was kneeling there already, and in his jealous longing he realised that his passionate sorrow could have no voice. Pete, at Granny's lap, was stroking the child's arm and her forehead with the tenderness of a woman. The boch millish. Seems easier now, doesn't she, Granny? Quieter, anyway? Not coughing so much, is she? The doctor came at the moment, and Caesar entered the room behind him with a face of funereal resignation. "'See,' cried Pete, "'there's your little patient, doctor. She's lying as quiet as quiet, and hasn't coughed to spake of for better than an hour.' "'Hm,' said the doctor ominously. He looked at the child, made some inquiries of Granny, gave certain instructions to Nancy, and then lifted his head with a sigh. "'Well, we've done all we can for her,' he said. If the child lives through the night, she may get over it. The women threw up their hands with, Oh dear, oh dear. Philip gave a low, sharp cry of pain. But Pete, who had been breathing heavily, watching intently and holding his arms about the little one, as if he would save it from disease and death and heaven itself, now lost himself in the immensity of his woe. Tut, doctor, what are you saying, he said. You were always took for a knowledgeable man, doctor. "'But you're talking nonsense now. "'Don't you see the child's only sleeping comfortable? "'And haven't I told you she hasn't coughed anything worth for an hour? "'Do you think a poor fellow's got no sense at all?' "'The doctor was a patient man as well as a wise one. "'He left the room without a word. "'But thinking to pour oil on Pete's wounds, "'and not minding that his oil was vitriol, Caesar said, "'If it's the Lord's will, it's his will, sir. 
The sins of the fathers are visited upon the children. Yes, and the mothers too, God forgive them. At that Pete leapt to his feet in a flame of wrath. You lie, you lie, he cried. God doesn't punish the innocent for the guilty. If he does, he's not a good God but a bad one. Why should this child be made to suffer and die for the sin of his mother? I or its father either. Show me the man that would make it do the like, and I'll smash his head against the wall. Blaspheming, am I? No, but it's you that's blaspheming. God is good. God is just. God is in heaven. And you are making him out no God at all, but worse than the blackest devil that's in hell. Caesar went off in horror of Pete's profanities. If the Lord keeps not the city, he said, the watchman waketh in vain. Pete's loud voice had aroused the child. It made a little cry, and he was all softness in an instant. The women moistened its lips with barley water, and hushed its fretful whimper. Come, said Philip, taking Pete's arm. Let me lean on you, Philip, said Pete, and the stalwart fellow went tottering down the stairs. They sat on opposite sides of the fireplace, and kept the staircase door open that they might hear all that happened in the room above. "'Get thee to bed, Nancy,' said the voice of Granny. "'Dear knows how soon you'll be wanted.' "'You'll be calling me for twelve, then, Granny. Now mind, you'll be calling me.' "'Poor Pete. He's not so far wrong, though. What's it saying? Suffer little childers?' "'But Caesar's right enough this time, Granny. The boch is took for death as sure as sure.' I saw the crow that was at the wedding going crossing the child's head the very last time she was out of doors. Pete was listening intently. Philip was gazing passively into the fire. I couldn't help it, sir, I couldn't really, whispered Pete across the hearth. When a man's got a child that's ill, they may talk about saving souls, but what's the constellation in that? It's not the soul he's wanting saving at all, it's the child now, isn't it now? Philip made some confused response. Of course I can't expect you to understand that, Philip. You're a grand man, and a clever man, and a feeling man, but I can't expect you to understand that now, is it likely? The greenest gall's egg of a father that isn't half wise has the pull of you there, Phil. Deed he has, though. When a man has a child of his own, he's knowing what it means. The Lord help him. Something calls to him. It's like blood calling to blood. It's like... I don't know that I'm understanding it myself, neither not to say understand exactly. Every word that Pete spoke was like a sword turning both ways. Philip drew his breath heavily. You can feel for another, Phil. The Lord forbid you should ever feel for yourself. Books are your children, and they're best off that's never having no better. But the little ones, God help them, to see them fail and suffer and sink, and you not able to do nothing, and themselves calling to you, calling still, calling regular, calling out of mercy, the way I'm telling of anyway. Oh, God, oh, God. Philip's throat rose. He felt as if he must betray himself the next instant. Perhaps the doctor was right for all. Maybe the child isn't willing to stay with us now the mother is gone. Maybe it's wanting away, poor thing. And who knows? Wouldn't trust but the mother is waiting for the little boch yonder, waiting and waiting on the shore there, enticing and enticing. I've heard of the like anyway. Philip groaned. His brain reeled, his legs grew cold as stones. A great awe came over him. It was not Pete alone that he was encountering. In these searchings and rendings of the heart, which uncovered every thought and tore open every wound, he was entering the lists with God himself. The church bell began to ring. "'What's that?' cried Philip. It had struck upon his ear like a knell. "'E very,' said Pete. The bell was ringing for the old Manx service for the singing of Christmas carols. The fibres of Pete's memory were touched by it. He told of his Christmases abroad, how it was summer instead of winter, and fruits were on the trees instead of snow on the ground, how people who had never spoken to him before would shake hands and wish him a Merry Christmas. Then from sheer weariness and a sense of utter desolation, broken by the comfort of Philip's company, he fell asleep in his chair. The night wore on. The house was quiet. Only the husky rasping of the child's hurried breathing came from the floor above. An evil thought in the guise of a pious one took possession of Philip. God is wise, he told himself. God is merciful. He knows what is best for all of us. 
What are we poor impotent grasshoppers that we dare pray to him to change his great purposes? It is idle, it is impious. While the child lives there will be security for no one. If it dies there will be peace and rest and the beginning of content. The mother must be gone already, so the dark chapter of our lives will be closed at last. God is all wise, God is all good. The child made a feeble cry, and Philip crept upstairs to look. Granny had dozed off in her seat, and little Catherine was on the bed. A disregarded doll lay with inverted head on the counterpane. The fire had slid and died down to a lifeless glow, and the kettle had ceased to steam. There was no noise in the room save the child's galloping breathing, which seemed to scrape the walls as with a file. Sometimes there was a cough that came like a voice through a fog. Philip crept in noiselessly, knelt down by the bedhead, and leaned over the pillow. A candle which burned on the mantelpiece cast its light on the head that lay there. The little face was drawn, the little pinched nostrils were beating like a pulse, the little lip beneath was beaded with perspiration, the beautiful round forehead was damp, and the silken silvery hair was matted. Philip thought the child must be dying, and his ugly piety gave way. There was a movement on the bed. One little hand that had been clenched hard on the breast came over the counterpane and fell outstretched and open before him. He took it for an appeal, a dumb and piteous appeal, and the smothered tenderness of the father's heart came uppermost. Her child, his child, dying, and he there, yet not daring to claim her. A new fear took hold of him. He had been wrong. There could be no security in the child's death. No peace, no rest, no content. As surely as the child died, he would betray himself. He would blurt it all out. He would tell everything. My child, my darling, my Kate's Kate. A cry would burst from him. He could not help it. And to reveal the black secret at the mouth of an open grave would be terrible. It would be horrible. It would be awful. Spare her, O oh Lord, spare her. In a fear bordering on delirium, he went downstairs and shook Pete by the shoulders to awaken him. "'Come quickly,' he said. Pete opened his eyes with a bewildered look. "'She's better, isn't she?' he asked. "'Courage,' said Philip. "'Is she worse?' "'It's life or death now. We must try something that I saw when I was away.' "'Good Lord, and I've been sleeping. Safer, Philip. You're great. You're clever.' Be quiet, for God's sake, my good fellow. Quick, a kettle of boiling water, a blanket, some hot towels. Oh, you're a friend, you'll save her. The doctors don't know nothing. Ten minutes afterwards the child made a feeble cry, coughed loosely, threw up phlegm, and came out of the drowsy land which it had inhabited for a week. In ten minutes more it was wrapped in the hot towels and sitting on Pete's knee before a brisk fire, opening its little eyes and pursing its little mouth and making some inarticulate communication. Then Granny awoke with a start and reproached herself for sleeping. But dear heart alive, she cried with both hands up. The Boch village is mended wonderful. Nancy came back in her stockings, blinking and yawning. She clapped and crowed at sight of the child's altered face. The clock in the kitchen was striking twelve by this time. The bells had begun to ring again. The carol singers were coming out of the church. There was a sound on the light snow of the street, like the running of a shallow river, and the waits were being sung for the dawn of another Christmas. The doctor looked in on his way home, and congratulated himself on the improved condition. The crisis was past. The child was safe. Ah, better, better, he said cheerily. I thought we might manage it this time. It was a Dempster that done it, cried Pete. He was cooing and blowing a little Catherine over the fringe of her towels. He couldn't have done more for the little one if she'd been his own flesh and blood. Philip dared not speak. He hurried away in a storm of emotion. Not yet, he thought, not yet. The time of his discovery was not yet. It was like death, though. It waited for him somewhere. Somewhere and at some time, some day in the year, some place on the earth. Perhaps his eyes knew the date in the calendar. Perhaps his feet knew the spot on the land, yet he knew neither. Somewhere and at some time, God knew where, God knew when, he kept his own secrets. That night Philip slept at the mitre, and next morning he went up to Balur. End of Part 6 
Chapter Three. Part Six, Chapter Four of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain, Part Six, Chapter Four. The governor could not forget Tinwald. Exaggerating the humiliation of that day, he thought his influence in the island was gone. He sold his horses and carriages, and otherwise behaved like a man who expected to be recalled. Towards Philip he showed no malice. It was not merely as the author of his shame that Philip had disappointed him. He had half-cherished a hope that Philip would become his son-in-law. But when the rod in his hand had failed him, when it proved too big for a staff and too rough for a crutch, he did not attempt to break it. Either from the instinct of a gentleman, or the pride of a strong man, he continued to shower his favours upon Philip. Going to London with his wife and daughter at the beginning of the new year, he appointed Philip to act as his deputy. Philip did not abuse his powers. As grandson of the one great manxman of his century, and himself a man of talents, he was readily accepted by the island. His only drawback was his settled melancholy. This added to his interest, if it took from his popularity. The ladies began to whisper that he had fallen in love, and that his heart was buried in the grave. He did not forget old comrades. It was remembered in his favour that one of his friends was a fisherman, a cousin across the bar of Bastardy, who had been a fool and gone through his fortune. On St. Bridget's Day, Philip held Deemster's court in Ramsey, the snow had gone, and the earth had the smell of violets. It was almost as if the violets themselves lay close beneath the soil, and their odour had been too long kept under. The sun, which had not been seen for weeks, had burst out that day. The air was warm, and the sky was blue. Inside the courthouse, the upper arcs of the windows had been let down. The sun shone on the deemster as he sat on the dais, and the spring breeze played with his silvery wig. Sometimes, in the pauses of rasping voices, the birds were heard to sing from the trees on the lawn outside. The trial was a tedious and protracted one. It was the trial of Black Tom. During the epidemic that had visited the island, he had developed the character of a witch-doctor. His first appearance in court had been before the high bailiff, who had committed him to prison. He had been bailed out by Pete, and had forfeited his bail in an attempt at flight. The witnesses were now many, and some came from a long distance. It was desirable to conclude the same day. At five in the evening the deemster rose and said, The court will adjourn for an hour, gentlemen. Philip took his own refreshments in the deemster's room. Gemma Lord was with him, then put off his wig and gown and slipped through the prisoner's yard at the back and round the corner to Elm Cottage. It was now quite dark. The house was lit by the firelight only, which flashed like will-o'-the-wisp on the hall window. Philip was surprised by unusual sounds. There was laughter within, then singing, and then laughter again. He had reached the porch, and his approach had not been heard. The door stood open, and he looked in and listened. The room was barer than he had ever seen it. A table, three chairs, a cradle, a dresser, and a corner cupboard. Nancy sat by the fire with the child on her lap. Pete was squatting on the floor, which was strewn with rushes, and singing, Come, Bridget, St. Bridget, come in at my door, the crocks on the bink and the rushes on the floor. Then getting on to all fours like a great boy, and bobbing his head up and down, and making deep growls to imitate the terrors of a wild beast, he made little runs and plunges at the child, who jumped and crowed in Nancy's lap, and laughed and squealed till she kinked. "'Now stop, you great Omathon, stop,' said Nancy. "'It isn't good for the little one, deed it isn't.' But Pete was too greedy of the child's joy to deny himself the delight of it. Making a great low sweep of the room, he came back, hopping on his haunches and barking like a dog. Then the child laughed till the laughter rolled like a marble in her little throat. Philip's own throat rose at the sight, and his breast began to ache. He felt the same thrill as before— the same yet different, more painful, more full of jealous longing. This was no place for him. He thought he would go away. 
But turning on his heel, he was seen by Pete, who was now on his back on the floor, rocking the child up and down like the bellows of an accordion, and to and fro like the sleigh of a loom. "'My faith, the Dempster! Come in, sir, come in!' cried Pete, looking over his forehead. Then, giving the child back to Nancy, he leapt to his feet. Philip entered with a sick yearning and sat down in the chair facing Nancy. "'You're wondering at me, Dempster. I know you are, sir,' said Pete. "'Deed, but I'm wondering at myself as well. I thought I was never going to see a glad day again, and if the sky would ever be blue, I would be breaking my heart. But what is the Manx poet saying, sir? I have no will but thine, O God. That's me, sir, truth enough, and since the little one has been mending, I've never been so happy in my life.' Philip muttered some commonplace, and put his thumb into the baby's hand. It was sucked in by the little fingers, as by the soft feelers of the sea and anemone. Pete drew up the third chair, and then all interest was centred on the child. "'She's growing,' said Philip huskily. "'And getting wise terrible,' said Pete. "'You wouldn't believe it, sir, but that child's got the head of an almanac. She has, though. Listen here, sir. What does the cow say, darling?' Moo, said the little one. Look at that now, said Pete rapturously. She knows what the dog says too, said Nancy. What does Dempster say, Boch? Bow wow, said the child. Bless me soul, said Pete, turning to Philip with amazement at the child's supernatural wisdom. And there's Tom Hommy's boy, and a fine little fellow enough for it, but six weeks older than this one, and not a word out of him yet. Hearing himself talked of, the dog had come from under the table, the child gurgled down at it, then made purring noises at its own feet, and wriggled in Nancy's lap. "'Dear heart alive, if it's not like nursing an eel,' said Nancy. "'Be quiet, will you?' And the little one was shaken back to her seat. "'Aisy, old woman,' said Pete. "'She's just wanting her little shoes and stockings off, that's it.' Then talking to the child. "'Um, am, im, lum, la, lu. Just so. I don't know what that means myself, but she does, you see.' Oh, the child is teaching me heaps, sir. Listening to the little one, I'm remembering things. Well, we're only big children, the best of us. That's the way the world's keeping young, and God help it when we're getting so clever there's no child left in us at all. Time for young women to be in bed, though, said Nancy, getting up to give the baby her bath. Let me have a hold of the rogue first, said Pete, and as Nancy took the child out of the room, he dragged at it and smothered its open mouth with kisses. "'Poor sport for you, sir, watching a foolish old father playing games with his little one,' said Pete. Philip's answer was broken and confused. His eyes had begun to fill, and to hide them he turned his head aside. Thinking he was looking at the empty places about the walls, Pete began to enlarge on his prosperity, and to talk as if he were driving all the trade of the island before him. "'Wonderful fishing now, Phil. I'm exporting a power of cod.' getting postal orders and stamps, and I don't know what. Seven and sixpence in a single post from Liverpool. That's nothing, sir, nothing at all. Nancy brought back the child, whose silvery curls were now damp. What? A young lady coming in her nightdress, cried Pete. Work enough. Had to get it over her head, too, said Nancy. She wouldn't. No, she wouldn't. Here, take and dry her hair by the fire while I warm up her supper. Pete rolled the sleeves of his jersey above his elbows took the child on his knee, and rubbed her hair between his hands, singing, "'Come, Bridget, St. Bridget, come in at my door.' Nancy clattered about in her clogs, filled a saucepan with bread and milk, and brought it to the fire. "'Give it to me, Nancy,' said Philip, and he leaned over and held the saucepan above the bar. The child watched him intently. "'Well, did you ever?' said Pete. "'The strange she's making of you, Philip. Don't you know the gentleman, darling?' "'Oh, but he's knowing you, though.' The saucepan boiled, and Philip handed it back to Nancy. "'Go to him, then. Away with you,' said Pete. "'Go to your godfather. He'd have been your name-father, too, if it had been a boy you'd been. Off you go.' And he stretched out his hairy arms until the child touched the floor. Philip stooped to take the little one, who first pranced and beat the rushes with its feet, as with two drumsticks, then trod on its own legs, swirled about to Pete's arms, dropped its lower lip, and set up a terrified outcry. "'Ah, she knows her own father, bless her,' cried Pete, plucking the child back to his breast. Philip dropped his head and laughed. 
A sort of creeping fear had taken possession of him, as if he felt remotely that the child was to be the channel of his retribution. "'Will you feed her yourself, Pete?' said Nancy. She was coming up with a saucer, of which she was tasting the contents. "'He's that handy with a child, sir, you wouldn't think. Deed, you wouldn't.' Then stooping on the baby as it ate its supper. "'But I'm saying, young woman, is there no sleep in your eyes tonight? "'No, but nodding away here like a wood thrush in a tree,' said Pete. He was ladling the pobs into the child's mouth and scooping the overflow from her chin. "'Sleep's a terrible enemy of this one, sir. She's having a battle with it every night of life, anyway. God help her, she'll have luck better than some of us, or she'll be fighting it the other way about one of these days.' "'She's usually going off with the spoon in her mouth, sir, for all the world like a little cherub,' said Nancy. "'Too busy looking at her godfather to-night, though,' said Pete. "'Well, look at him. You owe him your life, you little sandpiper. And my sakes, the straight like him you are, too.' "'Isn't she?' said Nancy. "'If I wasn't thinking the same myself. Couldn't look straighter like him if she'd been his born child. Now could she? And the curls, too, and the eyes. Well, well.' "'If she'd been a boy now,' began Pete. "'But Philip had risen to return to the courthouse, "'and Pete said in another tone, "'Hold hard a minute, sir. "'I've something to show you. "'Here, take the little one, Nancy.' "'Pete lit a candle and led the way into the parlour. "'The room was empty of furniture, "'but at one end there was a stool, "'a stone mason's mallet, "'a few chisels and a large stone. "'The stone was a gravestone. "'Pete approached it solemnly.' held up the candle in front of it, and said in a low voice, "'It's for her. I've been doing it myself, sir, and it's lasted me all winter, dark nights and bad days. I'll be finishing it to-night, though, God willing, and to-morrow, maybe, I'll be taking it to Douglas.' "'Is it?' began Philip, but he could not finish. The stone was a plain slab, rounded at the top, beveled about the edge, smoothed on the face, and chiseled over the back, but there was no sign or symbol on it and no lettering or inscription. "'Is there to be no name?' asked Philip at last. "'No,' said Pete. "'No?' "'Tell you the truth, sir, I've been reading what it's saying in the old book about the recording angel calling the dead out of their graves. "'Yes?' "'And I've been thinking the way he'll be doing it will be going to the graveyards and seeing the names on the gravestones and calling them out loud to rise up to judgment. Some as it's saying to life eternal.' and some to everlasting punishment. Well? Well, sir, I've been thinking if he comes to this one and sees no name on it, Pete's voice sank to a whisper, maybe he'll pass it by and let the poor sinner sleep on. Stumbling back to the courthouse through the dark lane, Philip thought, it was a lie then, but it's true now. It must be true. She must be dead. There was a sort of relief in the certainty. It was an end at all events. A pitiful end, a cowardly end, a kind of sneaking out of fate's fingers. It was not what he had looked for and intended, but he struggled to reconcile himself to it. Then he remembered the child and thought, Why should I disturb it? Why should I disturb Pete? I will watch over it all its life. I will protect it and find a way to provide for it. I will do my duty by it. The child shall never want." He was offering the key to the lock of the prisoner's yard when someone passed him in the lane, peered into his face, then turned about and spoke. "'Oh, it's you, Deemster Christian.' "'Yes, doctor. Good night.' "'Have you heard the news from Ballawain? The old gentleman had another stroke this morning.' "'No, I had not heard it. Another? Dear me, dear me.' Back in his room, Philip resumed his wig and gown and returned to the courthouse. The place was now lit up by candlelight and densely crowded. Everybody rose to his feet as the deemster stepped to the dais. End of Part 6, Chapter 4《Part 6, Chapter 5 of The Manxman》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part 6, Chapter 5 Come, Bridget, St. Bridget, come in at my door, the crocks on the bink and the rush. She's fast, said Nancy. 
Rocking this one to sleep is like waiting for the kettle to boil. You may try and try and blow and blow, but never a sound. No sooner have you forgotten all about her, but she's singing away as steady as a top. Nancy put the child into the cradle, tucked her about, twisted the head of the little nest so that the warmth of the fire should enter it, and hung a shawl over the hood to protect the little eyelids from the light. Will you keep the house till I'm home from Sulby, Pete? I've my work, woman, said Pete from the parlour. I'll put a junk on the fire and be off then, said Nancy. She pulled the door on to the catch behind her and went crunching the gravel to the gate. There was no sound in the house now but the gentle breathing of the sleeping child, soft as an angel's prayer, the chirruping of the mended fire like a cage of birds, the ticking of the clock, and through the parlour wall the dull pat 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 of the wooden mallet and the scrape of the chisel on the stone. Pete worked steadily for half an hour, and then came back to the hall kitchen with the tools in his hand. The cob of coal had kindled to a lively flame, which flashed and went out, and the quick black shadows of the chairs and the table and the jugs on the dresser were leaping about the room like elves. With parted lips, just breaking into a smile, Pete went down on one knee by the cradle, put the mallet under his arm, and gently raised the shawl curtain. "'God bless my motherless girl,' he said, in a voice no louder than a breath. Suddenly, while he knelt there, he was smitten as by an electric shock. His face straightened, and he drew back, still holding the shawl at the tips of his fingers. The child was sleeping peacefully, with one of its little arms over the counterpane. On its face the flickering light of the fire was coming and going, making lines about the baby's eyes and throwing up the baby features. It is in such lights that we are startled by resemblances in the child's face. Pete was startled by a resemblance. He had seen it before, but not as he saw it now. A moment afterwards he was reaching across the cradle again, his arms spread over it, and his face close down at the child's face, scanning every line of it as one scans a map. "'Deed, but she is, though,' he murmured. "'She's like him enough, anyway.' An awful idea had taken possession of his mind. He rose stiffly to his feet, and the shawl flapped back. The room seemed to be darkening round him. He broke the coal, though it was burning brightly, stepped to the other side of the cradle, and looked at the child again. It was the same from there. The resemblance was ghostly. He felt something growing hard inside of him, and he returned to his work in the parlour. But the chisel slipped, the mallet fell too heavily, and he stopped. His mind fluctuated among distant things. He could not help thinking of Port Moore, of the Carras Do men, of the day when he and Philip were brought home in the early morning. Putting his tools down, he returned to the room. He was holding his breath and walking softly, as if in the presence of an invisible thing. The room was perfectly quiet. He could hear the breath in his nostrils. In a state of stupor he stood for some time with his back to the fire and watched his shadow on the opposite wall and on the ceiling. The cradle was at his feet. He could not keep his eyes off it. From time to time he looked down across one of his shoulders. With head thrown back and lips apart, the child was breathing calmly and sleeping the innocent sleep. This angel innocence reproached him. "'My heart must be going bad,' he muttered. Your bad thoughts are blackening the dead. For shame, Pete Quilliam, for shame. He was feeling like a man who is in a storm of thunder and lightning at night. Familiar things about him looked strange and awful. Stooping to the cradle again, he turned back the shawl onto the cradle head as a girl turns back the shade of her sunbonnet. Then the firelight was full on the child's face, and it moved in its sleep. It moved yet more under his steadfast gaze, and cried a little, as if the terrible thought that was in his mind had penetrated to its own. He was stooping so when the door was opened, and Caesar entered violently, making asthmatic noises in his throat. Pete looked up at him with a stupefied air. Peter, he said, will you sell that mortgage? Pete answered with a growl. Will you transfer it to me, said Caesar? The time's not come, said Pete. What time? the time foretold by the prophet when the lion can lie down with the lamb. Pete laughed bitterly. Caesar was quivering, his mouth was twitching, 
and his eyes were wild. Will you come over to the mitre, then? What for to the mitre? Ross Christian is there. Pete made an impatient gesture. That stormy petrol again. He's always about when there's bad weather going. Will you come and hear what the man's saying? What's he saying? Will you hear for yourself? Pete looked hard at Caesar, looked again, then caught up his cap and went out at the door. End of Part 6 Chapter 5「six, Chapter six of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain. Part six, Chapter six. With two of his cronies, the man had spent the day in a room overlooking the harbour, drinking hard and playing billiards. Early in the afternoon, a messenger had come from Ballawain saying, "Your father is ill. Come home immediately." By and by, he had said, and gone on with the game. Later in the afternoon, the messenger had come again, saying, Your father has had a stroke of paralysis, and he is calling for you. Let me finish the break first, he had replied. In the evening, the messenger had come a third time, saying, Your father is unconscious. Where is the hurry, then, he had answered, and he sang a stave of the miller's daughter. They married me against my will when I was daughter at the mill. Finally, Caesar, who had been remonstrating with the Ballawain at the moment of his attack, came to remonstrate with Ross, and to pay off a score of his own as well. "'Honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days,' cried Caesar with uplifted arm and the high pitch of the preacher. "'But your days will not be long, anyway, and if you are the death of that foolish old man, it won't be the first death you're answerable for.' "'So you believe it too,' said Ross, cue in hand. You believe your daughter is dead, do you, old Jephthah Jeremiah? Would you be surprised to hear now? The cronies giggled. That she isn't dead at all? Good shot. Cannon off the cushion. Halloa. Jephthah Jeremiah has seen a ghost, seemingly. Saw her myself, man, when I was up in town a month ago. Want to know where she is? Shall I tell you? Oh, you're a beauty. You're a pattern. You know how to train up a child in the way. Pocket off the red. It's you to preach at my father, isn't it? She's on the streets of London. Ah, Jeremiah's gone. They married me against my will. There you are, then. Good shot. Love twenty-five and nothing left. Pete pushed through to the billiard room, fearing there might be violence, hoping there would be, yet thinking it scarcely proper to lend the scene of it the light of his countenance. Caesar had stayed outside. Halloa! Here's Uriah, cried Ross. Talk of the devil, just thought as much. Ever read the story of David and Uriah? Should, though. Do you, good master? David was a great man, or, with a mock imitation of Pete's Manx, a terrible, wonderful, shocking great man. Uriah was his henchman. Terrible clever, too. But that green for all, the old cow might have ate him. And Uriah had a nice little wife. The nice now, you wouldn't think. But when Uriah was away, David took her. And then, and then, dropping the manx, it doesn't just run on Bible lines, neither, but David told Uriah that his wife was dead. Ha, ha, ha. Who saw her die? I, said the fly. I saw her. Stop that. Let go. Help. You'll choke me. Help, help. At two strides, Pete had come face to face with Ross, put one of his hands at the man's throat and his leg behind him doubled him back on his knee, and was holding him there in a grip like that of a vice. Help! Help! Oh! Ugh! Oh, the fellow gasped, and his face grew dark. You're not worth it, said Pete. I meant to choke the life out of your dirty body for lying about the living and blackening the dead. But you're not worth hanging for. You've got the same blood in you, too, and I'm ashamed for you. There, get up. With a gesture of indescribable loathing, Pete flung the man to the ground, and he fell over his cue and broke it. The people of the house came thronging into the room and met Pete going out of it. His face was hard and ugly. At first sight they mistook him for Ross, so disfigured was he by bad passions. Caesar was tramping the pavement outside. "'Will you let me do it now?' he said in a hot whisper. "'Do as you like,' said Pete savagely. 
The wicked is snared in the work of his own hand. Higaon, Salah, said Caesar, and they parted by the entrance to the courthouse. Pete went home, muttering to himself, The man was lying. She's dead. She's dead. At the gate of Elm Cottage the dog came up to him, barking with glee. Then it darted back to the house door, which stood open. Someone has come, thought Pete. She's dead. The man lied. She's dead, he muttered, and he stumbled down the path. End of Part 6 Chapter 6「six, Chapter Seven of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part Six, Chapter Seven. While the Deemster was stepping up to the dais, the people in the court were rising to receive him. A poor bedraggled wayfarer was toiling through the country towards the town. It was a woman. She must have walked far, her step was so slow and so heavy. From time to time she rested, not sitting, but standing by the gates of the fields as she came to them, and holding by the topmost bar. When she emerged from the dark lanes into the lamp-lit streets, her pace quickened for a moment. Then it slackened, and then it quickened again. She walked close to the houses, as if trying to escape observation. Where there was a short cut through an ill-lighted thoroughfare, she took it. Any one following her would have seen that she was familiar with every corner of the town. It would be hard to imagine a woman of more miserable appearance. Not that her clothes were so mean, though they were poor and worn, but that an air of humiliation sat upon her, such as a dog has when it is lost and the children are chasing it. Her dress was that of an old woman, the long manx cloak of blue homespun, fastened by a great hook close under the chin, and having a hood which is drawn over the head. But in spite of this old-fashioned garment, and the uncertainty of her step, she gave the impression of a young woman. Where the white frill of the old countrywoman's cap should have shown itself under the flange of the hood, there was a veil, which seemed to be suspended from a hat. The oddity and incongruity of her attire attracted attention. Women came out of their houses and crossed to the doors of neighbours to look after her. Even the boys playing at the corners looked up as she went by. She was not greatly observed for all that. An unusual interest agitated the town. A wave of commotion flowed down the street. The traffic went in one direction. That direction was the courthouse. The courthouse square was thronged on three of its sides by people who were gathered both on the pavement and on the green inside the railings. Its fourth side was the dark lane at the back, going by the door to the prisoner's yard and the deemster's entrance. The windows were lit up and partly open. Some of the people had edged to the walls as if to listen, and a few had clambered to the sills as if to see. Around the wide doorway there was a close crowd that seemed to cling to it like a burr. The woman had reached the first angle of the square when the upper half of the courthouse door broke into light over the heads of the crowd. A man had come out. He surged through the crowd and came down to the gate with a tail of people trailing after him and asking questions. Wonderful, he was saying. The Dempster spaking. Oh, Daniel come to judgment, sir. Pity for Tom, though. The man'll get time. I'm sorry for an old friend, but the Lord's will be done. Let not the ties of affection be a snare to our feet. It'll be five years if it's a day, and God willing he'll never live to see the end of it. It was Caesar. He crossed the street to the mitre. The woman trembled and turned towards the lane at the back. She walked quicker than ever now, but stumbling over the irregular cobbles of the paved way, she stopped suddenly at the sound of a voice. By this time she was at the door to the prisoner's yard, and it was standing open. The door of the corridor leading by the deemster's chamber to the courthouse was also ajar, as if it had been opened to relieve the heat of the crowded room within. Be just and fear not, said the voice. Remember, whatever unconscious misrepresentations have been made this day, whatever deliberate false swearing, and God and the consciences of the guilty ones know well there have been both, truth is mighty, and in the end it will prevail. The poor bedraggled wayfarer stood in the darkness and trembled. Her hands clutched at the breast of the cloak. Her head dropped into her breast. 
and a half-smothered moan escaped from her. She knew the voice. It had once been very sweet and dear to her. She had heard it at her ear in tones of love. It was the voice of the deemster. He was speaking from the judge's seat. The people were hanging on his lips. And he was standing in the shadow of the dark lane under the prisoner's wall. The woman was Kate. It was true that she had been to London. It was false that she had lived a life of shame there. In six months she had descended to the depths of poverty and privations. One day she had encountered Ross. He was fresh from the Isle of Man, and he told her of the child's illness. The same night she turned her face towards home. It was three weeks since she had returned to the island, and she was then low in health, in heart and in pocket. The snow was falling. It was a bitter night. Growing dizzy with the drifting whiteness and numb of the piercing cold, she had crept up to a lonely house and asked shelter until the storm should cease. The house was the home of three old people, two old brothers and an old sister, who had always lived together. In this household Kate had spent three weeks of sickness, and the Manx cloak on her back was a parting gift which the old woman had hung over her thinly clad shoulders. Back in the roads, Kate had time to tell herself how foolish was her journey. She was like a sailor who has alarming news of home in some foreign port, and hears nothing afterwards until he comes to harbour. A month had passed. So many things might have happened. The child might be better. He might be dead and buried. Nevertheless, she pushed on. When she left London, she had been full of bitterness towards Philip. It was his fault that she had ever been parted from her baby. She would go back. If she brought shame upon him, let him bear it. On coming near to home, this feeling of vengeance died. Nothing was left but a great longing to be with her little one and a sense of her own degradation. Every face she recognised seemed to remind her of the change that had been wrought in herself since she had looked on it last. She dare not ask. She dare not speak. She dare not reveal herself. While she stood in the shadow of the prisoner's yard listening to Philip's voice, and held by it as by a spell, there was a low hiss and then a sort of white silence, as when a rocket breaks in the air. The deemster had finished. The people in the court were breathing audibly and moving in their seats. A minute later she was standing by her old home, hers no longer, and haunted in her mind by many bitter memories. It was dark and cheerless. A candle had been burning in the parlour, but it was now spluttering in the fat at the socket. As she looked into the room it blinked and went out. During the last mile of her journey she had made up her mind what she would do. She would creep up to the house and listen for the sound of a child's voice. If she heard it, and the voice was that of a child that was well, she would be content, she would go away. And if she did not hear it, if the child was gone, if there was no longer any child there, if it was in heaven, she would go away just the same. Only God knew how, God knew where. The road was quiet. With trembling fingers she raised the latch of the gate and stepped two paces into the garden. There was no sound from within. She took two steps more and listened intently. Nothing was audible. Her heart fell yet lower. She told herself that when a child lived in a house the very air breathed of its presence, and its little voice was everywhere. Then she remembered that it was late, that it was night, that even if the child were well it would now be bathed and in bed. How foolish, she thought, and she took a few steps more. She had meant to reach the hall window and look in, but before she could do so, something came scudding along the path in her direction. It was the dog, and he was barking furiously. All at once he stopped and began to caper about her. Then he broke into barking again, this time with a note of recognition and delight, shot into the house and came back, still barking and making a circle of joyful salutation in the darkness round her. Quaking with fear of instant discovery, she crept under the old tree and waited. Nobody came from the house. There's no one at home, she told herself, and at that thought the certainty that the child was gone fell on her as an oppression of distress. Nevertheless, she stepped up to the porch and listened again. There was no sound within except the ticking of the clock. Making a call on her courage, she pushed the door open with the tips of her fingers. It made a rustle as the bottom brushed over the rushes. At that she uttered a faint cry and crept back trembling. But all was silence again in an instant. The fire gave out a strong red glow which spread over the walls and the ceiling. 
Her mind took in the impression that the place was almost empty, but she had no time for such observations. With slow and stiff motions she slid into the house. Then she heard a sleepy whimper, and it thrilled her. In an instant she had seen the thing she looked for, the cradle, with its hood towards the door and its foot to the fire. At the next moment she was on her knees beside it, doubled over it, and crying softly to the baby, looking so different, smelling of milk and of sleep. My darling, my darling! That was the moment when Pete was coming up the path. The dog was frisking and barking about him. She's dead, he was saying. The man lied. She's dead. With that word on his lips, he heaved heavily into the house. As he did so, he became aware that someone was there already. Before his eye had carried the news to his brain, his ear had told him. He heard a voice which he knew well, though it seemed to be a memory of no waking moment, but to come out of the darkness and the hours of sleep. It was a soft and mellow voice, saying, "'My beautiful darling, my beautiful rosy darling, my darling, my darling!' He saw a woman kneeling by the cradle, with both arms buried in it, as though they encircled the sleeping child. Her hood was thrown back, and her head was bare. The firelight fell on her face, and he knew it. He passed his hand across his eyes, as if trying to wipe out the apparition, but it remained. He tried to speak, but his tongue was stiff. He stood motionless and stared. He could not remove his eyes. Kate heard the door thrown open, and she lifted her head in terror. Pete was before her, with a violent expression on his face. The expression changed, and he looked at her as if she had been a spirit. Then, in a voice of awe, he said, "'Who art thou?' "'Don't you know me?' she answered timidly. It seemed as if he did not hear. "'Then it's true,' he muttered to himself. "'The man did not lie.' She felt her knees trembling under her. "'I haven't come to stay,' she faltered. They told me the child was ill, and I couldn't help coming. Still he did not speak to her. As he looked, his face grew awful. The dew of fear broke out on her forehead. Don't you know me, Pete? she said in a helpless way. Still he stood looking down at her, fixedly, almost threateningly. I'm Catherine, she said, with a downcast look. Catherine is dead, he answered vacantly. Oh, oh! She is in her grave, he said again. Oh, that she were in her grave indeed, said Kate, and she covered her face with her hands. She is dead and buried and gone from this house forever, said Pete. He did not intend to cast her off. He was only muttering vague words in the first spasm of his pain. But she mistook them for commands to her to go. There was a moment's silence, and then she uncovered her face and said, I understand, yes, I will go away. I oughtn't to have come back at all. I know that. But I will go now. I won't trouble you any more. I will never come again. She kissed the child passionately. It rubbed its little face with the back of its hand, but it did not awake. She pulled the hood onto her head and drew the veil over her face. Then she lifted herself feebly to her feet, stood a moment looking about her, made a faint pathetic cry and slid out at the door. When she was gone, Pete, without uttering a word or a sound, stumbled into a chair before the fire put one hand on the cradle, and fell to rocking it. After some time he looked over his shoulder like a man who was coming out of unconsciousness, and said, Eh? The soul has room for only one great emotion at once, and he had begun to say to himself, She's alive. She's here. The air of the house seemed to be soft with her presence. Hush. He got onto his feet. Kate, he called softly, very softly, as if she were near and had only just crossed the threshold. Kate, he called again, more loudly. Then he went out at the porch and floundered along the path, crying again and again in a voice of boundless emotion, Kate! 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 But Kate did not hear him. He was tugging at the gate to open it, when something seemed to give way inside his head, and a hoarse groan came from his throat. She's better dead, he thought and then reeled back to the house like a drunken man. The fire looked black, as if it had gone out. He sat down in the darkness and put his hand into his teeth to keep himself from crying out. End of Part 6, Chapter 7
Part six, chapter eight of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part six, chapter eight. The deemster in the half lit courthouse was passing sentence. Prisoner, he said, you have been found guilty by a jury of your countrymen of one of the cruelest of the crimes of imposture. You have deceived the ignorant, betrayed the unwary, lied to the simple, and robbed the poor. You have built your life upon a lie, and in your old age it brings you to confusion. In ruder times than ours your offence would have worn another complexion. It would have been called witchcraft, not imposture, and your doom would have been death. The sentence of the court is that you be committed to the castle Rushen for the term of one year. Black Tom, who had stood during the deemster's sentence, with his bald head bent, wiping his eyes on his sleeve and leaving marks on his face, recovered his self-conceit as he was being hustled out of the court. "'You're right, Dempster,' he cried. "'Witchcraft isn't worth nothing now. Religion's the only roguery that's going these days. Your friend Caesar was wise, sir. Best respects to him, Dempster, and may you live up to your own text yourself, too.' If my industry and integrity, said a solemn voice at the door, and what's it saying in Scripture? If any provide not for his own house, he is worse than an infidel. But the Lord is my shield. What for shall I defend myself? I am a worm, and no man, saith the Psalms. The Psalms is about right, then, Caesar, shouted Black Tom from between two constables. In the commotion that followed on the prisoner's noisy removal, the clerk of the court was heard to speak to the deemster. There was another case, just come in. Attempted suicide. Woman tried to fling herself into the harbour. Been prevented. Would his honour take it now, or let it stand over for the high bailiff's court? We'll take it now, said the deemster. We may dismiss her in a moment, poor creature. The woman was brought in. She was less like a human creature than like a heap of half-drenched clothes. A cloak which looked black with the water that soaked it at the hood covered her body and head. Her face seemed to be black also, for a veil which she wore was wet, and clung to her features like a glove. Some of the people in court recognized her figure even in the uncertain candlelight. She was the woman who had been seen to come into the town during the hour of the court's adjournment. Half helped, half dragged by constables, she entered the prisoner's dock, there she clutched the bar before her as if to keep herself from falling. Her head was bent down between her shrinking shoulders, as if she were going through the agony of shame and degradation. "'The woman shouldn't have been brought here like this. Quick, be quick,' said the deemster. The evidence was brief. One of the constables, being on duty in the marketplace, had heard screams from the quay. On reaching the place he had found the harbour-master carrying a woman up the quay steps. Mr. Quarry, coming out of the harbour office, had seen a woman go by like the wind. A moment afterwards he had heard a cry, and had run to the second steps. The woman had been caught by a boat-hook in attempting to get into the water. She was struggling to drown herself. The deemster watched the prisoner intently. "'Is anything known about her?' he asked. The clerk answered that she appeared to be a stranger, but she would give no information." Then the sergeant of police stepped up to the dock. In emphatic tones, the big little person asked the woman various questions. What was her name? No answer. Where did she come from? No answer. What was she doing in Ramsey? Still no answer. Your Honour, said the sergeant, doubtless this is one of the human wrecks that come drifting to our shores in the summer season. The poorest of them are often unable to get away when the season is over, and so wander over the island a pest and a burden to every place they set foot in. Then turning back to the figure crouching in the dock, he said, Woman, are you a street walker? The woman gave a piteous cry, let go her hold of the bar, sank back to the seat behind her, brushed up the wet black veil, and covered her face with her hands. Sit down this instant, Mr. Gorn, said the deemster hotly, and there was a murmur of approval from behind. We must not keep this woman a moment longer. He rose, leaned across to the rail in front, clasped his hands before him, looked down at the woman in the dock, and said in a low tone that would have been barely loud enough to reach her ears but for the silence 
as of a tomb in the court. My poor woman, is there anybody who can answer for you? The prisoner stooped her head lower and began to cry. When a woman is so unhappy as to try to take her life, it sometimes occurs only too sadly that another is partly to blame for the condition that tempts her to the crime. The deemster's voice was as soft as a caress. If there is such a one in this case, we ought to learn it. You ought to stand by your side. It is only right. It is only just. Is there anybody here who knows you? The prisoner was now crying piteously. Ah, we mean no harm to anyone. It is in the nature of woman, however low she may sink, however deep her misfortunes, to shield her dearest enemy. That is the brave impulse of the weakest among women, and all good men respect it. But the law has its duty, and in this instance it is one of mercy. The woman moaned audibly. Don't be afraid, my poor girl. Nobody shall harm you here. Take courage and look around. Is there anybody in court who can speak for you? who can tell us how you came to the place where you are now standing? The woman let fall her hands, raised her head, and looked up at the deemster, face to face and eye to eye. Yes, she said, there is one. The deemster's countenance became pale. His eyes glistened, his look wandered, his lips trembled, he was biting them, they were bleeding. Remove her in custody, he muttered. Let her be well cared for. There was a tumult in a moment. Everybody had recognized the prisoner as she was being taken out, though shame and privation had so altered her. Peter Quilliam's wife. Caesar Cregeen's daughter. Where's the man himself? Then it's truth they're telling. It's not dead she is at all, but worse. Laura Massey. What a trouble for the Dempster. When Kate was gone, the court ought to have adjourned instantly, yet the Deemster remained in his seat. There was a mist before his eyes which dazzled him. He had a look at once, wild and timid. His limbs pained although they were swelling to enormous size. He felt as if a heavy invisible hand had been laid on the top of his head. The clerk caught his eye, and then he rose with an apologetic air, took hold of the rail, and made an effort to cross the dais. At the next moment his servant, Gemma Lord, had leapt up to his side, but he made an impatient gesture as if declining help. There are three steps going down to the floor of the court, and a handrail on one side of them. Coming to these steps, he stumbled, muttered some confused words, and fell forward onto his face. The people were on their feet by this time, and there was a rush to the place. "'Stand back! He's only fainted!' cried Gemma Lord. "'Worse than that,' said the sergeant. "'Get him to bed, and send for Dr. Milcrest instantly.' "'Where can we take him?' said somebody." They keep a room for him at Elm Cottage, said somebody else. No, not there, said Gemma Lord. It's nearest, and there's no time to lose, said the sergeant. Then they lifted Philip and carried him as he lay, in his wig and gown as deemster, to the house of Pete. End of Part 6, Chapter 8「Part 6, Chapter 9 of The Manxman – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain. Part 6, Chapter 9. There was a kind of mental shock which, like an earthquake under a prison, bursts open every cell and lets the inmates escape. After a time, Pete remembered that he was sitting in the dark, and he got up to light a candle. Looking for candlestick and matches, he went from table to dresser, from dresser to table, and from table back to dresser, doing the same thing over and over again, and not perceiving that he was going round and round. When at length the candle was lighted, he took it in his hand and went into the parlour like a sleepwalker. He set it on the mantelpiece and sat down on the stool. In his blurred vision, confused forms floated about him. Ah, my tools, he thought, and picked up the mallet and two of the chisels. He was sitting with these in his hands when his eyes fell on the other candlestick, the one in which the candle had gone out. I meant to light a candle, he thought, and he got up and took the empty candlestick into the hall. When he came back with another lighted candle, he perceived that there were two. I'm going stupid, he thought, and he blew out the first one. A moment afterwards he forgot that he had done so, 
and seeing the second still burning, he blew that out also. So dull were his senses that he did not realize that anything was amiss. His eyes were seeing objects everywhere about. They were growing to awful size and threatening him. His ears were hearing noises. They were making a fearful tumult inside his head. The room was not entirely dark. A shaft of bleared moonlight came and went at intervals. The moon was scudding through an angry sky, sometimes appearing, sometimes disappearing. Pete returned to the stool, and then he was in the light, but the nameless stone, leaning against the wall, was in the shade. He took up the mallet and chisels again, intending to work. Hush, he said as he began. The clamour in his brain was so loud that he thought someone was making a noise in the house. This task was sacred. He always worked at it in silence. Pat, 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 pat. How long he worked he never knew. There are moments which are not to be measured as time. In the uncertain handling of the chisel and the irregular beat of the mallet something gave way. There was a harsh sound like a groan. A crack like a flash of forked lightning had shot across the face of the stone. He had split it in half. Its great pieces fell to the floor on either side of him. Then he remembered that the stone had been useless. It doesn't matter now, he thought. Nothing mattered. With the mallet hanging from his hand, he continued to sit in the drifting moonlight, feeling as if everything in the world had been shivered to atoms. His two idols had been scattered at one blow, his wife and his friend. The golden threads that had bound him to life were broken. When poverty had come, he had met it without repining. When death had seemed to come, he had borne up against it bravely. But wifeless, friendless, deceived where he had loved, betrayed where he had worshipped, he was bankrupt, he was broken, and a boundless despair took hold of him. When hope is entirely gone, anguish will sometimes turn a man into a monster. There was a fretful cry from the cradle, and still in the stupor of his despair, he went out to rock it. The fire which had only slid and smouldered was now struggling into flame, and the child looked up at him with Philip's eyes. A knife seemed to enter his heart at that moment. He was more desolate than he had thought. "'Hush, my child, hush,' he said, without thinking. "'His child? He had none. That solace was gone.' Anger came to save his reason. Not to have felt anger, he must have been less than a man or more." He remembered what the child had been to him. He remembered what it was when it came, and again when he thought its mother was dead. He remembered what it was when death frowned on it, and what it had been since death passed it by. Flesh of his flesh, blood of his blood, bone of his bone, heart of his heart. Not his merely, but himself. A lie, a mockery, a delusion, a deception. She has practised it, Oh, she had hidden her secret. She had thought it was safe, but the child itself had betrayed it. The secret had spoken from the child's own face. Yet I've seen her kneel by the cot and pray, God bless my baby, and its father and its mother. Why had he not killed her? A wild vision rose before him of killing Kate, and then going to the deemster and saying, Take me, I have murdered her because you have dishonoured her. Condemn me to death. Yet remember God lives, and he will condemn you to damnation. But the pity of it, the pity of it. By a quick revolt of tenderness he recalled Kate as he had just seen her, crouching at the back of the cradle, like a hunted hare with uplifted paws uttering its last pitiful cry. He remembered her altered face, so pale even in the firelight, so thin, so worn, and his anger began to smoke against Philip. The flower that he would have been proud to wear on his breast, Philip had buried in the dark. Curse him! Curse him! She had given up all for that man. Husband, child, father, mother, her friends, her good name, the very light of heaven. How she must have loved him! Yet he had been ashamed of her, had hidden her away, had been in fear lest the very air should whisper of her whereabouts. Curse him! Curse him! Curse him! In the heat of his great anger, Pete thought of himself also. Jealousy was far beneath him, but like all great souls, this simple man had known something of the grandeur of friendship. Two streams running into them, and taking heaven into their bosom. 
But Philip had kept him apart, had banked him off, and yet drained him to the dregs. He had uncovered his nakedness, the nakedness of his soul itself. Bit by bit, Pete pieced together the history of the past months. He remembered the night of Kate's disappearance, when he had gone to Ballure and shouted up at the lighted window, "'I've sent her to England, thinking to hide her fault.' At that moment Philip had known all, where she was, for it was where he had sent her, why she was gone, and that she was gone for ever. Curse him! Curse him! Pete recalled the letters, the first one that he had put into Philip's hand, the second that he had read to him, the third that Philip had written to his dictation. The little forgeries to keep her poor name sweet, the little inventions to make his story plausible, the little lies of love, the little jests of a breaking heart. And then the messages, the presence to the child, the reference to the deemster himself. And the deemster had sat there and seen through it all, as the sun sees through glass, yet he had given no sign, he had never spoken. He had held a quivering naked heart in his hand, while his own lay within as cold as a stone. Curse him! Oh, God, curse him! Pete remembered the night when Philip came to tell him that Kate was dead, and how he had comforted himself with the thought that he was not altogether alone in his great trouble, because his friend was with him. He remembered the journey to the grave, the grave itself, another's grave, how he knelt at the foot of it and prayed aloud in Philip's hearing. Forgive me, my poor girl. How shall I kill him, thought Pete. Deemster, too. First Deemster now, and held high in honour. Worshipped for his justice. Beloved for his mercy. Oh, God! Oh, God! There are passions so overmastering that they stifle speech, and man sinks back to the animal. With an inarticulate shout, Pete went to the parlour and caught up the mallet. A frantic thought had flashed on him of killing Philip as he sat on the bench, which he had disgraced, administering the law which he had outraged. The wild justice of this idea made the blood to bubble in his ears. He saw himself holding the deemster by the throat, and crying aloud to the people, You think this man is a just judge? He is a whited sepulchre. You think he is as true as the sun? He is as false as the sea. He has robbed me of wife and child. At the very gates of heaven he has lied to me like hell. The hour of justice has struck, and thus I pay him, and thus, and thus. But the power of words was lost in the drunkenness of his rage. With a dismal roar he flung the mallet away, and it rolled on the ground in narrowing circles. My hands, my hands, he thought. He would strangle Philip, and then he would kill everybody in his way, merely for the lust of killing. Why not? The fatal line was passed. Nothing sacred remained. The world was a howling wilderness of boundless license. With the savage growl of a caged beast, this wild man flung himself on the door, tore it open, and bounded on to the path. Then he stopped suddenly. There was a thunderous noise outside, such as the waves make in a cave. A company of people were coming in at the gate. Some were walking with the heavy step of men who carry a corpse. Others were bearing lanterns, and a few held high over their heads the torches which fishermen use when they are hauling the white nets at night. "'Who's there?' cried Pete in a voice that was like a howl. "'Your friend,' said somebody. "'My friend? I have no friend,' cried Pete in a broken roar. "'Deed, he's gone, seemingly,' said a voice out of the dark. Pete did not hear, seeing the crowd and the lights, but only as darkness vain with fire. He thought Philip was coming again, as he had so often seen him come in his glory, in his greatness, in his triumph. "'Where is he?' he roared. "'He's here,' they answered. And then Philip was brought up the path in the arms of four bearers, his head hanging aside and shaking at every step, his face white as the wig above it, and his gown trailing along the earth. There was a sudden calm, and Pete dropped back in awe and horror. A bolt out of heaven seemed to have fallen at his feet, and he trembled as if lightning had blinded him. Dead! His anger had ebbed, his fury had dashed itself against a rock, his towering rage had shrunk to nothing in the face of this awful presence. The dark spirit had gone before him and snatched his victim out of his hands. He had come out to kill this man, and here he met him being brought home dead. Dead? 
Then his sin was dead also. God forgive him. God forgive him where he was gone. Presumptuous man, stand back. O oh, mighty and merciful death! Death the liberator, the deliverer, the pardoner, the peacemaker! Even the shadow of thy face can quench the fires of revenge. Even the gathering of thy wings can deaden the clamor of madness, and turn hatred into love and curses into prayers. End of Part 6, Chapter 9《Part Six, Chapter Ten of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part Six, Chapter Ten. In that stripped and naked house, there was one room still untouched. It was the room that had been kept for the deemster. Philip lay on the bed, motionless and apparently lifeless. Gemma Lord stood beating his hands at the foot. Pete sat on a low stool at the side with his face doubled on to his knees. Nancy, now back from Selby, was blowing into the bars of the grate to kindle a fire. A little group of men stood huddled like sheep near the door. Someone said the Deemster's heart was beating. They brought from another room a little ivory hand-glass and held it over the mouth. When they raised it, the face of the mirror was faintly blurred. That little cloud on the glass seemed more bright than the shining tread of an angel on the sea. Gemma Lord took a sponge and began to moisten the coal forehead. One by one the people behind produced their old wife's wisdom. Somebody remembered that his grandmother always put salts to the nostrils of a person seemingly dead. Somebody else remembered that when on the very day of old Iron Christian's death his father had been thrown by a colt and lay twelve hours unconscious, the farrier had bled him, and he had opened his eyes instantly. The doctor had been half an hour gone to Belor, and a man had been put on a horse and sent after him, but it was a twelve miles journey. The night was dark. It would be a good hour before he could be back. They touched Pete on the shoulder and suggested something. Eh? he answered vacantly. Days, they told themselves. The poor man could not give a wise-like answer. He had had a shock and there was worse before him. They talked in low voices of Kate and of Ross Christian. They were sorry for Pete. They were still more sorry for the Deemster. The Deemster's wig had been taken off and tossed onto the dressing-table. It lay mouth upwards like an old woman's nightcap. His hair had dragged after it on the pillow. The black gown had not been removed, but it was torn open at the neck so that the throat might be free. One of Philip's arms had dropped over the side of the bed, and the long, thin hand was cold and green and ethereal as marble. Pete was crouching on his low stool beside this hand. He needed no softening to touch it now. The chill fingers were in his palm, and his hot tears were falling on them. Remembering the crime that he had so nearly committed, he was holding himself in horror. His friend, his lifelong friend, his only friend, the deemster no longer, but only the man, not the man either, but the child. The cruel years had rolled back with all their burden of trouble. Forgotten days were coming again, days long buried under the debris of memory. They were boys together again, a little sunny fellow in velvet and a bigger lad in a stocking cap, the little one talking, always talking, the big one listening, always listening, the little one proposing, the big one agreeing, the little one leading, the big one following, the little one looking up and yet a little down, the big one looking down and yet a little up. Oh, the happy, happy times, before anger and jealousy and rage and the mad impulse of murder had darkened their sunshine. The memories that brought the tenderest throb to Pete as he sat there, fingering the lifeless hand, were of the great deeds that he had done for Philip. How he had fought for him, and been licked for him, and taken bloody noses for him, and got thrashed for it by Black Tom. But there were others only less tender. Philip was leaving home for King William's, and Pete was cudgelling his dull head what to give him for a parting gift. Decision was the more difficult because he had nothing to give. At length he had hit on making a whistle, the only thing his clumsy fingers had ever been deft at. With his clasp knife he had cut a wondrous big one from the bough of a willow. He had pared it. He had turned it. It blew a blast like a foghorn. The morning was frosty, and his feet were bare, 
But he didn't mind the cold. He couldn't feel it. No, not a hapeth. He was behind the hedge by the gate at Ballour, waiting for the coach that was to take up Philip, and passing the time by polishing the whistle on the leg of his shining breeches, and testing its tone with just one more blow. Then up came Crow, and out came Philip in his new peaked cap and leggings. Whoop! Gee up! Away! Off they went without ever seeing him, without once looking back, and he was left in the prickly hedge with his blue feet on the frost, a look of dejection about his mouth and the top of the foolish whistle peeping out of his jacket pocket. The thick sob that came of these memories was interrupted by a faint sound from the bed. It was a murmur of delirium, as soft as the hum of bees, yet Pete heard it. "'Cover me up, Pete, cover me up,' said Philip, dreaming aloud. Philip was a living man. Thank God! Thank God! A whisper goes farther than a shout. The people behind whispered the news to the passage the passage to the stairs, the stairs to the hall, and the hall to the garden, where a crowd had gathered in the darkness to look up at the house over which the angel of death was hovering. In a moment the room was croaking like a frog-pond. Praise the Lord, cried one. His mercy endureth for ever, cried another. What's the saying, said a third? Rambling in his head, poor thing, said a fourth. Pete turned them out all except Gemma Lord, who was still moistening the deemster's face and opening his hands, which were now twitching and tightening. "'Out of this, out you go,' cried Pete hoarsely. "'No use taking the anger with him. The man's tried,' they muttered, and away they went. Jemmy was loath to see them go. He was afraid to be left alone with Pete, afraid that the deemster should be at the mercy of this wild creature with the flaming eyes. And now that Philip was a living man, Pete began to feel afraid of himself. At sight of life in Philip's face, his gnawing misery returned. He thought his hatred had been overcome, but he was wrestling in the throes of forgiveness again. Here was the man who had robbed him of wife and child and home. In another moment he might have held him in the grip of his just wrath. It is an inscrutable and awful fact that just at that moment when a man's good angel has conquered, but is spent, his evil angel is sure to get the advantage of chance. Philip's delirium set in strong, and the brute beast in Pete, going through its final struggle, stood over the bed and watched him. In his violence, Philip tore at his breast and dragged something from beneath his shirt. A moment later it fell from his graspless fingers to the floor. It was a lock of dark hair. Pete knew whose hair it was, and he put his foot on it, and in that instant the mad impulse came again to take Philip by the throat and choke him. Again and again it came. He had to tread it down even amid his sobs and his tears. But love cannot be killed in an instant. It does not drop down dead. There was a sort of tenderness in the thought that this was the man for whom Kate had given up all the world. Pete began to feel gently towards Philip because Kate loved him. He began to see something of Kate in Philip's face. This strange softening increased as he caught the words of Philip's delirium. He thought he ought to leave the room, but he could not tear himself away. Crouching down on the stool, he clasped his hands behind his head and tightened his arms over his ears. It was useless. He could not help but listen. Only disjointed sentences, odd pages torn from the book of life, some of them blurred with tears, but they were like a cool hand on a fevered brow to him that heard it. I was a child, Philip. Didn't know what love was then. Coming home by Ramsey steamer, Tell the simple truth, Philip. Say we tried to be faithful and loyal and could not, because we loved each other, and there was no help for... Tell Kiri. Yes, Auntie, I have read Father's letters. That picture is cracked. This in the voice of one who speaks in his sleep, and then in a hushed hot whisper. Haven't I a right to you? Yes, I have a right. Take your top coat, then. The storm is coming. I'll never let you go. Don't you remember? Can you ever forget? My husband... My husband. Pete lifted his head as he listened. He had been thinking that Philip had robbed him of Kate. Was it he who had robbed Kate of Philip? I can't live any longer in this house, Philip. The walls are crushing me. The ceiling is falling on me. The air is stifling me. Three o'clock, Pete. Yes, three tomorrow in the council chamber at Douglas. I'm not a bad woman, Philip Christian. There is something you have never guessed and I have never told you. Is it the child, Kate? Did you say the child? 
You are sure? You are not deceiving yourself? All this in a tone of deep entreaty, and then, with quick coming breath, Jemmy, get the carriage at Shimmons and drive it yourself. If there is any attempt at Ramsay to take the horse out, drive to the lane between the chapel and the cottage. The moment the lady joins you, you are right, Kate, you cannot live here any longer. This life of deception must end. That's the churring of the night jar going up to Ballure Glen. Jim Lord, who was beating out the pillow, dropped it in his fumbling half over the deemster's face and looked at Pete in terror. Would this cruel delirium never break? Where was the doctor? Would he not come at all? Pete had risen to his feet and was gazing down with a look of stupor. He had been thinking that Philip had robbed him of the child. Was it he who had robbed Philip? Yes, Pete is telling the same story. He is writing letters to himself. Such simple things. Poor old Pete. He means no harm. He never dreams that every word is burning. Jemmy, leave out more brandy tonight. The decanter is empty. Pete leaned over the pillow. All at once he started back. Philip's eyes were open and shining up at him. It was hard to believe that Philip was not speaking to him eye to eye. But there was a veil between them. The veil of the hand of God. I know, Philip, I know, said the unconscious man in a quick whisper. He was breathing fast and loud. Tell him I'm dead. Yes, yes, that's it, that's it. Cruel? No, but kind. Poor girl, he'll say. I loved her once, but she's gone. I'll do it, I'll do it. Then in tones of fear, it's madness. To paint faces on the darkness, to hear voices in the air is madness. And then, solemnly, with a chill, thick utterance, there, there, that one by the wall. Big drops of sweat broke out on Pete's forehead. He had been thinking that Philip had tortured him. It was he who had been torturing Philip. The letters, the messages, the presents, these had been the whips and scorpions in his hand. Every innocent word, every look, every sign, had been as thongs in the instrument of torture. Pete began to feel a great pity for Philip. He had suffered plenty, thought Pete. He has carried this cross about far enough. Good night, boatman. I went too far. Yes, I'm back again. Thank God. These words, brightly, cheerily, hopefully. Then in the deepest tones, Goodbye, Philip. It's all my fault. I've broken the heart of one man, and I'm destroying the soul of another. I'm leaving this lock of hair. It is all I have to leave. Goodbye. I ought to have gone long ago. You will not hate me now. The last words frayed off, broke in the throat, and stopped. Then quickly, with panting breath, came, Kate, 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 again and again repeated, beginning in a loud beseeching cry and dying down to a long wail, as if shouted over a gloomy waste wherein the voice was lost. Gemma Lord had been beating round towards the door, wringing his white hands like a woman, and praying to God that the deemster might never come out of his unconsciousness. He has told him everything, thought Jem. The man will take his life. I came between them, thought Pete. She was not for me. She was not mine. She was Philip's. It was God's doings. The bitterness of Pete's heart had passed away. But I wish, what's the good of wishing, though? God help us all, he muttered in a breaking voice. And then he crouched down on the stool as before, and covered his face with his hands. Philip had lifted his head and risen on one elbow. He was looking out on the empty air with his glassy eyes, as if a picture stood up before them. Yes, no, yes, don't tell me, that Kate? It's a mistake, that's not Kate, that white face, those hollow eyes, that miserable woman. Besides, Kate is dead, she must be dead. What's to do with the lamps? They are going out. In the dock, too, and before me. She there, and I here, she the prisoner, I the judge. All this with violent emotion, and with one arm outstretched over Pete's crouching head. If I could hear her voice, though, perhaps her voice now, I'm going to fall. It's Kate, it's Kate. Oh, oh! Philip had paused for several seconds, as if trying to listen, and then with a loud cry of agony he had closed his eyes and rolled back onto the pillow. God has meant me to hear all this, thought Pete. God had intended that for this the peace of his soul he should follow the phases of this drama of a naked heart 
He was sobbing, but his sobs were like growls. "'What's he doing now?' thought Gemma Lord, craning his neck at the door. "'Shall I call for somebody?' Pete had picked up from the floor the lock of hair that had been lying under his foot, and he was putting it back into Philip's breast. "'Nothing but me between them,' he thought. "'Nothing but me.' "'Sit down, sir,' cried the unconscious man. It was only the last outbreak of Philip's delirium, but Pete trembled and shrank back. Then Philip groaned and his blue lips quivered. He opened his eyes. They wandered about the room for a moment, and afterwards fixed themselves on Pete in a long and haggard gaze. Pete's own eyes were too full of tears to be full of sight, but he could see that the change had come. He panted with expectation and looked down at Philip with dog-like delight. There was a moment's silence, and then, in a murmur as faint as a breath, Philip murmured, "'What's... where's... is it Pete?' At that Pete uttered a shout of joy. "'He's himself! He's himself! Thank God!' "'Eh?' said Philip helplessly. "'Don't you be bothering yourself now,' cried Pete. "'Lie quiet, boy. You're in your own room, and as nice as nice.' "'But,' said Philip, "'will you not kindly... "'Not another word, Phil. It's nothing. You're all serene and about as right as ninepence.' "'Your honour has been delirious,' said Jem, my lord. Chut said Pete behind his hand, and then, with another joyful shout, "'Is it a beefsteak you'll be having, Phil, or a dish of tay and a herring?' Philip looked perplexed. "'But could you not help me?' he faltered. "'You fainted in the courthouse, sir,' said Jem, my lord. "'Ah, it had all come back.' "'Hold your wish, you gorby,' whispered Pete, and he made a furtive kick at Jemmy's shins. Pete was laughing and crying in one breath. In the joyful reflux from evil passions, the great fellow was like a boy. He poked the fire into a blaze, snuffed the candle with his fingers, sang out, My gosh! when he burnt them, and then hopped about the floor and cut as many capers as a swallow after a shower of rain. Philip looked at him and relapsed into silence. It seemed as if he had been on a journey and something had happened in his absence. The secret which he had struggled so long to confess had somehow been revealed. Gemma Lord was beating out his pillows. "'Does he know?' said Philip. "'Yes,' whispered Jemmy. "'Everything?' "'Everything. You have been delirious.' "'Delirious?' said Philip, with alarm. Then he struggled to rise. "'Help me up. Let me go away. Why did you bring me here?' "'I couldn't help it, sir. I tried to prevent—' "'I cannot face him,' said Philip. "'I am afraid. Help me. Help me.' "'You are too weak, sir. Lie still. No one shall harm you. The doctor is coming.' Philip sat back with a look of fear. "'Water!' he cried feebly. "'Here it is,' said Gemma Lord, lifting from the dressing-table the jug out of which he had moistened the sponge. "'Tut!' cried Pete, and he tipped the jug so that half the water spilled. "'Brandy for a man when he's in bed, you goosey gander. "'Hold hard, boy. "'I've a taste of the rail stuff in the cupboard. "'Half a minute, mate. "'A drop will be doing no harm at all.' "'And away he went down the stairs like a flood, "'almost sweeping over Nancy, "'who had come creeping up in her stockings "'at the sound of voices. "'The child had awakened in its cradle, "'and with one dumpy leg over its little quilt "'it was holding quiet converse with its toes.' "'Hollo, young cockalorum! Is it there you are?' shouted Pete. At the next moment, with a noggin bottle of brandy in his fist, he was leaping upstairs three steps at a time. Meanwhile, Gemma Lord had edged up to the deemster and whispered with looks of fear and mystery, "'Don't take it, sir.' "'What?' said Philip vacantly. "'The brandy,' said Jem. "'Eh?' "'It will be—' began Jem, but Pete's step was thundering up the stairs— and with a big opening of the mouth, rather than an audible utterance of the tongue, he added, "'Poisoned!' Philip could not comprehend, and Pete came shouting, "'Where's your water now, old snuff the wind?' While Pete was pouring the brandy into a glass and adding the water, Jemmy caught up a scrap of newspaper that was lying about, rummaged for a pencil, wrote some words on the margin, tore the piece off, and smuggled it into the deemster's hand. "'Afraid of Pete?' thought Philip. It is monstrous, monstrous. At that moment there was the sound of a horse's hoofs on the road. The doctor cried Gemma Lord. The doctor at last. Wait, sir, wait. And he ran downstairs. 
Here you are, cried Pete, coming to the bedside, glass in hand. Drink it up, boy, it'll stiffen you. My faith, but it's a wonner. Oh, God, it's good, though. He's all that. He's good, tremendous. Pete was laughing. He was crying. He was tasting a new sweetness, the sweetness of being a good man again. Philip was holding Gemma Lord's paper before his eyes and trying to read it. What's this that Jemmy has given me, he said. Read it, Pete. My eyes are dazed. Pete took the paper in his left hand, still holding the glass in his right. To get the light onto the writing, he went down on his knees by the bedhead and leaned over towards the fire. Then, like a schoolboy, repeating his task, he read in a sing-song voice the words that Gemma Lord had written. Don't drink the brandy. Pete is trying to kill you. Pete made a grating laugh. That's a pretty thing now, he began, but he could not finish. His laughter ceased. His eyes opened wide, his tongue seemed to hang out of his mouth, and he turned his head and looked back with an agony of doubt into Philip's face. Philip struggled up. Give me the brandy, Pete. He took the glass out of Pete's hand, and without a second thought, with only a smile of faith and confidence, he raised it to his lips and drank. When the doctor entered the room a moment afterwards, Pete was sobbing into the bedclothes, and Philip's hand was resting on his head. End of Part 6, Chapter 10part 6 chapter 11 of the manxman this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the manxman by sir hall kane part 6 chapter 11 early the next morning pete visited kate in prison he had something to say to her something to ask but he intended to keep back his own feelings to bear himself bravely to sustain the poor girl's courage the light was cold and ashen within the prison walls, and as he followed the sergeant into the cell, he could not help but think of Kate as he had first known her, so bright, so merry, so full of life and gaiety. He found her now doubled up on a settle by a newly kindled fire in the sergeant's own apartment. She lifted her head with a terrified look as he entered, and she saw his hollow cheeks and deep eyes and ragged beard. "'I'm not coming to trouble you,' he said. I've forgiven him, and I'm forgiving you too. You are very good, she answered nervously. Good? He gave a crack of bitter laughter. I meant to kill him. That's how good I am. And it's the same as if all the devils out of hell had been at me the night through to do it still. Maybe I hadn't much to forgive. I'm like a bat in the light. I'm not knowing where I am exactly. Dare say the people will laugh at me when they're getting to know. Wouldn't trust, but they'll think me a poor-spirited cur anyway. Let them. There's never much pity for the dog that's licked. His voice shook, although so hard and so husky. That's not what I came to say, though. You'll be leaving this place soon, and I'm wanting to ask. I'm wanting to know. She had covered her face, and now she said through her hands, Do as you like with me, Pete. You're my husband, and I must obey. He looked down at her for a moment. "'But you cannot love me? "'I have deceived you, "'and whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. "'But you cannot love me? "'I'll be a good wife for the future, Pete. "'I will indeed, indeed I will. "'But you cannot love me?' "'She began to cry. "'That's enough,' he said. "'I'll not force you. "'You are very good,' she said again. "'He laughed more bitterly than before. "'Do you think I'm wanting your body "'while another man has your heart?' That's a game I've played about long enough, I'm thinking. Good? Not me, missus. His eyes, which had been fixed on the fire, wandered to his wife, and then his lips quivered and his manner changed. I'm hard. I'll cut it short. Fact is, I've determined to do something, but I've a question to ask first. You've suffered since you left me, Kate. He has dragged you down a dale. But tell me, do you love him still? She shuddered and crept closer to the wall. Don't be freckened. It's a woman's way to love the man that's done wrong by her. Being good to her is nothing. Sarvice is nothing. Kindness is nothing. Maybe there's some ones that cry shame on her for that, but not me. Giving herself body and soul and thinking nothing what she gets for it, that's the glory of a woman when she cares for anybody. Speak up, Kate. Do you love him in spite of all? The answer came in a whisper that was like a breath. 
Yes. That'll do, said Pete. He pressed his hand against the place of his old wound. I might have known you could never care for me. I might have known that, he said with difficulty. But don't think I can't stand my rack up, as the saying is. I know my course now. I know my job. She was sobbing into her hands, and he was breathing fast and loud. One word more, only one, about the child. Little Catherine. Have I a right to her? She gasped audibly, but did not answer, and he tried a second time. Does she belong to me, Kate? Her confusion increased. He tried a third time, speaking more gently than before. If I should leave the island, Kate, could I, must I, may I take the child along with me? At that her fear got the better of her shame, and she cried, Don't take her away. Oh, don't, don't. Ah. He pressed his hand hard at his side again. But maybe that's only mother's love, and what mother... He broke off, and then began once more, in a voice so low that it was scarcely to be heard. Tell me, when the time comes, and it will come, Kate, have no fear about that. He was breaking down, he was struggling hard. When the time comes for himself and you to be together, will you be afraid to have the little one with you? Will it seem wrong, Kate? You two and little Catherine, one household, one family? No? No? No. That's enough. The words seemed to come out of the depths of his throat. I've nothing more to think about. He must think of all the rest. And you, Pete? What matter about me? Do you think there's anything worse coming? Do you think I'm caring what I ate, and what I drink, and what becomes of me? He was laughing again, and her sobs broke out afresh. God is good, he said more quietly. He'll take care of the likes of me. His motionless eyes were on the crackling fire, and he stood in the light that flashed from it with a face like stone. I've no child now, he muttered, as though speaking to himself. She slid to her knees at his feet, took the hand that hung by his side, and began to cover it with kisses. Forgive me, she said. I have been very weak and very guilty. What's the use of talking like that, he answered. What's past is past, and he drew his hand away. No child now. No child now, he muttered again, as though his despair cried out to God. He was feeling like a man wrecked in mid-ocean. A spar came floating towards him. It was all he could lay hold of from the foundering ship in which he had sailed and sung and laughed and slept. He had thought to save his life by it, but another man was clinging to it, and he had to drop it and go down. She could not look into his face again. She could not touch his hand. She could not ask for his forgiveness. He stood over her for a moment without speaking, and then, with his hollow cheeks and deep eyes and ragged beard, he went away in the morning sunlight. End of Part 6, Chapter 11「six, chapter twelve of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings were in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part six, chapter twelve. Philip fell into a deep sleep. When he awoke, he saw, as in a mirror, a solution to the tumultuous drama of his life. It was a glorious solution, a liberating and redeeming end an end bringing freedom from the bonds which had beset him. What matter if it was hard, if it was difficult, if it was bitter as Mara and steep as Calvary? He was ready, he was eager. Oh, blessed sleep! Oh, wise and soothing sleep! It had rent the dark cloud of his past and given the flash of light that illumined the path before him. He opened his eyes and saw Auntie Nan seated by his side, reading a volume of sermons. At the change in his breathing, the old dove looked round, dropped the book, and began to flutter about. "'Hush, dearest, hush!' she whispered. There was a heavy, monotonous sound, like the beating of a distant drum, or the throb of an engine under the earth. "'Auntie!' "'Yes, dearest?' "'What day is it?' "'Sunday.' "'Oh, you've had a long, long sleep, Philip. You slept all day yesterday.' "'Is that the church bell ringing?' "'Yes, dear, and a fine morning, too, so soft and spring-light. I'll open the window.' 
then my hearing must be injured. Ah, they muffle the bell, that's it. The church is so near, they said it might trouble him. A carriage was coming down the road. It rattled on the paved way. Then the rattling ceased, and there was a dull rumble as of a cart sliding onto a wooden bridge. That horse has fallen, said Philip, trying to rise. It's only the straw on the street, said Auntie Nan. The people brought it from all parts. We must deaden the traffic by the house, they said. Or oh, you couldn't think how good they've been. Yesterday was market day, but there was no business done. Couldn't have been. They were coming and going the whole day long. And how's the deemster now? And how's he now? It was fit to make you cry. I believe in my heart, Philip. Nobody in Ramsey went to bed the first night at all. Everybody waiting and waiting to see if there wasn't something to fetch, and the kettle kept boiling in every kitchen round about. But hush, dearest, hush. Not so much talking all at once. Hush now. Where is Pete? asked Philip, his face to the wall. Oiling the hinges of the door, dearest. He was laying carpets on the stairs all day yesterday, but never the sound of a hammer. The man's wonderful. He must have hands like iron. His heart's soft enough, though. But then everybody is so kind. Everybody, everybody. The doctor and the vicar and the newspapers. Oh, it's beautiful. It's just as Pete was saying. What was Pete saying, Auntie? He was saying the angels must think there's somebody sick in every house in the island. The sound of singing came through the open window, above the whisper of young leaves and the twitter of birds. It was the psalm that was being sung in church. Blessed is the man that considereth the poor and needy. The Lord shall deliver him in time of trouble. Listen, Philip, that must be a special psalm. I'm sure they're singing it for you. How sweet of them. But we are talking too much, dear. The doctor will scold. I must leave you now, Philip. Only for a little, though, while I go back to Belour, and I'll send up Cottier. Yes, send up Cottier, said Philip. My darling, said the old soul, looking down as she tied her bonnet strings. You'll lie quiet now? You're sure you'll lie quiet? Well, good-bye, good-bye. As Philip lay alone, the sore and swell of the psalm filled the room. Oh, the irony of it all! The frantic, hideous, awful irony! He was lying there, he, the guilty one, with the whole island watching at his bedside, pitying him, sorrowing for him, holding its breath until he should breathe, and she, his partner, his victim, his innocent victim, was in jail, in disgrace, in a degradation more deep than death. Still the psalm soared and swelled. He tried to bury his head in the pillows that he might not hear. Gemma Lord came in hurriedly, and Philip beckoned him close. Where is she? he whispered. They removed her to Castle Rushen late last night, Your Honour, said Jemmy, softly. Write immediately to the clerk of the roll, said Philip. Say she must be lodged on the debtor's side and have patience, diet, and every comfort. My Kate, my Kate, he kept saying. It shall not be for long, not for long, my love, not for long. The convalescence was slow, and Philip was impatient. I feel better today, doctor, he would say. Don't you think I may get out of bed? Tray de lure. Time enough, Deemster, the doctor would answer. Let us see what a few more days will do. I have a great task before me, doctor, he would say again. I must begin immediately. You have a life's work before you, Deemster, and you must begin soon, but not just yet. I have something particular to do, doctor, he said at last. I must lose no time. You must lose no time indeed. That's why you must stay where you are a little longer. One morning his impatience overcame him, and he got out of bed. But being on his feet, his head reeled, his limbs trembled, he clutched at the bedpost and had to clamber back. "'Oh, God, bear me witness. This delay is not my fault,' he murmured. Throughout the day he longed for the night, that he might close his eyes in the darkness and think of Kate. He tried to think of her as she used to be, bright, happy, winsome, full of joy, of love, of passion, dangling her feet from the apple tree, or tripping along the tree trunk in the glen, teasing him, tempting him. It was impossible.' He could only think of her in the gloom of the prison. That filled his mind with terrors. Sometimes in the dark hours his enfeebled body beset his brain with fantastic hallucinations. Calling for paper and pens, he would make show of writing a letter, producing no words or intelligible signs, but only a mass of scrawls and blotches. This he would fold and refold with great elaboration, 
and give to Gemma Lord with an air of gravity and mystery, saying in a whisper, For her. Thus night brought no solace, and the dawn found him waiting for the day, that he might open his eyes in the sunlight and think, She is better where she is. God will comfort her. A fortnight went by, and he saw nothing of Pete. At length he made a call on his courage and said, Auntie, why does Pete never come? He does, dearest. Only when you're asleep, though. He stands there in the doorway in his stockings. I nod to him, and he comes in and looks down at you. Then he goes away without a word. What is he doing now? Going to Douglas a good deal, seemingly. Indeed, they're saying, but then people are so fond of talking. What are the people saying, Auntie? It's about a divorce, dearest. Philip groaned and turned away his face. He opened his eyes one day from a doze and saw the plain face of Nancy Joe framed in a red print handkerchief. The simple creature was talking with Auntie Nan, holding counsel and making common cause with the dainty old lady as unmarried women and old maids, both of them. "'Why don't you keep your word true?' says I. "'Wasn't you saying you'd take her back?' says I. "'Whatever she'd done and whatever she was, so help you God,' says I. "'Isn't she shamed enough already, poor thing, without you going shaming her more? "'Have you no bowels at all? "'Are you only another of the gutted herrings on a stick?' says I. "'Why don't you keep your word true?' "'Because,' says he, "'I want to be even with the other one,' says he. "'And then away he went, wandering down by the tide.' It's unchristian, Nancy, said Auntie Nan, but it's human, for although he forgives the woman, he can hardly be expected to forgive the man, and he can't punish one without punishing both. Much good it'll do to punish either, says I. What for should he put up his fins now the hook's in his gizzard? But that's the way with the men still, talking and talking of love and love. But when trouble is coming, no better than a churn of sour milk on a thundery day, we're best off that never had no truck with them. I don't know what you think, Miss Christian, ma'am. They may talk about having no chances. I don't mind if they do. Do you? I had chance enough once, though. I don't know what you've had, ma'am. I had one sweetheart, anyway. A sort of a sweetheart, as you might say. But he was sweeter on the money than on me, always asking how much I had got saved in the stocking. And when he heard I had three new dresses done... Nancy, says he, we had better be putting a sight up on the parson now, before they're all worn out at you. The governor, who was still in London, wrote a letter full of tender solicitude and graceful compliment. The clerk of the rolls had arranged from the first that two telegrams should be sent to him daily, giving accounts of Philip's condition. At last the clerk came in person, and threw Auntie Nan into tremors of nervousness by his noise and robustiousness. He roared as he came along the path, roared himself through the hall, up the stairs and into the bedroom, roared again as he set eyes on Philip, protesting that the sick man was worth five hundred dead men yet, and vowing with an oath, and a tear trickling down his nose, that he would like to give time to the fools who frightened good people with bad reports. Then he cleared the room for a private consultation. Out you go, Cottier. Look slippy, man. Auntie Nan fled in terror. When she had summoned resolution to invade afresh the place of the bear that had possession of her lamb, the clerk of the rolls was rising from the foot of the bed and saying, We'll leave it at that then, Christian. These damn things will happen. But don't you bother your head about it. I'll make it all serene. Besides, it's nothing, nothing in a lifetime. I'll have to send you the summons, though. You needn't trouble about that. Just toss it into the fire. Philip's head was down, his eyes were on the counterpane, and a faint tinge of colour overspread his wasted face. Ah, you're back, Miss Christian. I must be going, though. Good-bye, old fellow. Take care of yourself. Good men are scarce. Good-bye, Miss Christian. Good-bye, all. Good-bye, Phil. God bless you. With that he went roaring down the stairs, but came thundering up again in a moment, put his head round the doorpost, and said, Lord, bless my soul. If I wasn't forgetting an important bit of news, very important news, too. It hasn't got into the papers yet, but I've had the official wrinkle. What do you think? The governor has resigned. True as gospel. Sent in his resignation to the Home Office the night before last. I saw it coming. He hasn't been at home since Tinwald. Look sharp and get better now. Goodbye. Philip got up for the first time the day following. The weather was soft and full of whispers of spring. 
The window was open, and Philip sat with his face in the direction of the sea. Auntie Nan was knitting by his side and running on with homely gossip. The familiar and genial talk was floating over the surface of his mind, as a seabird floats over the surface of the sea, sometimes reflected in it, sometimes skimming it, sometimes dipping into it and being lost. Poor Pete! The good woman here thinks he's hard. Perhaps he is, but I'm sure he is much to be pitied. Ross has behaved badly and deserves all that can come to him. He's the same to me as you are, dear, in blood, I mean, but somehow I can't be sorry. Ah, you're too tender-hearted, Philip, indeed you are. You'd find excuses for anybody. The doctor says overwork, dearest, but I say the shock of seeing that poor creature in that awful position. And what a shock you gave me, too. To tell you the truth, Philip, I thought it was a faint. Never heard of it? No? Never heard that Grandfather fainted on the bench? He did, though, and he didn't recover, either. How well I remember it. Word broke over the town like a clap of thunder. The deemster has fallen in the courthouse. Father heard it up at Belour, and ran down bareheaded. Grandfather's carriage was at the courthouse door, and they brought him up to Ballawane. I remember I was coming downstairs when I saw the carriage draw up at the gate. The next minute your father, with his wild eyes and his bare head, was lifting something out of the inside. Poor Tom! He had never set foot in the house since Grandfather had driven him out of it, and little did Grandfather think in whose arms he was to travel the last stage of his life's journey. Philip had fallen asleep. Gemma Lord entered with a letter. It was in a large envelope and had come by the insular post. Shall I open it? thought Auntie Nan. She had been opening and replying to Philip's letters during the time of his illness, but this one bore an official seal, and so she hesitated. Shall I, she thought, with the knitting needle to her lip? I will. I may save him some worry. She fixed her glasses and drew out the letter. It was a summons from the Chancery Division of the High Court of Justice, a petition for divorce. The petitioner's name was Peter Quilliam. The respondent? The co-respondent. As Philip awoke from his doze, with the salt breath of the sea in his nostrils and the songs of spring in his ears, Auntie Nan was fumbling with the paper to get it back into the envelope. Her hands trembled, and when she spoke her voice quivered. Philip saw in a moment what had happened. She had stumbled into the pit where the secret of his life lay buried. The doctor came in at that instant. He looked attentively at Auntie Nan and said significantly, "'You have been nursing too long, Miss Christian. "'You must go home for a while.' "'I will go home at once,' she faltered, "'in a feeble inward voice. "'Philip's head was on his breast. "'Such was the first step on the calvary "'he intended to ascend. "'Oh, God, help him! "'God, support him! "'God, bear up his sinking feet "'that he might not fall from weakness "'or fear or shame.'" End of Part 6, Chapter 12《パート6 Chapter 13 of the Manxman》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Manxman》by Sir Hall Cain, Part 6 Chapter 13 Caesar visited Kate at Castle Rushen. He found her lodged in a large and light apartment, once the dining room of the Lords of Man, indulged with every comfort and short of nothing but her liberty. As the turnkey pulled the door behind him, Caesar lifted both hands and cried, The Lord is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in trouble. Then he inquired if Pete had been there before him, and being answered no, he said, The children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. After that he fell to the praise of the deemster, who had not only given Kate these mercies, comfortable to her carnal body, if dangerous to her soul, but had striven to lighten the burden of her people at the time when he had circulated the report of her death, knowing she was dead indeed, dead in trespasses and sins, and choosing rather that they should mourn her as one who was already dead in fact, and feel shame for her as one that was yet alive in iniquity. Finally he dropped his handkerchief on to the slate floor, went down on one knee by the side of his tall hat, and called on her in prayer to cast in her lot afresh with the people of God. May her lightness be rebuked, O Lord, he cried. 
Give her to know that until she repents she hath no place among the children. And, Lord, succour thy servant in his hour of tribulation. Let him be well girt up with Christian armour. Help him to cry aloud amid his tears and his lamentations. Though my heart and hers should break, thy name shall not be dishonoured, my Lord and my God. Rising from his knee and dusting it, Caesar took up his tall hat and left Kate as he had found her, crouching by the fire inside the wide ingle of the old hall, covering her face and saying nothing. He was in this mood of spiritual exaltation as he descended the steps into the keep, and came upon a man in the dress of a prisoner sweeping with a besom. It was Black Tom. Caesar stopped in front of him, moved his lips, lifted his face to the sky, shut both eyes, then opened them again, and said in a voice of deep sorrow, "'Oh, Thomas, Thomas Quilliam, I'm taking grief to see thee, man, an old friend whose hand has rested in my hand, and swilling the floor of a prison.' Well, I warn thee often, but thou wast ever stony ground, Thomas, and now thou must see for thyself whether I was right, that honesty is the best policy. Look at thee, and look at me. The Lord has delivered me, and prospered me even in temporal things. I have lands, and I have houses. And what hast thou thyself? Nothing but thy conscience and thy disgrace. Even thy very clothes they have taken away from thee, and they would take thy hair itself if thou had any. Black Tom stood with feet flatly planted apart, rested himself on the shank of his besom, and said, Don't be playing cumag, shindy with me, Mr. Holy Ghoster. It isn't honesty that's making the difference between us at all, it's luck. You've won and I've lost. You've succeeded and I've failed. You're wearing your chapel hat and I'm in this bit of a saucepan lid. But you're only a regular old Pharisee anyway. Caesar waved his hand. I can't take the anger with thee, Thomas, he said, backing himself out. I thought the devil had been chained since our last camp meeting, but I was wrong, seemingly. He goeth about still like a raging lion, seeking whom he may devour. Don't be trying to knock me down with your texas, said Thomas, shouldering his bosom. Any cock can crow on his own midden. You can't help it, Thomas, said Caesar, edging away. It isn't my old friend that's blaspheming at all. It's the devil that has entered into his heart and is rending him. But cast the devil out, man, or hell will be thy portion. I was there last night in my dreams, Caesar, said Black Tom, following him up. Oh, Lord Devil, let me in, says I. Where'd ye come from, says he? The Isle of Man, says I. I'm not taking any more from there till my bishop comes, says he. Who's that, says I? Bishop Caesar, the publican, who else, says he? I marvel at thee, Thomas, said Caesar, half through the small door of the portcullis. But the sons of Belial have to fight hard for his throne. I'll pray for thee, though, that it be not remembered against thee, when, God willing, there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That night Caesar visited the deemster at Elm Cottage. His eyes glittered, and there was a look of frenzy in his face. He was still in his mood of spiritual pride and when he spoke it was always with the these and the thous and in the high pitch of the preacher. The Balawain is dead, your honour, he cried. They wouldn't have me tell thee before because of thy body's weakness, but now they suffer it. Groanings and moanings and sterics of torment. Terrible, sir, terrible. Took a notion he would have water poured out for him at the last. It couldn't wash him clean, though, and shouting with his dying voice, I've sinned, O God, I've sinned. Oh, I delivered my soul, sir. He can clear me of that anyway. Lay hold of a free salvation, says I. I've not lived a right life, says he. Truth enough, says I. You've lived a life of carnal freedom, but now is the appointed time. Say, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Too late, Mr. Cregeen, too late, says he, and the word was scarce out of his mouth when he was key-cold in a minute, and gone into the night of all flesh that's lost. Well, it was his own son that killed him, sir, robbed him of every silver sixpence and ruined him. The last mortgage he raised was to keep the young man out of prison for forgery. Bad, sir, bad. To indulge a child to its own damnation is bad. A human infirmity, though, and I'm feeling for the poor sinner myself being tempted, that is to say inclined, but thank the Lord for his strengthening arm. Is he buried, asked Philip? Buried enough, and a poor funeral too, sir, said Caesar, walking the room with a proud step, 
the legs straightened, the toes conspicuously turned out. Driving rain and sleet, sir, the wind in the trees, the grass wet to your calf, and the parson in his white smock under the umbrella. Nobody there to speak of, neither. Only myself and the tenants, mostly. Where was Ross? Gone, sir, without waiting to see his foolish old father pushed under the sod. Well, there was not much to wait for, neither. The young man has been a besom of fire and burnt up everything. Not so much left as would buy a rope to hang him. And Ballawain is mine, sir, mine in a way of speaking, my son-in-law's anyway, and he has given me the right to have and to hold it. Oh, a Sabbath time, sir, a Sabbath time. I made up my mind to have it the night the man struck me in my own house in Sulby. He betrayed my daughter at last, sir, and took her from her home, and then her husband lent six thousand pounds on mortgage. Do what you like with it, said he, and I said to myself, The man shall starve. He shall be a beggar. He shall have neither bread to eat, nor water to drink, nor a roof to cover him. And the moment the breath was out of the old man's body, I foreclosed. Philip was trembling from head to foot. Do you mean, he faltered, that that was your reason? It is the Lord's hand on a rascal, said Caesar, and proud am I to be the instrument of his vengeance. God moves in a mysterious way, sir. Oh, the Lord is opening his word more and more, and I have more to tell thee, too. Ballawain would belong to thyself, sir, if every one had his rights. It was thy grandfather's inheritance, and it should have been thy father's, and it ought to be thine. Take it, sir, take it on thy own terms. It is worth a matter of twelve thousand, but thou shalt have it for nine, and pay for it when the Lord gives thee substance. Thou hast been good to me and to mine, and especially to the poor lost lamb who lies in the castle to-night in her shame and disgrace. Little did I think I should ever repay thee, though. But it is the Lord's doings. It is marvellous in our eyes, deep in unfathomable minds. Caesar was pacing the room and speaking in tones of rapture. Philip, who was sitting at the table, rose from it with a look of fear. Frightful, frightful, he muttered. A mistake, a mistake. The Lord makes no mistake, sir, cried Caesar. But what if it was not Ross, began Philip. Caesar paid no heed. What if it was not Ross? Caesar glanced over his shoulder. What if it was someone else? said Philip. Caesar stopped in front of him. Someone you have never thought of, someone you have respected and even held in honour. Who then? said Caesar huskily. Mr. Cregeen, said Philip, it is hard for me to speak. I had not intended to speak yet, but I should hold myself in horror if I were silent now. You have been living in awful error. Whatever the cost, whatever the consequences, you must not remain in that error a moment longer. It was not Ross who took away your daughter. Who was it? cried Caesar. His voice had the sound of a cracked bell. Philip struggled hard. He tried to confess. His eyes wandered about the walls. As you have cherished a mistaken resentment, he faltered, so you have nourished a mistaken gratitude. Who? Who? cried Caesar, looking fixedly into Philip's face. Philip's rigid fingers were crawling over the papers on the table like the claws of crabs. They touched the summons from the Chancery Court, and he picked it up. Read this, he said, and held it out to Caesar. Caesar took it, but continued to look at Philip with eyes that were threatening in their wildness. Philip felt that in a moment their positions had been changed. He was the judge no longer, but only a criminal at the bar of this old man, this grim fanatic, half mad already with religious mania. The Lord of hosts is mighty, muttered Caesar, and then Philip heard the paper crinkle in his hand. Caesar was feeling for his spectacles. When he had liberated them from the sheath, he put them on the bridge of his nose upside down. With the two glasses against the wrinkles of his forehead and his eyes still uncovered, he held the paper at arm's length and tried to read it. Then he took out his red print handkerchief to dust the spectacles. Fumbling spectacles and sheath and handkerchief and paper in his trembling hands together, he muttered again in a quavering voice, as if to fortify himself against what he was to see. The Lord of hosts is mighty. He read the paper at length, and there was no mistaking it. Quilliam versus Quilliam and Christian, Philip. He laid the summons on the table and returned his spectacles to their sheath. His breathing made noises in his nostrils. Uch, Charney! 
Woe is me, he muttered. Uch chani, uch chani. Then he looked helplessly around and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The vengeance that he had built up day by day had fallen in a moment into ruins. His hypocrisy was stripped naked. I see how it is, he said in a hoarse voice. The Lord has to save me, to punish me. It is the public house. He cannot serve God and mammon. What's gained on the devil's back is lost under his belly. I thought I was a child of God, but the deceitfulness of riches has choked the word. Uch chani, uch chani. My prosperity has been like the quails, only given with the intent of choking me. Uch chani. His spiritual pride was broken down. The Almighty had refused to be made a tool of. He took up his hat and rolled his arm over it the wrong way of the nap. Halfway to the door he paused. Well, I'll be laving you. Good day, sir, he said, nodding his head slowly. The Lord's been knowing what you were all the time, seemingly. But what's the use of his knowing? He never tells on nobody. And I've been calling on sinners to flee from the wrath, and he's been letting the devils make a mock at myself. Uch chani, uch chani. Philip had slipped back in his chair, and his head had fallen forward on the table. He heard the old man go out. He heard his heavy step drop slowly down the stairs. He heard his foot dragging on the path outside. Och, chani, och, chani, the word rang in his heart like a knell. Gemma Lord, who had been out in the town, came back in great excitement. Such news, Your Honour, such splendid news. What is it, said Philip, without lifting his head? They're signing petitions all over the island, asking the Queen to make you governor. God in heaven, said Philip, that would be frightful. End of Part 6, Chapter 13「six, chapter fourteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain. Part six, chapter fourteen. When Philip was fit to go out, they brought up a carriage and drove him round the bay. The town had awakened from its winter sleep, and the harbour was a busy and cheerful scene. More than a hundred men had come from their crofts in the country, and were making their boats ready for the mackerel fishing at Kinsale. There was a forest of masts where the flat hulls had been, the taffrails and companions were touched up with paint, and the newly barked nets were being hauled over the quay. "'Good morning, Dempster,' cried the men. They all saluted him, and some of them, after their manx fashion, drew up at the carriage door, lifted their caps with their tarry hands, and said, "'Taking joy to see you out again, Dempster. "'When a man's getting over an attack like that, "'it's middling clear the Lord's got work for him.' "'Philip answered with smiles and bows and cheerful words, "'but the kindness oppressed him. "'He was thinking of Kate. "'She was the victim of his success. "'For all that he received she had paid the penalty. "'He thought of her dreams, her golden dreams, "'her dreams of going up side by side "'and hand in hand with the man she loved. "'Oh, my love, my love,' he murmured. Only a little longer. The doctor was waiting for him when he reached home. I have something to say to you, Deemster, he said, with averted face. It's about your aunt. Is she ill, said Philip, very ill, but I've inquired daily. By her express desire the truth has been kept back from you. The carriage is still at the door, began Philip. I've never seen anyone sink so rapidly. She's all nerve. No doubt the nursing exhausted her. It's not that. I'll go up immediately. She was to expect you at five. I cannot wait, said Philip, and in a moment he was on the road. Oh, God, he thought, how steep is the path I have to tread. On getting to Balour, he pushed through the hall and stepped upstairs. At the door of Auntie Nan's bedroom, he was met by Martha, the housemaid, now the nurse. She looked surprised and made some nervous show of shutting him out. Before she could do so, he was already in the room. The air was heavy with the smell of medicines and vinegar and the odours of sick life. Hush, said Martha, with a movement of lips and eyebrows. Auntie Nan was asleep in a half-sitting position on the bed. It was a shock to see the change in her. Her beautiful old face was white and drawn with pain. The chin was hanging heavily. 
The eyes were half open. There was no cap on her head. Her hair was straggling loosely and was dull as tow. She must be very ill, said Philip under his breath. Very, said Martha. She wasn't expecting you until five, sir. Has the doctor told her? Does she know? Yes, sir, but she doesn't mind that. She knows she's dying and is quite resigned, quite, and quite cheerful. But she fears if you knew. Hush! There was a movement on the bed. She'll be shocked if she, and she's not ready to receive. In here, sir, whispered Martha, and she motioned to the back of a screen that stood between the door and the bed. There was a deep sigh, a sound as of the moistening of dry lips, and then the voice of Auntie Nan, not her own familiar voice, but a sort of vanishing echo of it. What is the time, Martha? Twenty minutes wanting five, ma'am. So late. It wasn't nice of you to let me sleep so long, Martha. I'm expecting the governor at five. What a mercy he hasn't come earlier. It wouldn't be right to keep him waiting, and then... Bring me the sponge, girl. Moisten it first. Now the towel. The comb next. That's better. How lifeless my hair is, though. Oil, you say? I wonder. I've never used it in my life. But at a time like this... Well, just a little, then. There, that will do. Bring me a cap, the one with the pink bow in it. My face is so pale, it will give me a little colour. That will do. You couldn't tell I had been ill, could you? Not very ill, anyway. Now side everything away. The medicines, too. Put them in the cupboard. So many bottles. How ill she must have been, he would say. And now open the drawer on the left, Martha, the one with the key in it, and bring me the paper on the top. Yes, the white paper. The folded one with the endorsement. Endorsement means writing on the back, Martha. Ah, I've lived all my life among lawyers. Lay it on the counterpane. The keys? Lay them beside it. Yes, there, lower, though, deeper still, that's right. Now set a chair so that he can sit beside me. This side of the bed. No, this side. Then the light will be on him, and I will be able to see his face. My eyes are not so good as they were, you know. A little farther back. Not quite so much, neither. That will do. Ah. There was a long breath of satisfaction, and then Auntie Nan said, I suppose it's... What time is it now, Martha? Ten minutes wanting five, ma'am. Did you tell Jane about the cutlets? He likes them with bread crumbs, you know. I hope she won't forget to say, Your Excellency. I shall hear his voice the moment he comes into the hall. My ears are no worse if my eyes are. Perhaps he won't speak, though. She's been so ill, he'll think. Martha, I think you had better open the door. Jane is so forgetful. She might say things, too. If he asks, How is she today, Martha? You must answer quite brightly. Better today, Your Excellency. There was an exclamation of pain. Oh, 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 blessed Lord Jesus. Are you sure you are well enough, ma'am? Hadn't I better tell him? No, I'll be worse tomorrow, and the next day worse still. Give me a dose of medicine, Martha, the morning medicine, the one that makes me cheerful. Thank you, Martha. If I feel the pain when he is here, I'll bear it as long as I can, and then I'll say, I'm finding myself drowsy, Philip. You had better go and lie down. Will you understand that, Martha? Yes, ma'am, said Martha. I'm afraid we must be a little deceitful, Martha, but we can't help that, can we? You see, he has to be installed yet, and that is always a great excitement. If he thought I was very ill now, very, very ill, you know, yes, I really think he would wish to postpone it, and I wouldn't have that for worlds and worlds. He has always been so fond of his old auntie. Well, it's the way with these boys. I dare say people wonder why he has never married, being so great and so prosperous. That was for my sake. He knew I should... Philip was breathing heavily. Auntie Nan listened. I'm sure there's somebody in the hall, Martha. Is it? Yes, it's... Go down to him, quick. Yes, ma'am, said Martha, making a noise with the screen to cover Philip's escape on tiptoe. Then she came to him on the landing, wiping her eyes with her apron and pretended to lead Philip back to the room. "'My boy, my boy!' cried Auntie Nan, and she folded him in her arms. The transformation was wonderful. She had a look of youth now, almost a look of gaiety. "'I've heard the great, great news,' she whispered, taking his hand. "'That's only a rumour, Auntie,' said Philip. "'Are you better?' "'Oh, but it will come true. Yes, yes, I'm better. I'm sure it will come true. And, dear heart, what a triumph!' I dreamt it all the night before I heard of it. You were on top of the tinwald, and there was a great crowd. 
but come and sit down and tell me everything. So you are better yourself? Quite strong again, dear? Oh, yes, anywhere, Philip, sit anywhere. Here, this chair will do, this one by my side. Ah, how well you look. She was carried away by her own gaiety. Leaning back on the pillow, but still keeping his hand in hers, she said, Do you know, Philip Christian, who is the happiest person in the world? I'm sure you don't, for all you're so clever. So I'll tell you. Perhaps you think it's a beautiful young wife just married to a husband who worships her. Well, you're quite, quite wrong, sir. It's an old, old lady, very, very old and very feeble, just tottering on and not expecting to live a great while longer but with her sons about her, grown up and big and strong, and having all the world before them. That's the happiest person on earth. And I'm the next thing to it, for my boy, my own boy's boy. She broke off, and then with a far-off look she said, I wonder will he think I've done my duty? Who, asked Philip? Your father, she answered. Then she turned to the maid and said quite gaily, You needn't wait, Martha. His Excellency will call you when I want my medicine. "'Won't you, Your Excellency?' Philip could not find it in his heart to correct her again. The girl left the room. Auntie Nan glanced at the closing door, then reached over to Philip with an air of great mystery and whispered, "'You mustn't be shocked, Philip, or surprised, or fancy I'm very ill, or that I'm going to die. But what do you think I've done?' "'Nay, hey, what?' "'I've made my will. Is that very terrible?' "'You've done right, Auntie,' said Philip. "'Yes, the high bailiff has been up, and everything is in order, every little thing. See?' And she lifted the paper that the maid had laid on the counterpane. "'Let me tell you.' She nodded her head as she ran over the items. "'Some little legacies first, you know. There's Martha, such a good girl. I've left her my silk dresses. Then old Mary, the housemaid at Ballowane. Poor old thing. She's been down with rheumatism three years, and flock beds get so lumpy. I've left her my feather one.' I thought at first I should like you to have my little income. Do you know your old auntie is quite an old miser? I've grown so fond of my little money, and it seems so sweet to think. But then you don't want it now, Philip. It would be nothing to you, would it? I've been thinking, though. Now, what do you think I've been thinking of doing with my little fortune? Philip stroked the wrinkled fingers with his other hand. What's right, I'm sure, auntie? What is it? You would never guess. No? I've been thinking, with sudden gravity. Philip, there's nobody in the world so unhappy as a poor gentlewoman who has slipped and fallen. Then this one's father, he has turned his back on her, they're telling me, and of course she can't expect anything from her husband. I've been thinking now. Yes, said Philip, with his eyes down. To tell you the truth, I've been thinking it would be so nice, and then, nervously, faltering, in a quavering voice, with many excuses, out came the great secret, the mighty strategy. Auntie Nan had willed her fortune to Kate. "'You're an angel, Auntie,' said Philip in a thick voice. But he saw through her artifice. She was talking of Kate, but she was thinking of himself. She was trying to relieve him of an embarrassment, to remove an impediment that lay in his path, to liberate his conscience, to cover up his fault, to conceal everything. "'And then this house, dear,' said Auntie Nan, "'it's yours, but you'll never want it. It's been a dear little harbour of refuge, but the storm is over now. Would you? Do you see any objection? Perhaps you might. Could you not let the poor soul come and live here with the little one, after I, when all is over, I mean, and she is, eh? Philip could not speak. He took the wrinkled hand and drew it up to his lips. The old soul was beside herself with joy. Then you're sure I've done right? Quite sure? Lock it up in the drawer again, dearest, the top one on the left. Oh, the keys? Dear me, yes. Where are the keys? How tiresome. I remember now. They're at the back of my pillow. Will you call Martha? Or perhaps you would yourself. Will you? Very artfully. You don't mind, then? Yes, that's it. More this way, though. A little more. Ah, my boy, my boy. The old dove's second strategy had succeeded also. In fumbling behind her pillow for the keys, Philip had to put his arms about her again and she was kissing him on the forehead and on the cheeks. Then came a spasm of pain. It dragged at her features, but her smile struggled through it. She fetched a difficult breath and said, And now, dear, I'm finding myself a little drowsy. How selfish of me. 
Your cutlets, brown, nicely browned, breadcrumbs, you know. Philip fled from the room and summoned Martha. He wandered aimlessly about the house for hours that night. At one moment he found himself in the blue room, Auntie Nan's workroom, so full of her familiar things, the spinning wheel, the frame of the sampler, the old-fashioned piano, the scent of lavender, all the little evidences of her presence, so dainty, so orderly, so sweet. A lamp was burning for the convenience of the doctor, but there was no fire. The doctor came again towards ten o'clock. There was nothing to be done, nothing to be hoped. Still she might live until morning, if... At midnight Philip crept noiselessly to the bedroom. The condition was unaltered. He was going to lie down, but wished to be awakened if there was any change. It was long before he dropped off, and he seemed to have slept only a moment when there was a knocking at his door. He heard it while he was still sleeping. The dawn had broken, the streamers of the sun were rising out of the sea. A sparrow in the garden was hacking the air with its monotonous chirp. Auntie Nan was far spent, yet the dragging expression of pain was gone and a serenity almost angelic overspread her face. When she recognized Philip, she felt for his hand, guided it to her heart, and kept it there. Only a few words did she speak, for her breath was short. She commended her soul to God. Then, with a look of pallid sunshine, she beckoned to Philip. He stooped his ear to her lips, and she whispered, Hush, dearest, never tell anyone, for nobody ever knew, ever dreamt, but I loved your father and God gave him to me and you. The dear old dove had delivered herself of her last great secret. Philip put his lips to her cheek, iced already over the damps and chills of death. Then the eyes closed, the sweet old head slid back, the lips changed their colour, but still lay open as with a smile. Thus died Auntie Nan, peacefully, hopefully, trustfully, almost joyfully, in the fullness of her love and of her pride. Oh, God, thought Philip, let me go on with my task. Give me strength to withstand the temptation of love like this. Her love had tempted him all his life. His father had been twenty years dead, but she had kept his spirit alive, his aims, his ambitions, his fears, and the lessons of his life. There lay the beginnings of his ruin, his degradation, and the first cause of his deep duplicity. He had recovered everything that had been lost. He had gained all that his little world could give. And what was the worth of it? What was the price he had paid for it? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Philip put his lips to the cold forehead. Sweet soul, forgive me. God strengthen me. Let me not fail at this last moment. End of Part 6 Chapter 14《Part Six, Chapter Fifteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part Six, Chapter Fifteen. Philip did not go back to Elm Cottage. He buried Auntie Nan at the foot of his father's grave. There was no room at either side, his mother's sunken grave being on the left, and the railed tomb of his grandfather on the right. They had to remove a willow two feet nearer to the path. When all was over he returned home alone, and spent the afternoon in gathering up Auntie Nan's personal belongings, labelling some of them and locking them up in the blue room. The weather had been troubled for some days, spots had been seen on the sun, there were magnetic disturbances, and on the night before the aurora had pulsed in the northern sky. When the sun was near to sinking, there was a brilliant lower sky to the west, with a bank of rolling cloud above it like a thick thatched roof, and a shaft of golden light dipping down into the sea, as if an angel had opened a door in heaven. After the sun had gone, a fiery red bar stretched across the sky, and there were low rumblings of thunder. Pausing in his work to look out on the beach, Philip saw a man riding hard on horseback. It was a messenger from government offices. He drew up at the gate. A moment later the messenger was in Philip's room handing him a letter. If anybody had seen the deemster as he took that letter, he must have thought it his death warrant. A deadly pallor came to his face when he broke the seal of the envelope and drew out the contents. 
It was a commission from the Home Office. Philip was appointed Governor of the Isle of Man. My punishment, my punishment, he thought. The higher he rose, the lower he had to fall. It was a cruel kindness, a painful distinction, an awful penalty. Truly the steps of this Calvary were steep. Would he ever ascend it? The messenger was bowing and smirking before him. Thousand congratulations, Your Excellency. Thank you, my lad. Go downstairs. They'll give you something to eat. A moment later, Gemma Lord came into the room on some pretense and hopped about like a bird. Yes, Your Excellency. No, Your Excellency. Quite so, Your Excellency. Martha came next and met Philip on the landing with a courageous smile and a curtsy. And the whole house, lately so dark and sad, seemed to lighten and to laugh, as when, after a sleepless night, you look, and lo, the daylight is on the blind. You listen, and the birds are twittering in their cages below the stairs. She will hear it too, thought Philip. He wrote her two lines of a letter, the first that he had penned since his illness. Keep up heart, dear, I will be with you soon. This, without signature or superscription, he put into an envelope and addressed. Then he went out and posted it himself. There was lightning as he returned. He felt as if he would like to wander away, down to Port Moor, and round by the caves and under the cliffs, where the seabirds scream. End of Part 6, Chapter 15「six, Chapter Sixteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part Six, Chapter Sixteen. The night had fallen, and he was sitting in his room when there was a clamour of loud voices in the hall. Someone was calling for the deemster. It was Nancy Joe. She was newly returned from Sulby. Something had happened to Caesar, and nobody could control him. "'Go to him, Your Honour,' she cried from the doorway. "'It's only yourself that has power with him, and we don't know in the world what's doing on the man. He's got a ram's horn at him, and he's going blowing round the house like the mischief, calling on the Lord to bring it down, and saying it's the walls of Jericho.' Philip sent for a carriage, and set off for Sulby immediately. The storm had increased by this time. Loud peals of thunder echoed in the hills. Forks of lightning licked the trunks of the trees and ran like serpents along the branches. As they were going by the church at Lozere, the coachman reached over from the box and said, "'There's something going down over yonder, sir. See?' A bright gleam lit up the dark sky in the direction they were taking. At the turn of the road by the ginger, somebody passed them running. "'What's yonder?' called the coachman. And the voice out of the darkness answered him. "'The fairy is struck by lightning, and Caesar's gone mad.' It was the fact. While Caesar and his mania had been blowing his ram's horn around his public house under the delusion that it was Jericho, the lightning had struck it. The fire was past all hope of subduing. A great hole had been burnt into the roof, and the flames were leaping through it as through a funnel. All Sulby seemed to be on the spot. Some were dragging furniture out of the burning house. Others were running with buckets to the river and throwing water on the blazing thatch. But encircling everything was the figure of a man going round and round with great plunging strides, over the road, across the river, and through the mill-pond behind, blowing a horn in fierce, unearthly blasts, and crying in a voice of triumph and mockery, first to this worker and then to that, No use, I tell thee, thou can never put it out. It's far from heaven. Didn't I say I'd bring it down? It was Caesar. His eyes glittered, his mouth worked convulsively, and his cheeks were as black with the flying soot as the collie of the pot. When he saw Philip, he came up to him with a terrible smile on his fierce black face, and pointing to the house, he cried above the babble of voices, the roar of the thunder and crackle of the fire. An unclean spirit lived in it, sir. It has been tormenting me these ten years. He seemed to listen and to hear something. That's it roaring, he cried, and then he laughed with wild delight. "'Compose yourself, Mr. Cregeen,' said Philip, and he tried to take him by the arm. But Caesar broke away, blew a terrific blast on his ram's horn, and went striding round the house again. When he came back the next time there was a deep roll of thunder in the air, and he said, 
It's the Ballawain. He had the stone five years, and he used to groan so. Again Philip entreated him to compose himself. It was useless. Round and round the burning house he went, blowing his horn, and calling on the workers to stop their ungodly labour, for the Lord had told him to blow down the walls of Jericho, and he had burnt them down instead. The people began to be afraid of his frenzy. They'll have to put the man in the castle, said one, or have him chained up in an outhouse, said another. They kept the Kirk Morgul lunatic fifteen years on the straw in the gable loft, and his children in the house grew up to be men and women. It's the girl that's doing on Caesar. Shame on the daughters that bring ruin to their old fathers. Still Caesar went careering round the fire, blowing his ram's horn and crying, No use, it's the Lord God. The more the fire blazed, the more it resisted the efforts of the people to subdue it. The more fierce and unearthly were Caesar's blasts, and the more triumphant his cries. At last Granny stepped out and stopped him. Come home, father, she whimpered. He looked at her with bewildered eyes. Then he looked at the burning house, and he seemed to recover himself in a moment. Come home, Boch, said Granny tenderly. I've got no home, said Caesar in a helpless way. And I've got no money. The fire has taken all. No matter, father, said Granny. We had nothing when we began. We'll begin again. Then Caesar fell to mumbling texts of scripture, and Granny to soothing him after her simple fashion. My soul is passing through deep waters. I am feeble and sore broken. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire, where there is no standing. Oh, no, Caesar, we're on the road now. It's dry enough here, anyway. Many bulls have compassed me. Great bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. Never mind the lion and the unicorn, father, but come and we'll change thy wet trousers. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Oh, yes, we'll wash thee enough when we get to Ramsey. Come then, Boch. He had dropped his ram's horn somewhere, and she took him by the hand. Then he suffered himself to be led away, and the two old children went off into the darkness. End of Part 6, Chapter 16「six chapter seventeen of the Manxman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain, Part six, chapter seventeen. There was a letter waiting for Philip at home. It was from the clerk of the rolls. Only a few lines scribbled on the back of a draft deposition telling him the petition for divorce had been heard that day within closed doors. The application had been granted, and all was settled and comfortable. "'I don't want to hurt your already much wounded feelings, Christian,' wrote the clerk of the rolls, "'or to add anything to your responsibility when you come to make provision for the woman. But I must say she has given up for your sake a deuced good honest fellow.' "'I know it,' said Philip aloud." When I told him that all was over, and that his erring wife would trouble him no more, I thought he was going to burst out crying. But Philip had no time yet to think of Pete. All his heart was with Kate. She would receive the official intimation of the divorce, and it would fall on her in her prison like a blow. She would think of herself, with all the world against her, and of him with all the world at his feet. He wanted to run to her, to pluck her up in his arms, to kiss her on the lips and say, Mine, mine at last. His wife, her husband, all forgiven, all forgotten. Philip spent the rest of the night in writing a letter to Kate. He told her he could not live without her, that now for the first time she was his, and he was hers, and they were one, that their love was reborn, and that he would spend the future in atoning for the wrongs he had inflicted upon her in the past. Then he dropped to the sheer babble of affection and poured out his heart to her, all the babydom of love, the foolish prattle, the tender nonsense. What matter that he was governor now, and the first man in the island? He forgot all about it. What matter that he was writing to a fallen woman in prison? He only remembered it to forget himself the more. 
Just a little longer, my love, just a little longer. I am coming to you, I am coming. Older, perhaps, perhaps sadder, and a boy no more, but hopeful still, and ready to face whatever fate befall with her I love beside me. Next day, Gemma Lord took this letter to Castle Rushen and brought back an answer. It was one line only. My darling, at last, at last. Oh, Philip, Philip, but what about our child? End of Part 6, Chapter 17《Six, Chapter Eighteen of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. Part Six, Chapter Eighteen. The proclamation of Philip's appointment as governor of the Isle of Man had been read in the churches and nailed up on the doors of the courthouses and the clerk of the rolls was pushing on the arrangements for the installation. Let it be on the Tuesday of Easter week, he wrote, and of course at Castle Rushen. The retiring governor is ready to return for that day to deliver up his seals of office and to receive your commission. P.S. Private. And if you think that soft-voiced girl has been long enough at Her Majesty's pleasure, I will release her. Not that she is taking any harm at all, but we had better get these little accounts squared off before your great day comes. Meantime, you may wish to provide for her future. Be liberal, Christian. You can afford to treat her liberally. But what am I saying? Don't I know that you will be ridiculously over-generous? Philip answered this letter promptly. The Tuesday of Easter week will do as well as any other day. As to the lady, let her stay where she is until the morning of the ceremony, when I will myself settle everything. Philip's correspondence was now plentiful, and he had enough work to cope with it. The four towns of the island vied with each other in efforts to show him honour. Douglas, as the scene of his career, wished to entertain him at a banquet. Ramsay, as his birthplace, wanted to follow him in procession. He declined all invitations. "'I'm in mourning,' he wrote, "'and besides, I'm not well.' "'Ah, no,' he thought, "'nobody shall reproach me when the time comes.' There was no pause, no pity, no relenting rest in the world's kindness. It began to take shapes of almost fiendish cruelty in his mind, as if the devil's own laughter was behind it. He inquired about Pete. Hardly anybody knew anything. Hardly anybody cared. The spendthrift had come down to his last shilling and sold up the remainder of his furniture. The broker was to empty the house on Easter Tuesday. That was all. Not a word about the divorce. The poor neglected victim, forgotten in the turmoil of his wrongdoer's glory, had that last strength of a strong man, the strength to be silent and to forgive. Philip asked about the child. She was still at Elm Cottage, in the care of the woman with the upturned nose and the shrill voice. Every night he devised plans for getting possession of Kate's little one, and every morning he abandoned them, as difficult or cruel or likely to be spurned. On Easter Monday he was busy in his room at Belour, with a mounted messenger riding constantly between his gate and government offices. He had spent the morning on two important letters. Both were to the Home Secretary. One was sealed with his seal as Deemster. The other was written on the official paper of Government House. He was instructing the messenger to register these letters when, through the open door, he heard a formidable voice in the hall. It was Pete's voice. A moment afterwards, Gemma Lord came up with a startled face. "'He's here himself, Your Excellency. Whatever am I to do with him?' "'Bring him up,' said Philip. Jem began to stammer. "'But, but, and then the bishop may be here any minute. Ask the bishop to wait in the room below.' Pete was heard coming upstairs. "'Aisy all, aisy. Stoop your little head, Boch. That's the ticket.' Philip had not spoken to Pete since the night of the drinking of the brandy and water in the bedroom. He could not help it. His hand shook. There would be a painful scene. Stoop again, darling. There you are. And then Pete was in the room. He was carrying the child on one shoulder. They were both in their best clothes. Pete looked older and somewhat thinner. The tan of his cheeks was fretted out in pale patches under the eyes, which were nevertheless bright. He had the face of a man who had fought a brave fight with life and been beaten, yet bore the world no grudge. 
Jim and Lord and the messenger were gone from the room in a moment, and the door was closed. What do you think of that, Phil? Isn't she a little beauty? Pete was dancing the child on his knee, and looking sideways down at it with eyes of rapture. She's as sweet as an angel, said Philip in a low tone. Isn't she now, said Pete, and then he rattled on as if he were the happiest man alive. You've been wanting something like this yourself this long time, Phil. Deed you have, though. It would be diverting you wonderful. Terrible the fun there is in babies. Talk about play-actors. They're only funeral mutes where babies come. Pretending this and pretending that, it's mortal amusing they are. You'd be getting up from your books, tired, shocking, and ready for a bit of fun, and going to the stairhead and shouting down, Where's my little woman? And up she'd be coming, step by step, holding on to the banisters, dot and carry one, and my gracious, the dust there'd be in the study. You down on the carpet on all fours, and the little ones straddle across your back and slipping down to your neck, same for all the world as the man in the picture with the world atop of his shoulders, and your own little world will be up there too, laughing and crowing mortal. And then at night, Phil, at night, getting up from your summonses and your warranties, and going creeping to the little one's room, tippy-toe, tippy-toe, and is she sleeping comfortably, thinks you? and listening at the crack of the door, and hearing her breathing, and slipping in to look, and everything quiet, and the red fire on her little face, and God bless her, the darling, says you, and then back to your desk content. Oh, you'll have to be having a little one of your own one of these days, Phil. He has come to say something, thought Philip. The child wriggled off Pete's knee and began to creep about the floor. Philip tried to command himself and to talk easily. "'And how have you been yourself, Pete?' he asked. "'Well,' said Pete, meddling with his hair, "'only middling somehow.' "'He looked down at the carpet and faltered. "'You'll be wondering at me, Phil, but you see,' he hesitated. "'Not to tell you a word of a lie, then with a rush. "'I'm going foreign again, that's the fact.' "'Again?' "'Well, I am,' said Pete, looking ashamed. "'Yes, truth enough, that's what I'm thinking of doing. "'You see,' with a persuasive air, when a man's bitten by travel, it's like the hydrophobia exactly. He can't rest no time in one bed at all. Must be running here and running there and running regular. It's the way with me, anyway. Used to think the old island would be big enough for the rest of my days. But no, I'm longing shocking for the mines again, and the compound and the niggers and the wild life out yonder. The sea's calling me, you know. And then he laughed. Philip understood him. Pete meant to take himself out of the way. "'Shall you stay long?' he faltered. "'Well, yes, I was thinking so,' said Pete. "'You see, the stuff isn't panning out now, same as it used to, "'and fortunes aren't made as fast as they were in my time. "'Not that I'm wanting a fortune, neither. "'Is it likely now? "'But still and for all, well, I'll be away a good spell anyway.' "'Philip tried to ask if he intended to go soon. "'Tomorrow, sir, by the packet to Liverpool, for the sailing on Wednesday.' I've been going the round saying good-bye to the old chums, John Ake and John the Widow and Nip Likely and Kelly the Postman. Not much heart at some of them, just a bit of a something stowed away in their giblets. But it isn't right to be expecting too much at all. This is the only one that doesn't seem willing to part with me. Pete's dog had followed him into the room and was sitting soberly by the side of his chair. There's no shaking him off, poor old chap. The dog got up and wagged his stump. "'Well, we've tramped the world together, haven't we, Dempster? "'He doesn't seem tired of me yet, neither.' "'Pete's face lengthened. "'But there's Granny now. "'The old angel is going about like a bit of a thundercloud, "'and doesn't know in the world whether to burst on me or not. "'Thinks I've been cruel, seemingly. "'I can't be explaining to her, neither. "'Maybe you'll set it right for me when I'm gone, sir. "'It's you for a job like that, you know. "'Don't want her to be thinking hard of me, poor old thing.' Pete whistled at the child and halloed to it, and then in a lower tone he continued, Not been to Castletown, sir, got as far as Balasala, and saw the castle tower. Then my heart was losing me, and I turned back. You'll say good-bye for me, Phil. Tell her I forgave. No, not that, though. Say I left her my love. That won't do neither. You'll know best what to say when the time comes, Phil, so I leave it with you. Maybe you'll tell her I went away cheerful and content. And well, happy, why not? No harm in saying that at all. Not breaking my heart, anyway, for when a man's a man... <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
clearing his throat. I'm bad dreadful these days wanting a smook in the mornings. May I smook here? I may. You're good, too. He cut his tobacco with his discoloured knife, rolled it, charged his pipe, and lit it. Sorry to be going away just before your own great day, Phil. I'll get the skipper to fire around as we're steaming by Castletown, and if there's a band aboard I'll tip them a trifle to play Mel Corain. That'll speak to you like a blackbird's whistle, as the saying is. Looks like deserting you, though, but chute, it would be no surprise to me at all. I've seen it coming these years and years. You'll be the first manxman living, says I, the day I sailed before. You've not deceived me, neither. Do you remember the morning on the quay and the oath between the pair of us? Me swearing you same as a high bailiff, nothing and nobody to come between us? Do you mind it, Phil? And nothing has, and nothing shall. He puffed at his pipe and said significantly, You'll be getting married soon. Oh, you will, I know you will. I'm certain sure you will. Philip could not look into his face. He felt little and mean. You're a wise man, sir, and a great man, but if a plain common chap may give you a bit of advice, oh, but you'll be losing no time, though. I'll not be here myself to see it. I'll be on the water, maybe, with the waves washing again the gunwale, and the wind rattling in the rigging, and the ship burrowing into the darkness of the sea. But I'll be knowing it's morning at home, and the sun shining, and a sort of a warm quietness everywhere, and you and her at the old church together. The pipe was puffing audibly. Tell her I lay for my blessing. Tell her, but the way I'm smoking it's shocking. Your curtains will be smelling thick twist for a century. Philip's moist eyes were following the child along the floor. What about the little one, he asked with difficulty. Uh, I tell you the truth, Phil, that's the for I came. Well, mostly, anyway. You see, a child isn't fit for a compound, exactly. Not but they're thinking diamonds of a little thing out there, especially if it's a girl. But still and for all, with niggers about, and chaps as rough as a thorn bush, and no manners to speak of. Philip interrupted eagerly. Will you leave her with Granny? Well, no, that wasn't what I was thinking. Granny's a bit old getting, and she's had her whack. Wanting easement in her old days, anyway. Then she'll be knocking under before the little one's up. That's only to be expected. No, I was thinking... What do you think I was thinking now? What, said Philip, with quick coming breath. He did not raise his head. I was thinking, well, yes, I was then. It's a fact, though. I was thinking maybe yourself now. Pete. Philip had started up and grasped Pete by the hand, but he could say no more. He felt crushed by Pete's magnanimity. And Pete went on as if he were asking a great favour. She's been your heart's blood to you, Pete thinks I to myself, and there isn't nobody but himself you could trust her with, nobody else you would give her up to. He'll love her, thinks I, he'll cherish her, he'll rear her as if she was his own. He'll be the same thing as a father itself to her. Philip was struggling to keep up. I've been laving something for her too, said Pete. No, no. Yes, though, one of the first Manx estates going. Caesar had the deeds, but I've been taking them to the high bailiff and doing everything regular. When I'm gone, sir, Philip tried to protest. Oh, but a man can lave what he likes to his own, sir, can't he? Philip was silent. He could say nothing. The make-believe was to be kept up to the last tragic moment. And out yonder, lying on my bunk in the sheds, good mattresses and thick blankets fill, nothing to complain of at all, I'll be watching her growing up, year by year, same as if she was under my eye constant. She's in pinafores now, thinks I. Now she's in long frocks and is doing up her hair. She's as straight as an osier now, and red as a rose, and the best-looking girl in the island, and the spitting picture of what her mother used to be. Or oh, I'll be seeing her in my mind's eye, sir, plainer nor any photograph. Pete puffed furiously at his pipe. And the mother, I'll be seeing herself, too a woman every inch of her, God bless her. Wherever there's a poor girl lying in her shame, she'll be there. I'll go bail on that. And yourself. I'll be seeing yourself, sir, whiter maybe, and the sun going down on you, but strong for all. And when any poor fellow has had a knock-down blow, and the world is darkening round him, he'll be coming to you for light and for strength, and you'll be holding out the right hand to him, because you're knowing yourself what it is to fall and get up again, and because you're a man, and God has made friends with you. 
Pete rammed his thumb into his pipe and stuffed it, still smoking, into his waistcoat pocket. Chut, he said huskily. The talk a man'll be putting out when he's going away foreign. All for poetry, then, or something of that spacious. Hmm, hmm, clearing his throat. Must be giving up the pipe, though. Not much worth for the voice at all. Philip could not speak. The strength and grandeur of the man overwhelmed him. It cut him to the heart that Pete could never see, could never hear, how he would wash away his shame. The child had crawled across the room to an open cabinet that stood in one corner, and there possessed herself of a shell which she was making show of holding to her ear. "'Well, did you ever?' cried Pete. "'Look at that child now. She's knowing it's a shell. Deed she is, though. Oh, crawling regular, sir, morning to night. Would you like to see the prettiest sight in the world, Phil?' He went down on his knees and held out his arms. "'Come here, you little sandpiper. Fix that chair a piece nearer, sir. That's the ticket. Good thing Nancy isn't here. She'd be on to us like the mischief. Wonderful handy with babies, though, and if anybody was wanting a nurse now, a stepmother's breath is cold, but Nancy... My gosh, you daren't look over the hedge at her lammy, but she's shouting fit for an earthquake. Stand nice now, Kitty. Stand nice, Boch. The woman's about right, too. The little one's legs are like bits of quailbone. Come now, Boch, come. Pete put the child to stand with its back to the chair, and then leaned towards it with his arms outspread. The child staggered a step in the sea of one yard space that lay between, looked back at the irrecoverable chair, looked down on the distant ground, and then plunged forward with a nervous laugh and fell into Pete's arms. Bravo! Wasn't that nice, Phil? Ever see anything prettier than a child's first step? Again, Kitty Boch. But go to your new father this time. Aisy now, aisy, in a thick voice. Give me a kiss first, with a choking gurgle. One more, darling, with a broken laugh. Now face the other way. One, two. Are you ready, Phil? Phil held out his long, white, trembling hands. Yes, with a smothered sob. Three, four, and away. The child's fingers slipped into Philip's palm. There was another halt, another plunge, another nervous laugh, and then the child was in Philip's arms. His head was over it, and he was clasping it to his heart. After a moment, Philip, without raising his eyes, said, Pete. But Pete had stolen softly from the room. Pete, where are you? Where was he? He was on the road outside, crying like a boy, no, like a man, at thought of the happiness he had left upstairs. End of Part 6, Chapter 18《Part 6, Chapter 19 of The Manxman》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain, Part 6, Chapter 19 The town of Peel was in a great commotion that night. It was the night of St. Patrick's Day, and the mackerel fleet were leaving for Kinsale. A hundred and fifty boats lay in the harbour, each with a light in its binnacle, a fire in its cabin, smoke coming from its stove-pipe, and its sails half set. The sea was fresh, there was a smart breeze from the northwest and the air was full of the brine. At the turn of the tide, the boats began to drop down the harbour. Then there was a rush of women and children, and old men to the end of the pier. Mothers were seeing their sons off, women their husbands, children their fathers, girls their boys, all full of fun and laughter and joyful cries. One of the girls remembered that the men were leaving the island before the installation of the new governor. Straightway they started a game of make-believe, the make-believe of electing the governor for themselves. "'Who are you voting for, Mr. Quayle?' "'Oh, Dempster Christian, of course. "'Throw us your rope, then, and we'll give you a pull. "'Heave, oh, girls, and the rope would be whipped round a mooring post on the quay. Twenty girls would seize it, and the boat would go slipping past the pier, round the castle rocks, and then away before the northwester like a gull. "'Good luck, Harry. "'Whips of money coming home, Jim.' Write us a letter, mind you're right now. Good night, father. No crying yet, no sign of tears, nothing but fresh young faces, bright eyes and peals of laughter, 
as one by one the boats slid out into the fresh green water of the bay, and the wind took them, and they shot into the night. Even the dogs on the quay frisked about, and barked as if they were going crazy with delight. In the midst of this happy scene, a man wearing a monkey jacket and a wide-brimmed soft hat came up to the harbour with a little misshapen dog at his heels. He stood for a moment as if bewildered by the strange midnight spectacle before him. Then he walked through the throng of young people, and listened a while to their talk and laughter. No one spoke to him, and he spoke to no one. His dog followed with its nose at his ankles. If some other dog, in youthful frolic, frisked and barked about it, it snarled and snapped, and then croodled down at his master's feet and looked ashamed. "'Dempster, Dempster, getting a bit old, eh?' said the man. After a little while he went quietly away. Nobody missed him. Nobody had observed him. He had gone back to the town. At a baker's shop, which was still open for the convenience of the departing fleet, he bought a seaman's biscuit. With this he returned to the harbour by way of the shore. At the slip by the rocket house he went down to the beach and searched among the shingle until he found a stone like a dumbbell, large at the ends and narrow in the middle. Then he went back to the quay. The dog followed him and watched him. The last of the boats was out in the bay by this time. She could be seen quite plainly in the moonlight, with the green blade of a wave breaking on her quarter. Somebody was carrying a light on her deck, and the giant shadow of a man's figure was cast up on the new lug cell. There were shouts and answers across the splashing water. Then a fresh young voice on the boat began to sing, Lovely Mona, fare thee well. The women took it up, and the two companies sang it in turns, verse by verse, the women on the quay and the men on the boat, with the sea growing wider between them. An old fisherman on the skirts of the crowd had a little girl on his shoulder. "'You'll not be going to Kinsale this time, mate?' said a voice behind him. "'Oh, no, sir. I've seen the day, though. Thirty years I was going, and better. But I'm done now.' "'Well, that's the way, you see. It's the turn of the young ones now. Let them sing, God bless them.' We're not going to fret, though, are we? There's one thing we can always do. We can always remember, and that's some constellation, isn't it? I'm doing it regular, said the old fisherman. After all, it's been a good thing to live, and when a man's time comes, it'll not be such a darn bad thing to die, neither. Don't you hold with me there, mate? I do, sir, I do. The last boat had rounded the castle rock, and its topsail had diminished and disappeared. On the quay the song had ended, and the women and children were turning their faces with a shade of sadness towards the town. Well, with a deep universal inspiration, wasn't it beautiful? Wasn't it? Then what are you crying about? The girls laughed at each other with wet eyes, and went off with springless steps. The mothers picked up their children and carried them home whimpering, and the old men went away with drooping heads and shambling feet. When all was gone and the harbour-master had taken his last look round, the man with the dog went to the end of the empty quay and sat on the mooring post that had served for the running of the ropes. All was quiet enough now. The voices, the singing, the laughter were lost. There was no sound but the gurgle of the ebbing tide, which was racing out with the river's flow between the pier and the castle rock. The man looked at his dog, stooped to it, gave it the biscuit, and petted it and stroked it while it munched its supper. Dempster, boch, Dempster, getting old, eh? Travel far together, haven't we? Tired a bit, aren't you? Couldn't go through another rough journey anyway. Hard to part, though. Machree, machree. He took the stone out of his pocket, tied it to one end of the string, made a noose on the other end, slipped it about the dog's neck, and without warning picked up the dog and stone at once and dropped them over the pier. The old creature gave a piteous cry as it descended. There was a splash, and then the racing of the water past the pier. The man had turned away quickly, and was going heavily along the quay. End of Part 6, Chapter 19《Part 6, Chapter 20 of The Manxman》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part 6, Chapter 20 It had been a night of pain to Philip. 
All the world seemed to be conspiring to hold him back from what he had to do. Thou shalt not was the legend that appeared to be written everywhere. Four persons had learnt his secret, and all four seemed to call upon him to hide it. First the clerk of the rolls, who had heard the divorce proceedings within closed doors. Next Pete, who might have clamoured the scandal on all hands, and plucked him down from his place, but had chosen to be silent and to slip away unseen. Then Caesar, whose awful self-deception was an assurance of his secrecy. And finally Auntie Nan, whose provision for Kate's material welfare had been intended to prevent the necessity for revelation. All these had seemed to say to him, whether from affection or from fear, Hold your peace, say nothing. The past is the past. It is dead. It does not exist. Go on with your career. It is only beginning. What right have you to break it up? The island looks to you, waits for you. Step forward and be strong. Thank God it was too late to be moved by that temptation, too late to be bought by that bribe. Already he had taken the irrevocable course, he had made the irrevocable step. He could not now go back. But the awful penalty of the island's undeceiving, the pain of that moment when everybody would learn that he had deceived the whole world. He was a sham, a whited sepulchre. Every step he had gone up in his quick ascent had been over the body of someone who had loved him too well. First Kate, who had been the victim of the deemstership, and now Pete, who was paying the price that made him governor. He could see the darkened looks of the proud. He could hear the execration of the disappointed. He could feel the tears of the true-hearted at the downfall of a life that had looked so fair. In the frenzy of that last hour of trial, it seemed as if he was contending, not with man and the world, but with the devil, who was using both to make this bitter irony of his position, who was bribing him with worldly glory that he might damn his soul for ever. And therein lay a temptation that sat closer at his side, the temptation to turn his face and fly away. It was midnight. The moon was shining on the boundless plain of the sea. He was in the slack water of the soul, when the ebb is spent, before the tide has begun to flow. Oh, to leave everything behind, the shame and the glory together. It was the moment when the girls on Peel Quay were pulling the rope for the men on the boats who were ready to vote for Christian. The pains of sleep were yet greater. He thought he was in Castletown, skulking under the walls of the castle. With a look up towards Parliament House and down to the harbour, he fumbled his private key into the lock of the side entrance to the council chamber. The old caretaker heard him creep down the long corridor, and she came clattering out with a candle, shaded behind her hand. "'Something I've forgotten,' he said. "'Pardon, Your Honour,' and then a deep curtsy. He opened noiselessly the little door leading from the council chamber to the keep, but in the dark shadow of the steps the turnkey challenged him. "'Who's there? Stop!' "'Hush! The Deemster!' "'Beg Your Honour's pardon.' "'Show me the female wards.' "'This way, Your Honour.' "'Her cell.' "'Here, Your Honour.' "'The key, your lantern. Now go back to the guard-room.' He was with Kate. "'My love, my love, my darling. "'Come, let us fly away from the island. I cannot face it. I thought I could, but I cannot. I've got the child, too. Come.' and then Kate. I would go anywhere with you, Philip. Anywhere, anywhere. I only want your love. But is this worthy of a man like you? Leave me. We have fallen too low to drop into a pit like that. Away with you. Go. And he slunk out of the cell before the wrathful love that would save him from himself. He, the deemster, the governor, had slunk out like a dog. It was only a dream. When he awoke, the birds were singing and the day was blue over the sea. The temptation was past. It was under his feet. He could hesitate no longer. His cup was brimming over. He would drink it to the dregs. Gemma Lord came with his mouth full of the news. The town was decorated with bunting. There was to be a general holiday. A grandstand had been erected on the green in front of the courthouse. The people were not going to be deterred by the deemster's refusals. He who shrank from honours was the more worthy of being honoured. They intended to present their new governor with an address. Let them, let them, said Philip. Jem looked up inquiringly. His master's face had a strange expression. Shall I drive you today, Your Excellency? Yes, my lad. It may be for the last time, Jemmy. 
What was amiss with the governor? Had the excitement proved too much for him? End of Part 6, Chapter 20《Part Six, Chapter Twenty One of the Manxman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Cain, Part Six, Chapter Twenty One. It was a perfect morning, soft and fresh, and sweet with the odours and the colours of spring. New gorse flashed from the hedges. The violets peeped from the banks. Over the freshening green of the fields the young lambs sported, and the lark sang in the thin blue air. The town, as they dipped into it, was full of life. At the turn of the courthouse the crowd was densest. A policeman raised his hand in front of the horses, and Gemma Lord drew up. Then the high bailiff stepped to the gate and read an address. It mentioned Iron Christian, calling him the great deemster. The town took pride to itself that the first Manx governor of man was born in Ramsey. Philip answered briefly, confining himself to an expression of thanks. There was great cheering, and then the carriage moved on. The journey thereafter was one long triumphal passage. At Solby Street and at Ballor Street there were flags and throngs of people. From time to time other carriages joined them, falling into line behind. The bishop was waiting at Bishop's Court, and place was made for his carriage immediately after the carriage of the governor. At Tyndall there was a sweet and beautiful spectacle. The children of St. John's were seated on the four rounds of the mount, boys and girls in alternate rows, and from that spot, sacred to the memory of their forefathers for a thousand years, they sang the national anthem as Philip passed on the road. The unhappy man lay back in his seat, his eyes filled, his throat rose, Oh, for what might have been! Under Harry Delaney's tree, a company of fishermen were waiting with a letter. It was from their mates at Kinsale. They could not be at home that day, but their hearts were there. Every boat would fly her flag at the masthead, and at twelve o'clock noon every Manx fisherman on Irish waters would raise a cheer. If the Irishman asked them what they meant by that, they would answer and say, It's for the fisherman's friend, Governor Philip Christian. The unhappy man was no longer in pain. His agony was beyond that. A sort of divine madness had taken possession of him. He was putting the world and the prince of the world behind his back. All this worldly glory and human gratitude was but the temptation of Satan. With God's help he would not succumb. He would resist. He would triumph over everything. Gemma Lord twisted on the box seat. See, Your Excellency, listen. The flags of Castletown were visible on the eagle tower of the castle. Then there was a multitudinous murmur. Finally a great shout. Now, boys, three times three, hip, hip, hurrah! At the entrance to the town an evergreen arch had been erected. It bore an inscription in Manx. Dunya Vannin, Liat Mer Hoilu, Man of man, success as thou deservest. The carriage had slacked down to a walk. Drive quicker, cried Philip. The streets are crowded, Your Excellency, said Gemma Lord. Flags were flying from every window, from every roof, from every lamp post. The people ran by the carriage cheering. Their shout was a deafening uproar. Philip could not respond. She will hear it, he thought. His head dropped. He was picturing Kate in her cell with the clamour of his welcome coming muffled through the walls. They took the road by the harbour. Suddenly the carriage stopped. The men were taking the horses out of the shafts. No, no, cried Philip. He had an impulse to alight, but the carriage was moving again in a moment. It is the last of my punishment, he thought, and again fell back. Then the shouting and the laughter ran along the quay with the crackle and roar of a fire. A regiment of soldiers lined the way from the drawbridge to the portcullis. As the carriage drew up, they presented arms in royal salute. At the same moment the band of the regiment inside the keep played God Save the Queen. The high bailiff of the town opened the carriage door and presented an address. It welcomed the new governor to the ancient castle wherein his predecessors had been installed, and took fresh assurance of devotion to the crown from the circumstance that one of their own countrymen had been thought worthy to represent it. No Manxman had ever been so honoured in that island before, since the days of the new governor's own great kinsman, 
familiarly and affectionately known to all Manxmen through two centuries as Ilium Doan, Brown William. Philip replied in few words, the cheering broke out afresh, the band played again, and they entered the castle by the long corridor that led to the council chamber. In an ante-room the officials were waiting. They were all elderly men, and old men, who had seen long and honourable service, but they showed no jealousy. The clerk of the rolls received his former pupil with a shout wherein personal pride struggled with respect, and affection with humility. Then the Attorney-General welcomed him in the name of the bar, as head of the judicature, as well as head of the legislature, taking joy in the fact that one of their own profession had been elevated to the highest office in the Isle of Man. Glancing at his descent from an historic Manx line, at his brief but distinguished career as judge, which had revived the best traditions of judicial wisdom and eloquence, and finally wishing him long life and strength for the fulfilment of the noble promise of his young and spotless manhood. Mr. Attorney-General, said Philip, I will not accept your congratulations. Much as it would rejoice my heart to do so, it would only be another grief to me if you were to repent, as too soon you may, the generous warmth of your reception. They were puzzled looks, but the sage counsellors could not receive the right impression. They could only understand the reply in the sense that agreed with their present feelings. It is beautiful, they whispered, when a young man of real gifts is genuinely modest. Excuse me, gentlemen, said Philip, I must go into my room. The clerk of the rolls followed him, saying, Ah, poor Tom Christian would have been a proud man this day, prouder than if the honour had been his own, ten thousand thousand times. Have mercy, have mercy, and leave me alone, said Philip. I didn't mean to offend you, Christian, said the clerk. Philip put one hand affectionately on his shoulder. The eyes of the robustious fellow began to blink, and he returned to his colleagues. There was a confused murmur beyond the farther wall of the room, it was the room kept for the deemster when he held court in the council chamber. One of its two doors communicated with the bench. As usual, a constable kept this door. The man loosened his chain and removed his helmet. His head was grey. "'Is the courthouse full?' asked Philip. The constable put his eye to the eye-hole. "'Crowded, Your Excellency.' "'Keep the passages clear.' "'Yes, Your Excellency.' "'Is the clerk of the court present?' "'He is, Your Excellency.' "'And the jailer?' "'Downstairs, Your Excellency.' "'Tell both they will be wanted.' The constable turned the key of the door and left the room. Gemma Lord came puffing and perspiring. "'The ex-governor is coming over by the green, sir. He'll be here in a moment.' "'My wig and gown, Jemmy,' said Philip. "'Deemster's wig, Your Excellency?' "'Yes.' "'Last time you'll wear it, sir.' "'The last indeed, my lad.' There was a clash of steel outside, followed by the beat of drum. "'He's here,' said Gemma Lord. Philip listened. The rattling noise came to him through opening doors and reverberating corridors, like the trampling of a wave to a man imprisoned in a cave. "'She'll hear it, too.' That thought was with him constantly. In his mind's eye he was seeing Kate, crouching in the far seat of the palace room that was now her prison and covering her ears to deaden the joyous sounds that broke the usual silence of the gloomy walls. Gemma Lord was at the eye-hole of the door. "'He's coming on to the bench, sir. The gentlemen of the council are following him, and the courthouse is full of ladies.' Philip was pacing to and fro like a man in violent agitation. At the other side of the wall the confused murmur had risen to a sharp crackle of many voices. The constable came back with the clerk of the court and the jailer. "'Everything ready, Your Excellency?' said the clerk of the court. The constable turned the key of the door, and laid his hand on the knob. "'One moment. Give me a moment,' said Philip. He was going through the last throes of his temptation. Something was asking him, as if in tones of indignation, what right he had to bring people there to make fools of them, and something was laughing as if in mockery at the theatrical device he had chosen for gathering together the people of rank and station— and then dismissing them like naughty schoolchildren. This idea clamoured loud in wild derision, telling him that he was posing, that he was making a market of his misfortune, that he was an actor, and that whatever the effect of the scene he was about to perform, it was unnecessary and must be contemptible. You talk of your shame and humiliation. No atonement can wipe it out. 
You came here prating to yourself of blotting out the past. No act of man can do so. Vain, vain, an idol as well as vain. Mere mummery and display, and a blow to the dignity of justice. Under the weight of such torment, the thought came to him that he should go through the ceremony after all, that he should do as the people expected, that he should accept the governorship, and then defy the social ostracism of the island by making Kate his wife. It's not yet too late, said the tempter. Philip stopped in his walk and remembered the two letters of yesterday. Thank God, it is too late, he said. He had spoken the words aloud, and the officers in attendance glanced up at him. Gemma Lord was behind, trembling and biting his lip. It was indeed too late for that temptation, and then the vanity of it, the cruelty and insufficiency of it. He had been a servant of the world long enough. From this day forth he meant to be its master. No matter if all the devils of hell should laugh at him, he was going through with his purpose. There was only one condition on which he could live in the world, that he should renounce it. There was only one way of renouncing the world, to return its wages and strip off its livery. His sin was not only against Kate, against Pete, it was against the island, and the island must set him free. Philip approached the door, slackened his pace with an air of uncertainty. At one step from the constable he stopped. He was breathing noisily. If the officers had observed him at that moment, they must have thought he looked like a man going to execution. But the constable gazed before him with a sombre expression, held his helmet in one hand, and the knob of the door in the other. Now, said Philip, with a long inspiration. There was a flash of faces, a waft of perfume, a flutter of pocket handkerchiefs, and a deafening reverberation. Philip was in the courthouse. End of Part 6, Chapter 21《パート6 Chapter 22 of the Manxman》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Manxman》by Sir Hall Kane, Part 6 Chapter 22 It was remarked that his face was fearfully worn, and that it looked the whiter for the white wig above it and the black gown beneath. His large eyes flamed as with fire. The sword too keen for the scabbard, whispered somebody. There was a kind of aloofness in strong men at great moments. Nobody approaches them. They move onward of themselves and stand or fall alone. Everybody in court rose as Philip entered, but no one offered his hand. Even the ex-governor only bowed from the governor's seat under the canopy. Philip took his customary place as deemster. He was then at the right of the governor, the bishop being on the left. Behind the bishop sat the attorney-general, and behind Philip the clerk of the rolls. The cheers that had greeted Philip on his entrance ended with the clapping of hands, and died off like a wave falling back from the shingle. Then he rose and turned to the governor. I do not know if you are aware, Your Excellency, that this is Deemster's court day. The governor smiled, and a titter went round the court. We will dispense with that, he said. We have better business this morning. "'Excuse me, Your Excellency,' said Philip. "'I am still Deemster. "'With your leave we will do everything according to rule.' "'There was a slight pause, a questioning look, then a cold answer. "'Of course, if you wish it, but your sense of duty.' "'The ladies in the galleries had ceased to flutter their fans, "'and the members of the House of Keys were shifting in their seats in the well below. "'The clerk of the Deemster's court pushed through to the space beneath the bench.' "'There is only one case, Your Honour. he whispered up. "'Speak out, sir,' said Philip. "'What case is it?' "'The clerk gave an informal answer. "'It was the case of the young woman who had attempted her life at Ramsey "'and had been kept at Her Majesty's pleasure. "'How long has she been in prison?' Seven weeks, Your Honour. "'Give me the book, and I will sign the order for her release.' "'The book was handed to the bench. "'Philip signed it, handed it back to the clerk.' and said with his face to the jailer, "'But keep her until somebody comes to fetch her.' There had been a cold silence during these proceedings. When they were over, the ladies breathed freely. "'You remember the case. Left her husband a little child. Divorced since, I'm told. A worthless person.' "'Ah, yes. Wasn't she first tried the day the Deemster fell ill in court?' "'Men are too tender with such creatures.' 
Philip had risen again. Your Excellency, I have done the last of my duties as Deemster. His voice had hoarsened. He was a worn and stricken figure. The ex-governor's warmth had been somewhat cooled by the unexpected interruption. Nevertheless, the pockmark smoothed out of his forehead, and he rose with a smile. At the same moment the clerk of the roll stepped up and laid two books on the desk before him, a New Testament in a tattered leather binding, and the Liber Juramentorum, the Book of Oaths. The regret I feel, said the ex-governor, and feeling increasingly, day by day, at the severance of the ties which have bound me to this beautiful island, is tempered by the satisfaction I experience that the choice of my successor has fallen upon one whom I know to be a gentleman of powerful intellect and stainless honour. He will preserve that autonomous independence which has come down to you from a remote antiquity, at the same time that he will uphold the fidelity of a people who have always been loyal to the crown. I pray that the blessing of Almighty God may attend his administration, and that if the time ever comes when he too shall stand in the position I occupy today, he may have recollections as lively of the support and kindness he has met with, and regrets as deep as his separation from the little Manx nation which he leaves behind. Then the governor took the staff of office, and gave the signal for rising. Everybody rose. And now, sir, he said, turning to Philip with a smile, to do everything, as you say, according to rule, let us first take Her Majesty's commission of your appointment. There was a moment's pause and then Philip said in a cold, clear voice, "'Your Excellency, I have no commission. The commission which I received I have returned. I have therefore no right to be installed as governor. Also I have resigned my office as deemster, and though my resignation has not yet been accepted, I am in reality no longer in the service of the State.' The people looked at the speaker with eyes that were full of the stupefaction of surprise. Somebody had risen at the back of the bench. It was the clerk of the rolls. He stretched out his hand as if to touch Philip on the shoulder. Then he hesitated and sat down again. Gentlemen of the council and of the keys, continued Philip, you will think you have assembled to see a man take a leap into an abyss more dark than death. That is as it may be. You have a right to an explanation, and I am here to make it. What I have done has been at the compulsion of conscience. I am not worthy of the office I hold, still less of the office that is offered me. There was a half-articulate interruption from behind Philip's chair. Ah, do not think, old friend, that I am dealing in vague self-depreciation. I should have preferred not to speak more exactly, but what must be, must be. Your Excellency has spoken of my honour as spotless. Would to God it were so, but it is deeply stained with sin. He stopped made an effort to begin afresh, and stopped again. Then in a low tone, with measured utterance, amid breathless silence, he said, I have lived a double life. Beneath the life that you have seen there has been another. God only knows how full of wrongdoing and disgrace and shame. It is no part of my duty to involve others in this confession. Let it be enough that my career has been built on falsehood and robbery, that I have deceived the woman who loved me with her heart of hearts, and robbed the man who would have trusted me with his soul. The people began to breathe audibly. There was the scraping of a chair behind the speaker. The clerk of the rolls had risen. His florid face was violently agitated. May it please your Excellency, he began, faltering and stammering, in a husky voice, it will be within your Excellency's knowledge, and the knowledge of every one on the island, that his honour has only just risen from a long and serious illness, brought on by overwork, by too zealous attention to his duties, and that, in fact, that, well, not to blink the plain truth, that a sigh of immense relief had passed over the court, and the governor, grown very pale, was nodding in assent, but Philip only smiled sadly and shook his head. I have been ill indeed, he said, but not from the cause you speak of. The just judgment of God has overtaken me. The clerk of the roll sank back into his seat. The moment came when I had to sit in judgment on my own sin, the moment when she who had lost her honour in trusting to mine stood in the dock before me. I, who had been the first cause of her misfortunes, sat on the bench as her judge. She is now in prison, and I am here. The same law which has punished her failing with infamy has advanced me to power. 
There was an icy quiet in the court, such as comes with the first gleam of the dawn. By that quick instinct which takes possession of a crowd at great moments, the people understood everything. The impurity of the character that had seemed so pure, the nullity of the life that had seemed so noble. When I asked myself what there was left to me to do, I could see but one thing. It was impossible to go on administering justice, being myself unjust, and remembering that higher bar before which I too was yet to stand. I must cease to be deemster, but that was only my protection against the future, not my punishment for the past. I could not surrender myself to any earthly court, because I was guilty of no crime against earthly law. The law cannot take a man into the court of the conscience. He must take himself there. He stopped again and then said quietly, My sentence is this open confession of my sin and renunciation of the worldly advantages which have been bought by the suffering of others. It was no longer possible to doubt him. He had sinned and he had reaped the reward of his sin. Those rewards were great and splendid, but he had come to renounce them all. The dreams of ambition were fulfilled, the miracle of life was realized, the world was conquered and at his feet yet he was there to give up all. The quiet of the court had warmed to a hush of awe. He turned to the bench, but every face was down. Then his own eyes fell. Gentlemen of the council, you who have served the island so long and so honorably, perhaps you blame me for permitting you to come together for the hearing of this confession. But if you knew the temptation I was under to fly away without making it, to turn my back on my past, to shuffle my fault onto fate, to lay the blame on life, to persuade myself that I could not have acted differently, you would believe it was not lightly, and God knows, not vainly, that I suffered you to come here to see me mount my scaffold. He turned back to the body of the court. My countrymen and countrywomen, you who have been so much more kind to me than my character justified or my conduct merited, I say good-bye but not as one who is going away. In conquering the impulse to go without confessing, I conquered the desire to go at all. Here, where my old life has fallen to ruin, my new life must be built up. That is the only security. It is also the only justice. On this island where my fall is known, my uprising may come, as is most right, only with bitter struggle and sorrow and tears. But when it comes, it will come securely. It may be in years, in many years, but I am willing to wait, I am ready to labour, and meantime she who was worthy of my highest honour will share my lowest degradation. That is the way of all women. God love and keep them. The exultation of his tones infected everybody. It may be that you think I am to be pitied. There have been hours of my life when I have been deserving of pity, but they have been the hours, the dark hours, when in the prodigality of your gratitude you have loaded me with distinctions, and a shadow has haunted me, saying, Philip Christian, they think you a just judge. You are not a just judge. They think you an upright man. You are not an upright man. Do not pity me now, when the dark hours are past, when the new life has begun, when I am listening at length to the voice of my heart, which has all along been the voice of God. His eyes shone. His mouth was smiling. If you think how narrowly I escaped the danger of letting things go on as they were going, of covering up my fault, of concealing my true character, of living as a sham and dying as a hypocrite, you will consider me worthy of envy instead. Good-bye, good-bye, God bless you. Before anyone appeared to be aware that his voice had ceased, he was gone from the bench, and the deemster's chair stood empty. Then the people turned and looked into each other's stricken faces. They were still standing, for nobody had thought of sitting down. There was no further speaking that day. Without a word or a sign, the governor descended from his seat, and the proceedings came to an end. Everyone moved towards the door. A great price to pay for it, though, thought the men. How he must have loved her after all, thought the women. At that moment the big Queen Elizabeth clock of the castle was striking twelve, and the fishermen on Irish waters were raising a cheer for their friend at home. A loud detonation rang out over the town. It was the report of a gun. There was another, and then a third. The shots were from a steamer that was passing the bay. Philip remembered. It was Pete's last farewell. 
End of Part 6, Chapter 22《Part 6, Chapter 23 of The Manxman》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane, Part 6, Chapter 23 Half an hour later, the keep, the courtyard, and the passage to the portcullis were filled with an immense crowd. Ladies thronged the two flights of external steps to the prisoner's chapel and the council chambers. Men had climbed as high as to the battlements, and were looking down over the beetle-browed walls. All eyes were on the door to the debtor's side of the prison, and a path from it was being kept clear. The door opened, and Philip and Kate came out. There was no other exit, and they must have taken it. He was holding her firmly by the hand, and half leading, half drawing her along. Under the weight of so many eyes her head was held down but those who were near enough to see her face knew that her shame was swallowed up in happiness and her fear in love. Philip was like a man transfigured. The extreme pallor of his cheeks was gone. His step was firm, and his face was radiant. It was the common remark that never before had he looked so strong, so buoyant, so noble. This was the hour of his triumph, not that within the walls. This, when his sin was confessed, when conscience had no power to appall him, when the world and the pride of the world were beneath his feet, and he was going forth from a prison cell, hand in hand with the fallen woman by his side, to face the future with their bankrupt lives. And she? She was sharing his fiery ordeal. Before her outraged sisters and all the world, she was walking with him in the depth of his humiliation, at the height of his conquest, at the climax of his shame and glory. Once for a moment she halted and stumbled, as if under the hot breath that was beating upon her head. But he put his arm about her, and in a moment she was strong. The sun dipped down from the great tower onto his upturned face, and his eyes were glistening through their tears. The End The Manxman by Sir Hall Kane. The End